Section 22 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avayi in May 2015. Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers and Lawyers, Volume 1 by Hans Gross, translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter 3. Inspection of Localities Continued. Section 3. The Actual Description of the Scene of Offence. Having established with all necessary prudence what does and does not form part of the subject matter to be examined, all connected in any way with the case must be definitely ascertained and described. In this connection there is one golden and inviolable rule. Never alter the position of, pick up, or even touch any object before it has been minutely described in the report. The investigating officer must never forget that it very rarely happens to find everything clear and distinct from the beginning. As a rule, the investigating officer has not the slightest idea of what turn the case will take. He does not know what may be of importance, or what will be denied and therefore have to be proved. At this early stage everything may be of importance, and nothing too small or insignificant to have a decisive bearing upon the case. The situation of an object, an inch or two to left or right, to front or back, a little dust, a splash of dirt easy to efface, may all turn out to be of the first importance. The natural impulse is to immediately touch any object of apparent significance, as, for example, an object left on the scene of the crime by the criminal. It is laid hold of and moved about, and only afterwards is it recognized that the object in itself signifies very little, but that everything depends on its position, which can no longer be fixed. Again, the involuntary impulse is at first to seize the hands of the murdered person, to see if there is any hair or scraps of clothing of the criminal in them, but it may turn out that some little detail, such as a smear of blood upon the hands effaced in seizing them so heedlessly, would have been of much greater importance. Now, in order to follow the important rule, never to change in any way the condition of the scene before it is described in the report, it is necessary to make sure of the preservation of that condition. Footprints should be protected by coverings of little boxes or small planks resting on two or three stones. Traces of blood and forgotten or discarded objects should also be carefully covered up, especially if they are in the open air and the hour is late. And, moreover, lines should be drawn round objects which may be confused with others, such as footprints, etc. When all this is in order and everything useless has been eliminated, the report can be commenced. No one supposes that a report should be a model of style, but a certain grammatical accuracy and logical sequence are indispensable. This is in the first place important to the person dictating the report, for he will only be able to do good work if he is convinced of the accuracy of what he states, without having to wait for its confirmation afterwards, if he deals carefully with each point on its own merits and without connecting it with those that follow, and lastly if it proceeds logically and according to a determined plan, passing from the general to the particular, and so avoiding the treatment of the same point twice over. Secondly, the arrangement is of importance to the reader, for he will only understand the matter clearly if he finds the style of the report lucid and logical. Anyone who has perused many such reports knows how difficult it is to make use of them when badly drawn up, how little convincing they are, or how easy it is to miss important points from the difficulty of understanding what the investigating officer intended to express. 
nor is it very difficult to establish a determinate form remaining always the same in its principal features it will suffice to recall the rules laid down for drawing up an inquest report in all cases a general description of the spot must be set out stating where it is and how it is reached then state whether it is a house field wood etc that is in question next indicate the neighborhood precisely and then describe the actual scene in detail always having regard to its connection with the case under inquiry the extent of the description in the first place naturally depends on the nature of the crime in all cases we are not dealing with accidents the following must be described one the place itself two the direction from which the guilty person came three that in which he went four the spots whence the witnesses have seen or could have seen anything five all points where traces of the crime are to be found or where they might have been expected to be found but where in fact there are none the notification of even purely negative facts should not be neglected for on the one hand they may lead to positive inferences and on the other reassure the reader and show him that they were not forgotten altogether suppose for example traces of blood are mentioned as having been found in the room of a murdered man it is not sufficient merely to enumerate these but what has not been found must also be stated as for example that there was no bloody water in the wash-hand basin nor any imprints of blood-stained fingers or hands or if the report concerns a search for compromising papers which has been without result it must be expressly stated that no ashes of burnt paper were to be found in the fireplace the special circumstances attaching to each particular crime must of course be set out for example in cases of arson the objects more especially exposed to danger or anything that may have assisted or impeded the wind in riots places from which weapons have been taken such as a fence pile of wood thatched roof of a hut etc after the general sketch the actual place of occurrence must be described in detail as for example in cases of murder the room containing the body of the victim in cases of burglary the place where the house was broken into or in arson the place where the fire first started and here a certain order must also be observed with a room or other enclosed space the door should be taken as a starting point and the same direction followed as the hands of a clock that is standing in the entrance and facing into the room start from the left hand and go round the room towards the right hand in this way one will be certain that nothing has been forgotten first describe the size shape height and other peculiarities of the space in question then go from the entrance towards the nearest left corner then the left hand wall then the wall facing the entrance then the right hand wall then the remainder of the wall to the right of the doorway and finally the objects in the middle of the room in the course of this description the windows and the doors will be noticed next describe any alterations in the state of the movables in the room consequent upon the crime in question damage done by blows blood stains changes in the situation or position of objects damage to windows doors etc and finally a minute description of the subject matter of the crime for example a broken safe a dead body etc with all the particulars necessary to a detailed description in doing this the investigating officer must proceed step by step examining minutely at the same time its description as written down a piece of cloth for instance lying on the ground will be primarily described according to the impression it produced when first observed as for example quite near the corpse an inch from the left hand a red cloth rolled up in a bowl apparently of cotton and about the size of a pocket handkerchief one corner sticking out lying on the ground in the direction of the head of the body 
on picking up this piece of cloth it is found not to be cotton but half silk it is a three-cornered scarf with hemmed borders and each side seventeen inches forty-three centimeters in length it is unmarked and has a hole in the middle about the size of a pie piece probably due to use under the scarf is no trace of blood or anything remarkable it is not identified by any one present naming those present a b c etc it probably therefore did not belong to the murdered person he then passes on to all the important details that may serve to throw light on the case footprints marks caused by firearms or tools impressions of any kinds in short everything which may have been produced by the guilty person and everything which may have been articles left behind by him in these subdivisions as well as in the general preliminary description an invariable order must also be rigidly adhered to the same order or direction followed at the beginning must be continued when treating of the details if for example the description of a corpse has been commenced by proceeding from the head to the feet it is best first to describe any important objects found in the neighborhood of the head and finish with those near the feet in making an abstract of these details a measuring rule must as far as possible be used and the distances indicated exactly for one never knows at the time what may be of use subsequently all expressions should be avoided which only serve to fill up a sentence without giving an exact idea of anything expressions such as not far from there some little distance away a little higher further behind away at the bottom ought on no condition to occur in a report that such expressions should be used is easily understood for the investigating officer has everything before his eyes and such an expression as quite near is perfectly clear to him but the person who has to read the report may have quite different ideas of the distances any one who has paid attention to this detail will allow that there are few reports where such expressions are not to be found and that these very expressions have often rendered it difficult for him to properly appreciate the case the expressions on the right and on the left may only be used when they admit of no ambiguity as for instance on the right hand of the corpse or on the left bank of the river in all other cases these words must be totally discarded for even such expressions as to the right of the spectator or to the left of the entrance may give rise to ambiguity if the position of the spectator is not stated or if it is uncertain whether the investigating officer is within or without the entrance and in what direction he is facing but if all this has to be stated at length the description becomes tedious and obscure therefore be exact the points of the compass should be used as far as possible to describe the position of objects for then no doubt can arise in the mind and the description can always be checked subsequently but in a building and above all in a room it is in certain cases more convenient to choose if possible fixed points which have already been noted down and to state for example on a line extending from the head of the corpse to the corner of the room where the fireplace is situated and at a distance of two feet from this letter in this case the distance should without exception be taken as starting from a point which remains fixed it would not do to say for example on a line extending from the head of the corpse to the corner where the stove is situated and at three feet from the head of the corpse for the corpse will be removed and on subsequent measurements being taken it may be difficult to find this point again in addition to this the direction of measurement must be in most cases indicated it is not enough simply to say at twelve feet from the apple tree in question was found but say at twelve feet from the apple tree in question in the direction of the corner of the house situated to the northwest 
This sometimes necessitates a very long description, but the investigating officer must not be disheartened by that. It may be necessary to say at length, as follows, This door, single, not double, is three feet three inches broad. Starting from the hinge side, which is towards the north, and going towards the lock side, which is towards the south, measure eighteen inches along the bottom where the door touches the floor. From this point draw a perpendicular to the line formed by the bottom of the closed door, and from this perpendicular measure off seven inches starting from the door. At the spot thus obtained was found a piece of watch chain. When the situation of an object is of essential importance, the distance must be fixed between two measurements. This will be absolutely necessary where there are, for example, splashes of blood on the wall from which the position of the accused or of the person attacked and the kind of blood may be deduced. In such a case, where a horizontal and a vertical are involved, the floor should always be taken as the horizontal, for a spirit level would be necessary to lay a horizontal on the wall. The vertical may easily be found with the aid of a thread to which a knife, stone or some such object is attached. For example, for a drop of blood on the wall, a plumb line should first be constructed, a line with some small heavy object hanging from it. Then hold this plumb line at the point where this blood stain is to be found, taking care not to touch or graze it, and make a mark where the line touches the ground. Before completing the description of an enclosed space, the investigating officer must be well assured that nothing connected with the crime has been neglected or forgotten. For this it is not sufficient to throw a rapid glance around, but every object must be carefully and attentively reconsidered, so as to make certain that nothing important has been overlooked, and to see whether or not, after all that has been done, the matter does not bear a different aspect to that which it bore previously, or some detail which at first appeared to be of no consequence, is not now of some importance. In a recent case, a cigar holder with an amber mouthpiece was found near the corpse of a murdered man, and the marks of the teeth upon it brought about the detection of the murderer. See chapter 5, section 2, G, the teeth. If any independent person who knows the room in question be near at hand, he should be sent for and asked to help in the examination of the room and its contents. Such a person will be better able to notice any changes that may have taken place than the investigating officer who now sees the room for the first time. It is impossible to notice everything which may subsequently turn out to be of importance, even though folio volumes be written, for there are always certain details which will be passed over owing to the difficulty of foreseeing their value. In one case it turned out to be of great significance to know whether the sun shone into a certain part of the room at a certain hour of the day, and for this purpose the locality had to be specially revisited, though very far distant from the place where the court was sitting. In another case everything depended upon whether any sand was strewn about on the floor of the room, a point that no one had thought it worth while to observe. Such an omission will never be a reproach to an investigating officer, for only chance would make him think of noting down such details, but it would be a grave fault for the investigating officer to neglect details of which, though insignificant in themselves, the subsequent importance might have been foreseen. The old axiom of the civil law, the minimis non curat lex, does not hold good for the investigating officer. Only too often he must seek the strongest proof and the smallest details. Everyone has seen, everyone has read in thousands of criminal tragedies, cases where some trifle has become the pivot upon which the whole case turned, and yet the capital fault in inspecting localities very often consists in the neglect of small details, the importance of which would have been apparent if a proper and sustained attention had been brought to bear upon them. The following cases are cited from the author's own experience. 
on one occasion everything rested on whether or not at the hour of the crime the latch of the door was oiled or made a noise on another whether a half-burnt cigar was in an ashtray or beside it again whether there was a spider's web near a nail in the wall on another whether there was still some kerosene in a lamp that is whether it had been extinguished or had burnt itself out in a murder case the assailant would certainly have gone undiscovered if the investigating officer had not thought of examining the top of a wooden partition about eight feet in height and not reaching to the ceiling he saw that the top of the partition was covered with a thick coating of dust save in one place where the dust had been displaced and naturally concluded that a man must have quite recently climbed over the partition at the spot he made a search and discovered the accused among people living in the room separated from the scene of the crime by the partition in question when the description has to be made in the open the same method should be followed it is distressing to see how badly the work is sometimes done in reading certain reports one can clearly see what trouble the investigating officer has taken in writing down the result of his labours and what difficulty he has had in finding a starting point generally the most unfortunate point of all is chosen how painfully he has made his way through his description and how recognizing the insufficiency of his work he has attempted to remedy it by making all sorts of conditions modifications and explanations which have but served to completely obscure what before had perhaps some approach to clearness for all that the matter is not really so difficult but the investigating officer must first perceive clearly what the matter is about and what is to be described he must moreover remember that the reader will not have the scene under his eyes and cannot therefore represent it to himself in the same way as the investigating officer who has seen it all and he must make up his mind to proceed according to a definite plan and not jump about now here now there if he has a principle and remains faithful to it not only will the description be comprehensible and useful but his task will be greatly facilitated one thing following from another and he will not have the trouble of making every few lines additions and references which he himself has brought about and of having to face difficulties of his own making what principle to choose will be indicated by the nature of the case yet it would be well for the investigating officer before actually commencing his work to consider how the case will proceed if he acts according to such and such a plan if he foresees difficulties he must set to work in some other way the systems followed by an investigating officer may be divided into subjective and objective the mode of procedure will be subjective where the various objects and places are described in the order they presented themselves to the investigating officer or to the accused himself that is in the order in which the investigating officer sees them as he comes from a certain direction or in following the direction taken by the accused at the times of his arrival and of his departure and flight this method is not always a very good one because for example the accused may perhaps have come and gone on the same side though by different roads but it is very convenient in certain circumstances and especially when it is thought that by this method the report will better adapt itself to an inquiry on the spot the procedure is objective when the investigating officer deals simply with the localities themselves without having regard to the direction followed as for example beginning at the east and advancing step by step towards the west or by choosing some fixed point such as a street or house and advancing from it in other directions as towards a street river or boundary let it be repeated that no method can be absolutely recommended for every case the choice must ultimately depend on the case itself it will be easier to decide by first making a sketch plan chapter twelve 
which should always be made before the written description. With this always before his eyes, the investigating officer will soon find out what is the best method to follow in each case. End of section 22「Section 23 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1 」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2015 – Criminal Investigation – A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers and Lawyers, Volume 1 – by Hans Gross, translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter 3 Inspection of Localities, Continued. Section 4 Search for Hidden Objects. If one desired to call attention to every place where objects bearing in some manner upon a case might be found hidden, a list would have to be drawn up of all objects situated either in houses or in the open air, and large enough to shelter a corpus delicti. There is little probability of finding anything of importance if the attention be confined to safes, almirahs, beds, boxes, stoves, or chimneys. Absolutely everything must be examined, for there is no place where important objects cannot be hidden. The following, for example, are a few of the hiding places discovered by the author or his friends. The horsehair stuffing of a sofa, a bird cage, the space between the back of a picture and its protecting board, the hole of an old key, the manger in a stable, a pot in which soup was actually boiling on the fire, it contained twenty-eight gold coins, a prayer book, old boots, a dog kennel, the space between two upright millstones, wine barrels, a spectacle case, a pill box, old newspapers, a cuckoo clock, a baby's clothes, and on one occasion the criminal himself was discovered in a dung heap, a small opening having been made to give him air in the side nearest to the stable wall. In India, weapons and even other objects are constantly concealed in the thatch of houses or sheds. Jewelry and small portable objects are buried, either tied up in a cloth or in an earthenware pot, in rice or grain heaps, and in wells. In one case where a large number of documents, in value about 50,000 rupees were stolen solely for spite, it is understood that they were boiled to pulp in the cauldron used for boiling the cattle food, and were then run off through the town drain. Moreover, the accused himself must always be carefully searched. This the investigating officer often neglects to do, either out of regard for the accused, or from timidity, or some other motive. Certainly, search is a great affront to the liberty of the subject, and such a measure should only be resorted to after mature consideration and in the last extremity. But if resolved on, it must be carried out energetically, and not only the house, but the man himself must be searched. In the great majority of cases, the hidden object will be found upon him, for everyone is naturally inclined to carry on his person suspicious or dangerous objects, just as he is wont to carry objects of value, believing they are more secure. The task is greatly facilitated if it is known what is to be searched for, for then many places where it cannot be hidden may be excluded. Unfortunately, the objects searched for are often small and easy to hide, such as money, jewels, papers, poison. Such things can be hidden almost anywhere. The presence of the accused may render the task easier, for his face and glances often indicate to a keen observer whether the search is in a likely place or not, whether the searcher is hot or cold. If objects of some size are sought for, and it is ascertained that they are not hidden in places easy to be got at, they must be looked for in the structure of the building itself. 
but as it is scarcely ever practicable to make a thorough search by demolishing the building the investigating officer may employ certain artifices of the simplest kind and keep his eyes well open suppose that the objects have been walled up it is useless to take into account those parts of the wall which can be easily seen for it is scarcely probable that anything is hidden there at least when there is no reason to suppose that the plaster has had time to dry as a rule the walling up is behind mirrors or boxes or in cellars and the place may be recognized by the freshness or inequality of the plastering if the place is not found thus and there is still room to believe that the objects are hidden in the walls there is nothing else to be done but to knock and tap the walls and listen for the hollow sound indicating a cavity noting when such sound is produced this work is really quicker to execute than might be supposed the search for a hiding place under a wooden floor is more difficult and as the floor cannot be completely taken up indications of a recent disturbance must be sought and such indications do as a rule exist in an ordinary plank the heads of the nails driven into the boards must be examined when the floor is first constructed the nails holding the planks to the cross beams are driven in as far as possible so that the heads of the nails are a little below the surface of the floor to prevent the feet from catching upon them this being the case it is difficult to pull out the nails especially if the floor has been often scrubbed and the nails have become somewhat rusted with the wet when the nails holding so tenaciously to the floor it is impossible to extract them without damaging the wood round them and traces of such damage cannot be effaced if therefore the wood round the nails appears to be bruised or damaged in any way it can with certainty be presumed that something is hidden in that place it is useless to lift the planks where no such indications are to be seen a very frequent case especially in india is where something has been buried in an earthen or mud floor here water should be poured in fairly large quantities on the suspected surface the place where the water filters through more rapidly than elsewhere and where at the same time bubbles make their appearance is the place where the soil is broken and where digging has been recently carried on it is the same when the covering is of bricks flagstones or such like in time a quantity of dust or sand gathers between them which by its own weight and humidity forms a kind of firm cement if then water be thrown over this paving it sinks in but slowly being as it were drunk up little by little but if the flagstones etc have recently been taken up and laid down again and the interstices have been filled up by sweeping in sand or dust which does not as yet hold together like cement the water will penetrate very rapidly and air bubbles be seen mounting to the surface it is always difficult to carry on such searches in the open air the large expanse of space hinders methodical procedure and success must often depend on luck there is one possible expedient when the object is to discover a corpse to make use of a good bloodhound but it is useless to take the first setter or bloodhound that comes along few dogs have a good enough scent if the investigating officer needs help in such cases it will be of little good to him to issue an order for a hunting dog for he is pretty sure not to get one of any use in this case again as we have said before preparation for war must be made in time of peace this is the most necessary since helps of this kind are often met with when not looked for while generally not to be found on the spot when they are wanted and where owing to the nature of the case one might have hoped to find them a tanner was the owner of quite a common watchdog having absolutely no resemblance to a hunting dog but which out of pure voracity could even from a great distance send out any carrion the local sportsmen used to borrow him after each shoot to look for the game killed which had been undiscovered by the dogs 
the tanner's dog would find anything animal alive or dead and he would pull up just as quickly before a recently killed deer and the body of a cat dead long since but he would find both one day when they were seeking the body of an idiot who had disappeared and who was suspected of having been murdered by his brother-in-law this dog discovered the body a long way off in a wood at that moment it was yet possible to establish that the idiot had succumbed to an attack of epilepsy but some days later a post-mortem would have been unable to prove that no violence had been used and the brother-in-law would have gone through life with the suspicion of murder hanging over him but this matter can also be managed in a systematic way in paris where every year an astonishing number of people disappear especially children the police keep dogs which are trained like the bloodhounds of cuba where they used to be employed for tracking fugitive slaves in such cases some clothes etc belonging to the person to be caught are placed to the nose of the dog which is then brought on the trail if this trail is fairly fresh the dog will follow it without caring for the hundreds of other trails crossing the right one until the fugitive is reached a short time ago a dog was mentioned in a paris paper as having succeeded in finding for the police its twenty-fifth lost child if we compare this with the splendid results of the austrian and german war dogs it must be allowed that dogs can help us in many cases we do not claim that the state should keep official dogs of this kind but if a policeman or any other official should show special interest in training dogs for this purpose government should give him some assistance here we may also repeat that it is very helpful to study nature we have mentioned that a considerable number of murdered people are buried in rather deserted places especially in the jungle a great number of these are often dug out by jackals and other animals who easily scent out such spots when a corpse is not completely covered it is of course easy for dogs or even men to find it in the province of west prussia in the summer of eighteen sixty seven two murder cases were discovered through the murdered bodies having been uncovered by foxes moreover crows ravens kites and above all vultures etc will at once collect and so it is not unprofitable to watch for this sign the body of a murdered woman was once found in the following way the teachers of the surrounding schools told the children to report as soon as they saw many crows ravens etc gathering anywhere some of them made such a report with the successful result that the murdered person was traced a most instructive incident arose during the search of a dwelling house a poacher had fired upon a gamekeeper who thought he recognized his assailant the house of the suspected person was searched the principal object sought for being the gun the search was carried out with the greatest care the house being turned out from top to bottom but no trace of gun or ammunition was to be found and the inquiry was declared closed during the search a heavy rainstorm came on and the search party remained in the house waiting for it to stop the house in question was built like most peasant houses it had a ground floor divided by a corridor at one end of which was the front door and at the other the back door while the doors of the kitchen and living rooms opened on to it the front and back doors except in winter remained open all day it was in this corridor the search party awaited the end of the storm the rain coming down heavier and heavier and beginning to come in at the front door they shut the latter and there they found hanging on the inside of the door which had up till that time been leaning against the wall the gun and a pouch containing powder and shot a similar case communicated by mr stellar vicar of glein also related to a poacher numerous thefts of game had taken place for some years in a certain part of the country and the bell ringer of a little church was suspected no proof however could ever be obtained the most minute searches in his house being without result 
It was only after his death that his gun and accessories were discovered, hidden under the high altar of the church, where no one seems to have thought of looking. End of section 23「Section 24 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Torres. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter 4. Equipment of the Investigating Officer The work of the investigating officer is like all other pursuits. The material side, the tools necessary, are of inestimable importance. More than one great success, more than one great failure, have been due exclusively to the fact that on the one hand, the investigating officer had ready on the spot all the aid necessary for his investigation, or, on the other, that he either had no implements at all, or those which he had were defective or unsuitable. Perhaps some will consider what follows useless or trivial, but experience has shown that an investigating officer who possesses a traveling office box or bag in perfect order and provided with all necessaries will find his work much facilitated and will ensure greater speed in his labors such an outfit has been at times the sole cause of a great success first let us consider in detail what is indispensable one a supply of paper is of course a necessity this should include several sheets of writing paper of the best quality in an inquiry the ordinary government official paper should never be used. It is generally of very bad quality, and you may live to repent employing it. 2. Several envelopes of various sizes. 3. Several sheets of blotting paper. 4. A certain number of all the usual official printed blank forms, as inquest reports, warrants, summonses to witnesses, etc. One must not wait for the time of starting to put these in order they should be replenished immediately on the return from each inquiry with these should be carried pocket editions text only of the penal code code of criminal procedure and evidence act five a good map of the taluk or district in which one is about to travel to save space it is better to have an unmounted map as its use is comparatively infrequent six the investigating officer will also be provided with pens and pencils these should be of the best quality good pens mean quick and legible writing whence economy of time and consequently greater care and accuracy in the inquiry for steel nibs a good globe or ballpoint pen is the best as it does not penetrate or catch the paper and thus permits swift and easy writing the use of fountain pens is now almost universal in india among officials the advice to be given as to them is shun cheap imitations by unknown makers nothing is more trustworthy than a fountain pen by a reliable maker every one has his own fancy but a pen without such guarantee and previous trial should be rigorously discarded seven for ordinary pens a pocket ink bottle is necessary care should be taken to see that it shuts closely and is refilled after each investigation the ordinary spring top cases with india rubber on the lid to seal the bottle are not very satisfactory in fact all rubber articles perish very rapidly in india for the fountain pen, a swan fountain pen ink filler should be carried. It consists of a bottle of ink with the filler forming the cork contained in a cylindrical wooden or metal screw top case. The ordinary filler can be obtained for one rupee from any dealer in fountain pens and will be found invaluable in traveling. As a reserve in case of need, a little nigrosine or ink powder should be carried. As this is supplied to and used in every office in India, nothing more need be said about it. The swan ink tablets, which can be had in various colors and nickel tubes at eight annas and one rupee, are also very convenient. 8. A yard measure. 9. A pair of compasses. 10. A pedometer, though not perhaps indispensable, is most useful. It is the shape and size of a watch. If one wishes to measure a long distance, one sets the needles on all the dials at zero. 
puts the instrument in the pocket and walks off for greater certainty one may put the instrument in one's boot when every step will certainly be registered thus better results are obtained than by merely counting paces while the great advantage accrues that he who carries it can look about him and devote his attention to other matters which is quite impossible while continually counting eleven tracing paper and cloth the cloth is useful for removing traces of blood and in all circumstances when paper is not strong enough twelve a bottle of plaster of paris and another of oil these are mainly used for preserving footprints and impressions see chapter thirteen thirteen a brush the brush is useful for taking impressions of solid objects and surfaces in relief with moistened blotting paper such as marks made by a tool as a chisel cuts by a knife or hatchet damage to material objects etc as to the method of doing this see chapter twelve fourteen sealing wax fifteen two small glass tubes these are useful for making quickly any simple experiment for instance to see if substance found in the body of a corpse or in the course of a search be arsenic or not arsenic is the poison in most common use hence it is important to detect it quickly as its discovery may lead to an immediate arrest these test tubes should be of clear thin glass closed at one end from three to four inches long and the thickness of a lead pencil see chapter sixteen sixteen two wax candles of the length and thickness of one's finger are often useful seventeen a compass eighteen an iron box with matches if smokers themselves often forget their matches how much more careful should investigating officers be in making sure of being always provided with this indispensable accessory nineteen a piece of soap it is great comfort to have a wash after a search handling dirty clothes perhaps dirty bodies etc soap is also useful to take small impressions as of keys teeth in the case of bites etc twenty a good magnifying glass this most useful friend should be mounted in a broad rim so as to be protected from scratches for a scratch magnifying glass is worse than useless twenty one a camel hair brush this is useful for oiling footmarks before taking the impression and also for removing traces of blood etc twenty two some gum arabic twenty three some thick smooth note paper ordinary paper is too coarse and rough for preserving small articles while glazed paper contains too many foreign admixtures twenty four the office seal for greater convenience this may be used without a handle so that it takes up no more room than a coin say five shillings or five francs or even a rupee twenty five a few sheets of manifolding paper the use of this is too well known to require explanation the best appliance to use when traveling is a hard and sharp lead pencil twenty six some tissue paper this is handy for taking impressions of fine surfaces as of wood a stone etc where blotting paper would be too rough twenty seven a good watch for the carriage of all these indispensable accessories the great majority of our readers will have recourse to the time-honored office box for traveling purposes this is a most cumbersome companion it requires a special attendant to carry it the key is usually in some receptacle carried by another peon and they are never to be found in the same place at the same time its corners are painfully in evidence in country carts jutkas and such like its internal arrangements are generally chaotic and must necessarily be so unless special care has been devoted to them we have seen office boxes fitted up as ingeniously as a lady's jewel case but that is due to the rare idiosyncrasy of the owner for those who desire a self-contained receptacle which can be carried in time of need on the person of the owner without inconvenience we strongly recommend a leather bag like a courier bag or military sabotage this will hold everything required protect the contents from damp and be easy to carry military experience shows that if well balanced and resting on the correct spot which can always be found after a few trials its existence is forgotten after a march of a quarter of an hour it should be about ten inches long by eight inches broad divided by partitions lengthways and with an outside pocket at the top two leather loops about five inches long should be firmly sewn through which passes an ordinary belt the latter must be so adjusted that the bag hangs or rests on the top of the left thigh behind there it will remain immovable even on a quick march 
the best fastener is by means of a ring passing through a slit in the flap and secured by a pin and chain one compartment should be reserved solely for paper the sheets being folded where necessary first lengthwise and then crossways all the accessories together with the bag should then be taken to a saddler or binder who will fix them by means of slips of leather or linen on pieces of stout cardboard the size of the bag just as is done with toilet articles in a travelling bag these boards can then be slipped into the divisions of the bag and withdrawn at will but we must repeat that it should be made a rule to replenish the bag on the return from every journey and not wait until the next setting out these sudden starts are generally made only in important cases but it is just in such cases that one has plenty to think about and cannot be bothered with remembering if all the little necessary articles are in order he should be able to just pick up his bag and be ready this advice may appear puerile but no one who has once experienced what it is to be without the necessary article at the critical moment will so consider it it will greatly assist in keeping the receptacle in perfect readiness to have a list of all the articles it should contain legibly written and gummed inside the flap of the bag or the lid of the office box other things may be usefully carried according to the fancy of the officer in particular a few simple medicines should always be handy early rising a hot journey bad food may always bring on a headache diarrhea etc in these days of tabloids and concentrated medicines this requirement is easily satisfied antiparin chlorodyne sal volatile or quinine or better some reliable fever pill containing opium and a few similar common remedies are easily carried and may make all the difference between comfort and misery that is between success and failure anglo-indian officers accustomed as they are to traveling and camping out hardly require a word of advice as to food and drink but when starting away from a camp on an expedition which may last many hours the precaution of taking a few preserved provisions two or three bottles of aerated waters and a flask of best brandy should never be omitted it seems almost absurd to indict a warning against drinking unfiltered water drawn from country wells or tanks yet we have known the most valuable lives thrown away by absolute disregard of the simplest precautions and even in spite of specific warning smokers should always have a few cigars in reserve for how often does not one in his haste forget his cigar case a post-mortem for instance is not a very pleasant thing for the mere lawyer if he cannot smoke even the brandy flask may be a very present help in such circumstances for the majority of our readers it will be unnecessary to say anything on the subject of transit that vex question for the lawyer when away from railway lines or towns for every official can rely upon the revenue authorities or the village officials to provide for him for us others bucksheesh and extortionate charges are all we can fall back upon starting however from centres where there is a fair supply and not being a high-placed official with fast-trotting horses the traveller will find that for a comparatively short journey where speed is essential there is nothing to beat the pony judka judka is the mudra's name but similar vehicles may be found all over india the best type in south india is known as the velour judka even with it the discomfort is extreme and the jolting indescribable yet they get over the ground a good judka pony in fair condition should always be good for blank miles in three hours or a little more readers note the number of miles is not readable in the text End note. when urgency is not essential or when no other means of conveyance can be obtained the ordinary covered cart may be made fairly comfortable the best foundation for a bed therein is a thick layer of twigs freshly clipped they are better than straw and make a very good spring mattress some straw may if desired be spread on top and with a thick rizai or small mattress over all one can sleep comfortably from sunset to sunrise covering twenty-five miles or thereby be sure to have your bag and reserve provisions and drinks in the cart with you for your attendant carts with servants and impedimenta have a way of getting lost en route and not turning up till long after you have arrived at your destination carry as a rule a supply of copper coins travellers either give no bucksheesh which leads to dire discomfort if not worse or give far too much being generally thought fools for their pains a piece here and there especially if given to the real helpers will work wonders far more than as many rupees given to a headman or an officious loafer end of section twenty four recording by michelle torres section twenty five of criminal investigation volume one this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Criminal Investigation. A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers and Lawyers. Volume 1. By Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter 5. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him. Section 1. General Considerations. Experts are the most important auxiliaries of an investigating officer. In some way or other, they nearly always are the main factor in deciding a case. True it is that the investigating officer, whose work lies for the most part up-country, has not skilled experts always at his immediate disposition, but in important cases he is able to refer to experts at headquarters. On the other hand, experts of even very small value can give excellent results. But everything depends upon knowing how to make use of them. Indeed, it is often less important to know who is to be questioned than to know how, upon what, and when questions must be put. But it is also an important thing for the investigating officer to know just whom he ought to apply to, i.e., what kind of expert he ought to select. Moreover, he must know what the expert is capable of telling him in each case, that is to say, where his knowledge begins and what are the natural limits to it. And finally, he must seize the proper moment for putting his questions, i.e., the moment when he is in possession of sufficient material to render any further research superfluous. He will, for instance, only be in possession of the best information on interrogating an observer at the microscope in cases where medical men are incapable of enlightening him. At other times, sportsmen and shikaris will be able to give him satisfactory replies where learned experts in arms may fail him. In this connection, the explanations of the latter may be of little use, some special knowledge being required in each case. As regards the limits of the expert's knowledge, the investigating officer must be particularly careful not to ask too much, for if he were to do so he might look ridiculous. On the other hand, if he does not ask enough, he may deprive himself of information of great value. A case is recalled in which the investigating officer desired to know whether the blood stain on a piece of cloth was that of a boy or of a girl. Another investigating officer took a stove to pieces and sent it carefully packed to the chemical examiner with a request to know whether banknotes had been burned in it or not. And a colleague of the author recently met with a case in which it was asked whether the arsenic found in the corpse could be identified with that found in a sausage. On the other hand, every investigating officer knows of cases in which the solution of problems, seeming to outsiders almost insoluble, has been obtained. In this way, experts in physics will discover, by a magnetic process, traces of iron, where chemical experts have found nothing. Botanists once furnished the author with certain proof that some branches of hops had been cut with a particular knife. What can be performed with the assistance of electricity, the refinements of photography, radioactive rays, Röntgen rays and other acquisitions, is simply illimitable. As regards the moment at which advice should be asked, care must be taken not to lose too much time, but knowledge of the circumstances attending the crime must be given to the expert. It is often stated that the expert has only to occupy himself with the object to be examined. On a wound, for example, being shown to him, he should determine its nature, the time necessary for its healing, and say generally what will be its consequences. But this is not all. He ought also to tell us the weapon, position of the criminal, and mode in which the blow has been delivered. The numerous difficulties which such cases present, and the number of different causes which may produce the same effect, must not be forgotten. That a conscientious expert is aware of all the circumstances attending a crime, has read the depositions of the witnesses, and has seen the supposed weapon, etc., is no reason for his coming to a precipitate conclusion. But, thus informed, it will be possible for him to weigh every circumstance, obtain a general idea of the occurrence, and affirm more clearly, with more certainty, and, what is very important, 
less discursively than if the aids in question had been refused to him. It must not be forgotten that today, in spite of, and perhaps because of, the great progress of science, people make statements with much less assurance than formerly. One has only to compare books on medical jurisprudence written thirty years ago with those of today to see that the writers of those days, acting upon a small number of cases at their disposal, did not hesitate to state general principles, the correctness of which are now much shaken. For experimental science, now much more extensive, has found out so many exceptions that in the long run they sometimes become more numerous than the so-called rules. This principle must be applied to other domains, and we must not boast of our own knowledge, which is always more or less incomplete. If we do not know the exceptions ourselves, we have but to demand them of specialists. By conforming to this rule, we will obtain astonishing results. The specialist will refute a well-established conviction, leading us to say, I believe it is always thus, with a series of exceptions in which it is not always thus. In a recent case, medical experts, who, on examination in the witness-box, affirmed positively that it was impossible for a cavity to form in lober pneumonia, when confronted with authorities in cross-examination, admitted that such a thing was quite possible. If, therefore, experts themselves may be mistaken, how much more should the investigating officer be unashamed to question others upon things which seem beyond all doubt? Moreover, the circle of experts must be enlarged as much as possible. Some investigating officers in many years have never made use of any other experts than doctors, analysts, and gunsmiths. It has never crossed their minds to consult workmen and artisans of all kinds. They have not thought that they might be able to obtain most precious information from such sources. The author must confess that he has often had business with experts without knowing at the outset what they might be able to tell him. He once sent for a cutler, and gave him a knife found in the wound of a murdered person, and asked him whether he could give any information about it. The cutler replied that such knives were only manufactured in the north of Bohemia, and this information brought about the discovery of the criminal. A turner pointed out that an article the criminal had left behind must have been turned by a left-handed person. The person arrested, who denied the crime, came from a distant town. Search was made in that place for a left-handed turner who, when found, identified the accused as the person who had bought the article from him. Linguists have indicated the nationality of the writer of a letter. A schoolmaster has guessed the age of a banknote forger, then unknown, from the mistakes in writing which he made. And astronomers have given the day in spring, which, as regards the evening light, corresponded with a certain day in autumn. In the last case, the investigating officer was able to visit a locality in spring in order to find out if the criminal would be able to see, and must have seen, such and such a thing at a certain hour on a certain day in the autumn. See chapter 1, page 28. A numismatist was able to play an even more important role as an expert. A coin with the figure of St. George was found on the scene of a crime. On the face St. George, on the reverse a ship with Christ and his disciples. A witness was able to swear that the accused owned a coin which had a ship on one side. He had not seen the other side. The numismatist affirmed that this coin was most probably a St. George coin for there are very few other coins bearing a ship, and, besides, it was impossible for the accused to be in possession of any of those others. It is self-evident that numerous consultations with specialists have no results, but one must not allow oneself to be disheartened by the number of consultations made, nor discouraged by checks in any particular case. If one is content to examine and measure accurately the instrument of the crime in conjunction with the expert, without going any further, the result would be hardly appreciable. If one entered upon a fairly long technical discussion with the specialist, especially if he is a simple-minded person, and if the case is related and explained to him, little by little, much useful information will be gathered in. Often quite a series of workmen, etc., will have to be consulted 
when it is believed that some peculiarity is due to a certain kind of skill connected with some particular trade. One day, for example, an important theft, extremely skilfully carried out, was committed in the following manner. A thief, a former servant of a banker who lived alone, had slipped during the daytime into the room next to the bedroom of his old master. The thief was aware that the banker was in the habit, before going to bed, of locking the door between his bedroom and the room where the former was hidden. He therefore resolved to wait until the old gentleman was asleep, then slip into the bedroom, take the key of the safe from the bed-table, open the safe, and complete the theft, which indeed he did. But, so as not to be shut out in the room where he was hiding, it was necessary to make the banker believe that he had already locked the door of communication. The thief therefore shaped a small piece of wood to cork up the slot or square opening into which the bolt of the lock penetrates. When the banker went to lock the door before getting into bed, the bolt was unable to enter the hole in the doorpost, thus producing the same effect as if the door had been already locked and, indeed, the banker declared afterwards his belief that he had already locked the door without remembering having done so. The door, therefore, remained unlocked, and the thief was able to carry out his project. But he had left the little piece of wood, which was prismatic in shape, in the slot, and it was shown to various experts. The first was a locksmith, who very sensibly remarked, quote, The person who made this works more minutely than we do, it was not necessary to cork the hole with so much care. Quite an ordinary little piece of wood would have done well enough, provided that it was of the proper length. End quote. A turner was then questioned, who, on seeing the piece of wood, was of opinion that its workmanship indicated a man who knew how to carve. A turner turns but does not carve, and so it could not have been a turner who was concerned in the theft. A woodcarver was next questioned, and he was able by chance to indicate an instrument used exclusively by makers of boot and shoe trees. This instrument was procured, and the investigating officer was easily convinced of the accuracy of the woodcarver's statements, and, on the result being communicated to the victim of the theft, the thief was easily found. In fact, the last servant whom the banker had dismissed had formerly been a tree-maker, and indeed went back to that trade whenever he was out of a place. It is besides astonishing to note the difficulty which people have, especially persons of the working classes, in getting rid of their usual manner of working. It seems quite natural to them, and seeing nothing out of the way in it themselves, they have no fear of discovery. They imagine that it appears quite as natural to others. Thus, a weaver makes a weaver's knot a miller one like those with which he ties up his sacks of flour, a sailor makes a sailor's knot, a fisher a fisherman's knot, a butcher makes the same kind of knot as that which he uses to tie the cord to the horn of the animal to be slaughtered, and the gypsy who, in breaking into a room, fastens the doors to avoid surprises, ties the stick which he employs for that purpose with a cord in quite a singular manner. Tardieu tells of a case regarding a so-called artillery knot, and Hoffman, in his legal medicine, of a case of suicide of a silk worker who used a knot such as he employed in making shawl fringes. It goes without saying that there are no professional experts in the science of knot-making. The only thing to be done is to question people whom one believes to have some special knowledge until the right man is hit upon. Cases of this kind are numerous. A newborn child had been killed with a knife thrust in the back of the head, at the place where the head joins the spinal column. In the same way as one kills a partridge, said the mayor, who was an experienced sportsman, and indeed the lover of the dead child's mother, was a young sportsman. In the case of Madame Henri, in which a body was found in a sack in the river, it was shown by a police officer that the sack had been sewn up by a woman, and then bound and tied up by a man. But if experts are capable of informing the investigating officer on many points, care must at the same be taken not to ask them, and especially medical ones, for too many or for too precise explanations. The author has no intention of reprobating the ridicule with which the investigating officer is covered, who asks a doctor foolish questions, 
or who requests information which cannot, in the present state of science, be conscientiously given. He would merely recall the fact that a medical man, like all other men, sums up the person who questions him from the way in which the questions are put. Profound medical knowledge is certainly not required of the investigating officer, but it is necessary that his questions be not too absurd. It is only too easy for the medical man to be placed in such a position that he is forced to ask himself how, in spite of all the knowledge he has so laboriously acquired, such infantile questions can possibly be answered. If he persists in demanding answers which cannot be given to him, not only does the investigating officer deprive the medical man of all pleasure in his work, but he also exposes the whole case to an irremediable check. It must be repeated that the investigating officer has not always at his beck and call the medical jurisprudence and experienced professors provided with all necessary instruments who are to be found in great cities. He is often obliged to work up-country with doctors who are quite young, very old, or with little training. They may be the best practitioners in the world in general practice, but they are not medical jurisprudence in the proper sense of the word. Only those who have had long experience of them can know what qualities a good medical jurisprudent should have. He ought certainly to be a specialist in all branches of medical knowledge, ought to know all the difficulties to be met with, and have special experience of criminals. It would not be fair to the medical jurisprudent who represents all branches of medical science to pretend that any country doctor, even the very best, can be a medical jurisprudent absolutely worthy of confidence. It is for this reason that the investigating officer should take care not to ask the medical man for too much. It is natural for a man to prefer to say, the thing is so, rather than, I do not know, and sometimes the doctor will make precise replies when pressed by an investigating officer, replies which will not bear the examination of science. It has been necessary for the best-known professors in medical jurisprudence to boldly avow, quote, We do not know this, nor yet that, and many other things besides. End quote. And yet the scientists of former times used to make the most categorical statements. Take but a few examples. With what certainty did they not use to distinguish antemortem from postmortem wounds? And yet every medical jurisprudent of today points out most convincingly that the so-called distinctive signs are not always infallible. Again, medical jurisprudence used to determine very accurately the beginning and the end of a gash or cut, a point perhaps very important in a case of murder or suicide. Modern medical men dare not, in most instances, form an opinion from the mere sight of the wound, and with what certainty they used to distinguish between the blood of wounds and that of menstruation. Yet it is now admitted that this distinction is one which is not to be depended on, and which can only be made in particular cases. Formerly, the possibility of ruptures of the larynx, of precipitate birth, and rupture of the umbilical cord in living persons, was absolutely denied. Today, these possibilities can be no longer doubted. End of section 25section twenty six of criminal investigation volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by anna simon criminal investigation a practical handbook for magistrates police officers and lawyers volume one by hans gross translated by john adam and john collier adam the expert and how to make use of him continued Section 2. Role of the Medical Jurisprudent Of all the experts an investigating officer has to deal with, the most important and the most frequently questioned are medical jurisprudents. With them, therefore, the investigating officer should enter into very intimate relations. It may be that the relations between the investigating officer and the medical jurisprudent have no direct value in a case, yet they are of the very highest importance. If they are purely professional in the sense that they are exterior, the manner of treating the most important and the greater number of cases in which medical jurisprudence play a role 
will be also professional and exterior. But if the connection between the investigating officer and the medical jurisprudent is closer and more amicable by reason of the interest taken in a common cause, the mode in which that cause is treated will bear witness to the lively enthusiasm and active cooperation of both persons. It must of necessity be presumed that the investigating officer and the medical jurisprudent are interested in their respective professions, for if they have no interest in them, they are as much to be pitied as they are unfit to render any service whatever. All they can do is to turn to some other career. If, on the contrary, they have zeal and energy, working together will encourage their efforts, and their collaboration will considerably aid the solution of the problem. The author always recalls with a feeling of thankfulness a deceased friend who was like himself attached to a large provincial court. He, as district medical officer and medical adviser to the court, and the author as investigating officer. We worked five years together and settled not a few cases. Many of these cases necessitated journeys of some distance, not one of which was made without freely discussing the case in question and obtaining from a medical legal point of view every possible explanation concerning it. The cases in which he took part were considered common property, and one as much as the other used to do his best to throw light upon them. It is impossible to imagine how work was stimulated, what lessons were obtained for the future, how the task was lightened, and, the author does not hesitate to say, what success crowned this collaboration. Neither the investigating officer nor the medical jurisprudent, especially the latter, can do good work if the relations between them are not close and intimate. To the advantages indicated above, another must be added. It is thanks to these relations that the investigating officer can more easily learn to know the occasions when he ought to consult a medical man. In many cases he neglects to question an expert even when the latter may be able to furnish him with important information, the reason being that the investigating officer is incapable of exactly appreciating the extent of the knowledge the expert or medical man possesses. This is a difficult thing to learn professionally, but it is easily learned privately. In cases into which medical knowledge enters, the medical man must always be questioned, even when the solution of the problem appears to surpass the limits of human knowledge, for example, when a long space of time has elapsed since the commission of the crime. Thus, Lehmann relates that from the corpse of a man so extensively decomposed that it had become black and green, it was possible to determine by the condition of the heart that death was due to a stroke of apoplexy, and that in consequence the man must have died a natural death. The same professor reports that the bones of King Dagobert, which were disinterred at Saint-Denis, twelve hundred years after his death, were so well preserved that it was possible to observe every mark of violence committed on his person. We may also mention the six thousand skulls contained in the crypt of the St. Florian convent near Ems in Upper Austria. They date from an unknown battle which is supposed to have taken place towards the end of the Great Migration, and are so well preserved that historians have been able to determine, from the wounds upon them, the shape of the weapons of the period. For example, one skull bears a wound made by an arrow which could have had only one sharp edge. It goes without saying that such old facts as these can scarcely be of interest to the investigating officer, but they prove that it is never too late to furnish proof of some particular fact. A medical jurisprudent ought always to be questioned before hazarding such an assertion. We now pass to the role of the medical jurisprudent in particular, and will first speak of the manner in which he must be utilized. a. Cases relating specially to medical jurisprudence. To this category of cases belong post-mortem wounds, illnesses, offences against morality, shamming or malingering, questions concerning the force and skill required for and the age of certain acts, and a great number of other questions which crop up every day. Practice alone can teach us what are the questions themselves and the way to attack them, and if in the course of time one has succeeded in reducing the number of these questions, one notes that it is precisely the good information obtained from the medical jurisprudent to which that reduction is due. Let us be content with a prudent reply, 
a little vague rather than too precise. But let us question the medical man in all cases where there is room to suppose that he can see further than an outsider. If one accepts a hypothetical reply from the medical man, one will know that he has replied in that manner on purpose, especially if, later, one comes to the conclusion that his answer could not have been more definite. Between A and not A, there is more than the whole alphabet, although each letter may have its own importance. The medical man should therefore not be pressed, and should be allowed sufficient time. When he examines a wounded man on the first occasion, he is not perhaps quite sure what to say. Allow him a second or even a third examination. One is certainly less exposed to mistakes when the medical man draws up no report at all, than when, pressed by the impatience of the investigating officer, he makes a report which he would have drawn up quite otherwise if the wounded person had been submitted to him for a second examination after a sufficient interval. This is still more true as regards post-mortems. If the medical man can say nothing immediately, he must indicate the investigations to be made to complete what the post-mortem has brought to light. We repeat that it is incorrect to say that the medical man has but to pronounce upon the actual situation, and that the investigation has nothing to do with him. The medical man only sees in a medical examination, or in a post-mortem, the result, and in many cases he hardly occupies his mind with the means that have brought about that result. The number six may as well be the product of two and three as the sum of three and three, or four and two, etc. So, in most cases, it is the manner in which the circumstance has come about that is the important thing, and the medical man can, after all, only arrive at the conclusion if he has read the brief. Besides, there is no fear that this knowledge of the case may beguile him into error, for he knows the result, and, if by chance, the indications contained in the papers he has read lead him on to a false path, he will always have a constant check in the fact itself. He will indeed perhaps be able to point out inaccuracies in the statements of the witness to the investigating officer. The interrogatory and the inquiry are one. Each completes the other, and, if the medical man knows that the investigating officer is not so foolish as to require from him mathematically incontrovertible replies, the knowledge he may possess of the facts of the case will induce him to make a prudent statement rather than draw up a hasty and precipitate report. Besides those cases in which the investigating officer necessarily requisitions the assistance of the medical man, there are others in which he may be of assistance. We will now mention some of these. b. Preservation of parts of a corpse. It often happens that a corpse cannot be identified on account of decomposition being too far advanced, and neither the structure of the body nor the articles of clothing, etc., found on the deceased showing any peculiarity to aid identification. And yet the identification may perhaps in certain circumstances be of the greatest importance. Let us suppose, for example, that we wish to establish that a corpse is really that of a man seen two weeks before in an hotel. No one knows him, but the witnesses state that they would be sure to be able to recognize him on seeing the features. They cannot remember, for example, his clothing, and they do not recollect having seen his watch or pocketbook, etc. They cannot say whether he had a particular cicatrix on the thigh or other exterior marks of identification. But if his features are so disfigured by decomposition that no man is able to recognize them, the medical specialist must be asked to carry out the regeneration process described by Professor von Hoffmann. Professor von Hoffmann says, quote, The head is cut off, the brain removed, and several deep cuts made in the back and sides of the head. It is then placed in pure running water. In twelve hours' time, the green colouring of the skin of the face will for the most part have disappeared or have got blanched, and the swelling greatly diminished. The top of the skull is then replaced, and the skin of the head sewn up again. The head is then plunged into a concentrated solution of alcohol. After another twelve hours, the green colouring and the swelling of decomposition will have so completely disappeared that the face will finally assume its normal condition and present the appearance of a corpse newly embalmed. Instead of the above solution, chloride of zinc may be employed with equal success. Of course, the possibility of reconstructing a face has its limits, 
especially when the hair has already fallen off and the skin of the face begun to be perforated with holes. In such a case, nothing can be done. End quote. This process is all the more valuable in that the head, when rendered recognizable, may be preserved, at least until the hearing of the case, and may be again shown to the witnesses. Attention has been called to it here, as it is probably unknown to many medico-legal men up-country, though it is often necessary to make use of it. Two things should be mentioned. Firstly, when recourse is had to this process in localities where running pipe water cannot be obtained, and this happens more often than not, all that need be done is to plunge the head into some stream or flowing river, taking care to do so on some spot where contamination to the water will not be a source of danger. But in this event, precautions must be taken to prevent the head being damaged by the animal life of the water, such as fish, etc., which may in a single night destroy nearly all the skin, thus causing the loss of all our trouble. A box of convenient size may be pierced on its four sides with four large holes and covered with thick cloth, or better still, the netting of a very fine sieve. The water will then enter and leave freely, and even the smallest animals will be excluded. Secondly, there cannot be, in these days, even in India, many places so isolated that the chloride of zinc cannot cure it during the twelve of or fifteen hours the head is in the water. It can be found at any dispensary or even in the nearest bazaar, and one or other ought to be easily procurable within the requisite time. For forensic purposes, formalin is also very useful. It acts like spirits of wine, but with much stronger effect. It may be used both for preservation and disinfection. It completely removes the smell of a corpse in a very advanced state of decomposition. A preserving solution given by Rensburg is also good if it really does what is stated of it. It is said to be not only antiseptic, but preserves the colour of the remains, and, even after years, remains preserved with it are said to be quite fresh. In wounding cases, preservation of pieces of bone is of equal importance. It is even often necessary to preserve bones of people not yet dead, when, for example, splinters of bone generally bones of the head and the tubular bones, have been abstracted either by operation or in the course of healing. The medical jurisprudent must always attend to the preservation of such pieces of bone as they may sooner or later form material for conviction. When the wound has caused death, it is especially necessary to preserve such pieces of bone, and in most cases the wound is to the skull. The damaged skull itself should be most carefully preserved. Wounds will be much better seen upon a prepared and macerated head than upon one still covered with bloody skin and scrapes of flesh which render observation extremely difficult. If the head be neat and clean, it may be taken in the hand as often as necessary. Accurate and minute measurements can be taken, and even experiments may be made with the view of determining the instrument employed. Moreover, if new information be obtained, the skull may always be re-examined to more advantage than when the inquest took place. Finally, the damaged skull may play an important role at the trial itself, and may be the means of proving the innocence or guilt of the accused. Two remarks should be made. In university cities, it is the business of the laboratory attendant to look after the maceration and preparation of the bones, which may be seen heaped pell-mell in the water troughs and upon the drying shelves. The assistant is even allowed to prepare what may be, from a legal point of view, an important skull. But the investigating officer should on no condition tolerate this, for small splinters of bone may be lost, new wounds made, or bones mixed up, or even the whole corpus delicti itself may be lost. It is the investigating officer and the official expert who are responsible for the identity and integrity of the corpus delicti. The laboratory assistant is in no way responsible. The corpus delicti loses all its authentic character and demonstrative value if it leaves the hands of the investigating officer or the expert. The investigating officer ought therefore to insist upon the manipulation of a skull being made either by the expert himself, or, if by one of his servants, then under his direct supervision, and such work should never be executed contemporaneously with any other work. 
Secondly, as regards the manner in which skulls should be mended, it is very instructive to gather and carefully put together all the parts of a skull in fragments. On the one hand, one acquires the conviction that no piece is missing. On the other, one may observe how, in what direction, or with what instrument, etc., the wound was given. The author remembers the effect produced on one occasion upon the jury by a medical jurisprudent in showing them a skull which seemed quite intact. He had carefully gummed cigarette papers over it. Then, with a slight pressure of the hand, he broke it into a thousand pieces, just as it had been smashed by the blow it had received. That is the way a wounded skull should be put together for demonstration to the jury. It is an incorrect process to join the pieces solidly. The author once saw a skull which had been broken into a quantity of little pieces by the head of a hatchet, and carefully struck together by the laboratory assistant with the best fish glue. Neither the fractures themselves nor the direction of the sutures could longer be seen. And the worst of it was that it was impossible to remedy the mistake, for the glue refused to melt even when steeped for a long time in water. As has been stated, splinters of bone ought to be put back in their place and held together on the inside with very fine gummed paper. Professor His gives a method of reconstructing faces which, if proved to be good, must be very important. Working with the skull of Johann Sebastian Bach, he averaged the thickness of the flesh on the human face and covered the skull with a coating of plaster of Paris of that thickness, and is stated to have produced a face quite like that in the portrait of the composer. The importance of this lies in the possibility of thus identifying a murdered person. But as the thickness of the flesh on the head varies, it is doubtful whether it would succeed in all cases. If the age and sex of the person are known, these may be taken into account, and success is possible if there be a suspicion of whom the skull belongs to, for then on reconstruction someone may see a likeness. But a person who knows the suspected victim should not perform the operation, as he might unintentionally force the features of that person into the face he was constructing. Certain hints regarding age and sex may nearly always be found from an anatomical examination of the skull. In conclusion, we must point out the danger of attempting to identify solely by means of clothes, dress, and papers found on a corpse. There are many known cases in which such articles have been employed purposely to mislead the investigating officer. It is always good to hand over a head to a medical man for preservation in formalin, formic aldehyde solution, or spirits of wine, etc. That it is important to be careful in identifying corpses is proved by many mistakes which have been made, even by wives of their husbands, etc. In cases of corpses swollen out by drowning, the corpse of a thin old man has often been taken for that of a stout young man. See also Section 3C, Hair. Section C, Tattooing. Tattooings which exist or which have existed on the bodies of living or dead persons may be very important in determining identity. They must therefore be examined and described in detail. Let it also be stated that attention must be paid to tattooings which are no longer visible. There is no doubt that they may disappear from view. They fade away either through a lapse of time or, if the work has been badly done or unstable colours have been used, even after a short time. They may also be made to disappear artificially by submitting them to the corrosive action of an acid, especially indigo extract, indigotin disulfonic acid, parum de Châtel. Dr. Variot mentions a device whereby nothing but a scar is left, the application of a paste containing salicylic acid and glycerine for about a week's time will make the tattoo mark disappear. Another method has lately been suggested as the best. A strong solution of tannin is put on the tattoo mark, which is then treated with a needle in the same way as in tattooing, and finally a strong solution of nitrate of silver is used. Tardieu also tried the following. Acetic acid and fat, then potash, hydrochloric acid, and finally solution of potash. But the result of all these methods must always be that a scar, however slightly visible, will be left. If for some reason or other one suspects that tattooing now invisible has existed upon the body of a living man, the medical jurisprudent should be asked 
to carefully examine the place where, thanks to some indication or other, we may hope to find it, or failing such, hint, the places where tattooing is most usually found, forearm, breast, etc. If it has been artificially removed, even the naked eye will discover very noticeable cicatrixes, the form, size, etc. of which are easily described. In regard to the time which tattooing takes to disappear, Kaspar Liman says that even on old invalids he found the marks clearly to be noticed after forty or even fifty years. Amongst thirty-six tattooed persons he found two with the marks faded, two half, and four completely disappeared. A similar comparison is given by Hutin, who found among three thousand invalids more than the sixth part, five hundred and six, tattooed. Tardieu found even more striking numbers. As the people he examined mostly had used chalk, ninety-six percent of the tattooed marked had not vanished. The materials employed will disappear in the following order. Cinnabar, gunpowder, washing blue, ink. Chalk mixed with lamp black will keep longest. About the age of the tattoo mark in general, not much can be said. The scar after the operation is soon healed and does not change much for a long time. More or less strength in the colouring does not prove anything. A fresh tattoo with little pigment and an old tattoo with much pigment look nearly alike, but when the tattooing has been performed can rarely be laid down afterwards. Only in a few cases can one judge this, i.e. if a child has been tattooed on the back, the design will lose its form as the child grows up. The same will happen with a circle tattooed on the arm of a strong young man as he becomes old. The mark of the inoculation will often move far away from its original place as years go on. Lately, a young American girl was shown in many European centres with beautifully tattooed designs over the whole body. These were certainly genuine and interesting, but it was false to state, as was done to the audience, that her father did them when the lady was a child, as the designs would have lost their correct forms and become irregular and distorted if they had grown with her. In some cases this circumstance might be important, if the age of the tattoo mark is desired to be ascertained. If the tattooing has disappeared naturally, the medical man will in most cases be able to discover, with a strong magnifying glass, the cicatrices in the form of pricks or marks of a needle or stitches. In many cases these cicatrices are so well preserved that it is easy to reconstitute the whole design. This reconstitution is rendered easier if the part of the skin in question be vigorously rubbed with some colouring matter such as ink, lamp black or oil, etc. The colouring matter will adhere better to the secretist places, which, becoming blacker than the other parts of the skin, causes the tattooing to show up distinctly. Improving the existence of tattooing upon a corpse, the same method is followed. We have even a further important proof in cases where it has disappeared long before. As Follin, Markel, Virchow, and others point out, the small colouring particles penetrate as far as the lymphatic glands nearest to them, where they remain and go no further. They lodge for preference in the periphery of the gland, and on enlargement may be observed as much in the whole gland as in certain sections of it. They can, naturally, be better seen through the microscope, but the cinnabar so often employed as colouring matter looks reddish when rays of light fall upon the gland, and has a black aspect when they traverse it. See Hoffman. The examination of the gland should in such cases be always made by a medical man. It must also be remarked that tattooings upon wet corpses and upon mummified and dried-up corpses are not easily recognisable. In the first case the parts of the skin in question must be taken off and dried, and in the second they must be soaked in water. Let us now call attention to the general importance of tattooing. It is not necessary to go as far as a number of specialists, such as Marot, Macassagne, Batu, Salila, Drago, Ellis, Greaves, Berg, etc., who, following the example set by Lombroso in 1874, considered tattooing the characteristic sign of habitual criminals. Be that as it may, tattooing is very important. Curella has clearly demonstrated this in finding tattoo marks upon fourteen percent of his subjects. It may be laid down as a general proposition 
that tattooing is almost exclusively met with among people of an energetic disposition, a disposition already revealed in the career such people have chosen. Tattooing will generally be seen upon soldiers, sailors, butchers, fishermen, woodcutters, smiths, etc., rarely on tailors, weavers, or waiters. Not only can energetic people better support the pain caused by tattooing, but their character leads them to the display of something uncommon and difficult of acquisition. In this connection, sexual sensuality plays an important role, why it is difficult to say. But the motive seems to be that strong and sensual natures find pleasure in placing their bodies on view. They admire their own persons, and love others to admire them also. It is for this reason that among persons of the feminine sex, tattooing is in Europe generally only found among prostitutes, though it should be noticed that women of the cultivating classes are also frequently tattooed. In Bosnia, for instance, a girl or woman of the Catholic peasant class is seldom to be found without it. It mostly consists of a more or less decorated cross on the forehead, the chest, or the upper part of the arm. A curious circumstance is mentioned by Mashka. He examined all prisoners before and after the period of detention, and found that most of them were not tattooed before, but only after leaving the prison. This shows that the chief reason is the tediousness of the incarceration. Also Gunther asked twenty-four tattooed persons for the reason of undergoing this operation, and the reply in nearly all cases was tediousness, or imitation. If we add to what we have stated that this rude body toilet is found chiefly among common people, Lombroso says among people of Celtic origin, we shall have collected all that concerns tattooing among criminals. We will be able to conclude that we only meet with tattooing among people of energy, such as murderers, hooligans, housebreakers, etc., and on the other hand among people of a sensual nature, such as bullies, sodomites, ravishers, and others who commit crimes against morality, but not among cheats and thieves. It should further be noted that the simple and honest man is content with certain characteristic figures. The sailor carries an anchor or dates and initials, soldiers swords or rifles, the butcher crossed axes, etc., and the tattooing is generally placed on the inner aspect of the right forearm. A grosser and less honest nature is not content with that. It adorns itself with allusions to its crime or signs of vengeance, accompanied with resigned or frivolous indications of its probable end, for example, le bagne matin or a gallows, etc. If the person is by nature of obscene imagination, it is revealed by the character of the design, or by the place in which he is tattooed, the sexual parts, or the buttocks. Now, it is very natural that among people of gross and energetic natures, and doubtful morals, many criminals exist. If, therefore, many criminals are tattooed, it is that the same reason, natural grossness and immorality, has produced two effects, tattooing and crime. In this lies the whole correlation existing between tattooing and a criminal, but it is none the less indifferent to us, and every tattooing upon a prisoner ought always to excite our interest. That not only criminals and those of criminal instincts tattoo themselves is shown by the fact that today among the young English nobility tattooing is the height of fashion. This is not done in the usual way with hot needles, but by professional artists, with the help of electrical apparatus, the galvanometer system. The age of the custom is shown by the fact that B. Karl Blind seeks to prove that the old Germans paid homage to this custom, and it was a sign of the nobility. In 787, a law was passed in Northumberland against this heathenish custom. See also Tractatus de Superstitionibus by Magister Nicol. 1405, in which he claims against this custom of pricking as a superstitious and forbidden practice. End of section 26。section 27 of Criminal Investigation, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, September 2015. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him, Continued. Section D. Mental Affections. A question, the value of which is not sufficiently appreciated, is to know in what cases the investigating officer is morally obliged to submit an accused person or an important witness to medical examination or observation. It goes without saying that a furious madman, idiot, or person of undoubted melancholic character should be placed in the hands of the medical expert. This, indeed, has been done for centuries. But the progress of mental and legal science demands nowadays that attention also be paid to mental maladies which an outsider is incapable of recognizing. Care must be taken that people who are really ill be not punished for acts committed in an access of madness. It is only by the most minute attention and the most conscientious strictness that we are able to avoid those terrible errors formerly committed when numbers of weak-minded persons were punished on the ground of their perversity or monstrous infamy. Such cases are as difficult to deal with as they are sad to think of, and everything considered, the mental condition of every accused person and every important witness who makes a statement must be examined. Reasons of convenience and the exigencies of time and money alone prevent us from making the obligation to have medical examinations in every case a statutory one, but if it is impossible for this to be done, science, conscience, and humanity order us to act with generosity when the least doubt of the responsibility of an accused person for his acts arises. To study our man carefully when his mental condition appears suspicious, and not to refuse to allow his re-examination by doctors even when they have already declared perfectly sane a man whom we believe to be somewhat wanting. When a jurist makes a mistake upon a medical question, and it is not impossible for him to do so, and he has interrogated a lunacy doctor without obtaining any result, his conduct can only do honor to his conscientious scruples every medical man will tell him that it is far from easy even for a specialist to decide whether an individual is sane or not every honest man will be of opinion that it is better to examine from the point of view of their responsibility many sane people than punish a single person who is rendered irresponsible by mental illness Looking into the matter more closely, we find that here again the investigating officer ought to be something of an expert and consider and observe to a very considerable extent. He ought at least to be sufficiently informed to know, without committing absurd blunders, when a medical man ought to be consulted. It will therefore be for him to come to a certain preliminary decision which will set the case going. If the investigating officer calls in medical men, the responsibility is on them. But if he thinks right not to interrogate them, no one else is likely to do so, for him and the investigating officer alone incurs the whole responsibility. But the investigating officer who desires to act conscientiously and spare himself severe remorse in after life will be tempted to order too many medical examinations rather than too few, and in order to limit himself and not demand superfluous examinations, he will find himself obliged to acquire a certain amount of expert knowledge on his own account. This, it must be confessed, is no easy thing. But speaking generally, the functions of an investigating officer are not easy, and the difficulty of his profession consists precisely in the obligation to acquire, as he goes on, a mass of knowledge of which he is completely ignorant at the outset. The ways of procuring the information the investigating officer requires in this connection are numerous. Above all, he should study quite a number of treatises on medical psychopathology. The subject seems a perplexing one at the outset, but after a while the difficulties begin to vanish, especially if one has the good fortune to fall in with an expert who is willing to point out the most useful books and assist in smoothing over the worst obstacles. But the knowledge so acquired would be a dead letter if one were to stop there. 
the investigating officer who takes his profession seriously should attend a course on mental diseases at some medical college it is only by seeing and studying the demonstration and explanation of different cases in relation to every subject that he will become capable of making use in practice of what he has imbibed from books only then will he really be able to understand the phenomenon described even the best books are incapable of giving the reader an exact idea of what the author means when he uses phrases to express varying degrees of intensity with regard to any particular phenomenon. Such phrases as a wild look, incoherent speech, slow thinking, and other similar expressions convey to a person who has no acquaintance with such peculiarities either too much or too little. He takes the troubled look of a sane person, which is of no consequence, for a wild look, worthy of mistrust, or else he imagines the expression to imply a horrible rolling of the eyes, etc., while the real wild look, the psychopathological look, seems perfectly normal to him. The truth in such a case can only be pointed out by a lunacy doctor and with living subjects. Books alone are insufficient. The most instructive case for the investigating officer are those which he has had to elucidate himself. In such cases he is able to see the manner in which the doctor examines the patient, he can gather information upon the mass of things, and finally he considers the report the expert has drawn up. If he scans only the last lines of this carefully composed certificate for the sole purpose of finding the word mad or the words not mad, the reading of the report, or for that matter, of a thousand reports, will teach him absolutely nothing. But how easy it is for him to learn something! The report treats of the case which he has managed from the start. He had to deal with the patient when he believed him to be sound. He remembers how the first traces of suspicion came into his mind. He knows what he himself thought of the case in general, and all the symptoms in particular, and now he has the expert's detailed report in his hands. In it he sees described and scientifically explained the observations he has made as an outsider, and is thus enabled to correct his opinion. If certain details still remain obscure and doubtful, it is possible for him to procure enlightenment and information from the expert, and his own judicial experience will at least show him how he ought to go on with the case. He must be able to say afterwards that he has minutely observed the patient, carefully studied the report, asked the expert for explanations, and read certain cases in point in special books. As a basis for such studies, the work of Professor Kraft Ebbing, Fundamental Principles of Criminal Psychology for the Use of Lawyers, cannot be sufficiently recommended. Every investigating officer should have this book by heart before entering upon functions so full of responsibility as his are. Well-known specialists have essayed to facilitate the investigating officer in dealing with the cases where he ought to consult a medical jurisprudent, to this end, they have enumerated the distinctive characteristics of mental derangement, characteristics easy of observation and capable of making even a person who is not a specialist in mental diseases suspect a mental affection. According to Caspar Lyman, the medical man should always be consulted in cases in which the following characteristics appear. 1. Hereditary dispositions, where it is known that the parents or family or relations of the family, including children, of the individual are or have been attacked with mind troubles. 2. Wounds affecting the brain, wounds on the head, severe illness accompanied with brain complications, such as peripheral fever, brain fever from overstudy, etc. 3. Nervous diseases, epilepsy, hypochondria, hysteria, etc. 4. Alcoholism. 5. Various maladies of the body, headache, insomnia, giddiness, cramp, paralysis, delirium, tremens, etc. 6. Hallucinations. 7. Visions. 8. Enfeebled intelligence. 9. Periodical return of certain phenomena. 10. Peculiar bearing. 11. Extraordinary manner of writing. 
Professor Kraft Ebbing mentions several points which might lead us to consider a man sane when he is really not so. 1. A madman's acts may have a motive just as well as that of a perfectly sane man. 2. The fact that the action is an isolated one in the life of its author can only allow of practical conclusions in an abstract way. 3. Premeditation, cunning, and prudent calculation are not incompatible with insanity. 4. Nor are consciousness of guilt and responsibility for it. 5. Nor even repentance after the act. 6. The insane person may speak perfectly rationally. 7. Even in madness there is method and logic. Besides this, he gathers together important particulars of which notice must be taken in considering mental affections, such as the antecedents, the report of the crime, the complaint, drunkenness, knowledge of the act, the manner of its commission and accessory circumstances not in direct conformity with the object of the action, e.g. a particular exhibition of cruelty, useless acts of destruction, etc., Moreover, the alleged crime must be particularly examined objectively when it is a case of spontaneous confession made by a man of melancholic and reserved temperament, for such confessions may themselves be false. There is room to suppose that a person is mentally diseased when he commits, with no apparent motive, crimes against his parents and those dear to him, or friends, or public officials, etc., also when he tries to make out that his act is much worse than it really is, or seems apathetic in the face of the most moving events. Or again, when he is extraordinarily excited or violent, loquacious or taciturn, or when he absolutely refuses to hear the action itself spoken about. In such cases, it must be remembered that an individual struck with temporary madness may have lucid intervals when his words are perfectly rational. Other suspicious phenomena are a radical and inexplicable change in the manner of living and character of a person, accompanied with indifference for relations formerly of great importance, i.e., business and family relations, irritability, sudden taking to drink, vagabondage, sexual excesses, feebleness of memory, rapid cerebral fatigue, denunciation of morality, negligence in bearing and person, pugnaciousness, destructiveness, irritation, jealousy, complaints of slanders, uttering threats, even before the court, complaints of bodily illness and pain, especially of nervous varieties, anxiety, apprehensiveness, headache, insomnia, fear of becoming mad, imaginary troubles, melancholy or excessive good spirits, being tired of life, attempts at suicide, complaints of being troubled with peculiar thoughts, exaggerated religiousness, formerly foreign to the character, apprehension of something terrible happening with vague indications as to the misfortune, menacing warnings or threats to friends, attempts to deprive himself of means that offer to commit a crime. Kraft Ebbing also mentions other inquiries to be made where there exists in the family of the accused, e.g., grave brain, nerve, or mental maladies, suicides, chronic drunkards, or peculiarly immoral or criminal manner of living, again, where the age of the accused disposes him to commit such and such an action, e.g., certain crimes against morality at the beginning of old age, or false accusations of imaginary crimes at the age of the development of puberty, or where, at the period of menstruation, a woman generally acts in some abnormal way, and the crime has been committed during such a period. There are women who do things at the period of menstruation which would never enter their minds at any other time. The author would especially call attention to the peculiar manner of writing spoken of by Caspar Lyman, see above. This manner of writing is peculiar to mad persons and of great importance to the investigating officer who has more occasion to observe it than the lunacy doctor and to whom it is easier to discover an anomaly in handwriting than in the expression on a face. 
the investigating officer has occasion to read so many things written by sane persons that he acquires great experience by doing so and can notice better than other people anything out of the ordinary in handwriting moreover the investigating officer can hardly dispense with paying attention to suspected writing if he wished to avoid disagreeable situations certain people afflicted with mental troubles are very fond of writing especially when misanthropic they are prone to substitute letters or petitions for personal relations moreover people suffering from the monomania of persecution are particularly fond of appearing before the courts believing they are safest there we have all had experience of habitues among this latter class of unfortunate madmen who come from time to time to seek news of their suit legacy fortune etc it sometimes happens that these persons will on no account appear before the court for fear of being shut up deceived or even executed they prefer to make their accusations in writing such accusations of imaginary crimes come before every court and cause most disagreeable confusion when led astray by apparently perfectly reasonable explanations cases are rashly taken up against the parties accused since when an urgent matter comes before an investigating officer a doctor is not always at hand he will be obliged to go on with the inquiry himself it is therefore desirable he should be acquainted with these special ways of writing peculiar to insane persons they may be found in the office of every registrar and a registrar of any experience will immediately recognize them the young investigating officer has but to read them with great care in order to discover their characteristic signs one can hardly define in what the originality and the distinctive features of these documents consist the habit of dealing with them will so to speak reveal their sentiment it is especially to be noted that these petitions are generally of great length and repeat themselves over and over again amplifications and exaggerations are generally to be found and in themselves are certain indications of the falseness of the complaint e g the petitioner says he has had his head split or has been shut up for three months with only a small piece of dry bread each day the construction of the phrases is often involved incomprehensible and stiff often again short and full of little prepositions but it is never natural it is a striking fact that a man afflicted with a mental disease almost always makes use when writing of words of extraordinary formation and inordinate length he is often betrayed by this but all that an insane person may say or write is not always devoid of truth or inaccurate and every accusation even coming from a person notoriously mad is worthy of examination it only too often happens that people profit by the circumstance of an individual's madness to say all the same no one will believe that madman if this be so the unfortunate lunatic is at the mercy of the whole world and exposed to the exploitation teasing and bad treatment of ill-conditioned and ill-minded people especially when they find out that their victims repeated complaints have not been believed it is therefore the duty of the investigating officer to verify the accuracy of all the statements of a lunatic on every occasion he should make sure that there is really no truth in the case even where the evil complained of has been found on previous occasions to be false we remember a case in which a crazy old peasant had made innumerable representations to the authorities in which he declared that his enemy had made before his house or on his way pits traps and similar contrivances by which he would be killed or injured many of these representations were furnished with clear sketches of the asserted pitfalls etc these representations became known to the people of the neighborhood and on one occasion the village boys played a practical joke and really made a pit before his front door and filled it with manure the unfortunate man fell right into it and was nearly drowned we shall now direct attention to several points which the investigating officer should carefully note one it is often necessary to cite lunatics as witnesses they should never be sent away merely on the ground that they are demented for they can sometimes render considerable assistance 
it has been frequently remarked that madmen especially certain varieties of madmen are excellent observers they are not nearly so adverse to telling the truth as many people who rejoice in all their faculties for they do not allow themselves to be guided by considerations of propriety they have also more opportunities for observation for things are done and said in the presence of a lunatic which would not be done or said before others it is self-evident that the statements of a madman must be well weighed before being utilized as evidence in a case two every one knows that delirium causes a man to commit all sorts of actions we often believe we have to do with deliberate acts when they are but the result of an attack of intermittent fever in such a case errors are easily made for the invalid generally conducts himself in quite a normal manner and it is only during the short intervals of an attack that he performs acts for which he cannot be held responsible when therefore the investigating officer learns that the accused suffers from time to time from these attacks he should not neglect to consult a physician three kraft ebbing remarks that very vivid dreams often continue their effect after the sleeper awakes in such cases the incidents in dreams are often taken for realities numerous inaccurate statements are explained in this way perhaps also more than one piece of supposed perjury it is said that such dreams are especially common among epileptics. 4. Not less important are acts committed in the state of somnambulism. See Kraft Ebbing, who indicates special books and the most important cases on the subject. Somnambulists mostly attack the objects nearest at hand, generally people they suddenly meet, and they often develop a strength which bears no comparison to that of their waking state. This phenomenon is especially noticeable among young people in their first sleep and after great intellectual or corporeal efforts. The recollection of these acts is either completely effaced or else preserved in the vaguest possible way. 5. Just as the satisfaction of certain corporeal needs, such as eating, drinking, sleeping, smoking, yawning, is contagious, so certain acts of the insane may arouse imitation among people of perfectly normal condition. Especially noticeable is the contagion of hysteria, epilepsy, and other psychological epidemics at one time so frequent. But the imitation of an isolated action of a lunatic may also take place, especially by young persons who have been for a considerable time in his society. 6. When the accused declares that he has only committed a great crime with the intention of being executed, and under the pretext that he is too cowardly to commit suicide, his declaration must not be brushed aside without further examination. It may have some foundation, especially when we have to deal with people who are melancholic by nature or mentally deficient. All such cases should be referred to the medical expert. The theories regarding moral insanity, fixed ideas, and other species of mania are so important to the investigating officer that it is absolutely necessary for him to familiarize himself with them and study some leading work on the subject, such as Kraft Ebbing's Hints on Recognizing and Appreciating from a Legal Point of View Sickly Conditions of Mind. This kind of brain trouble is so uncommon that it often remains unperceived, and if the investigating officer does not detect it, the medical jurisprudent is not consulted, and as such kinds of affections hardly ever show themselves during the course of the trial, the accused is condemned, though not really responsible for his actions. 8. Nowadays, the theory of reflected acts has assumed some importance. By a reflected act is meant one coming between a pure reflex act, wholly independent of volition, and an act done with full consciousness, and is only realized when reflected upon in the subconsciousness, through habit, analogy, etc. 9. An objective and sure sign of drunkenness and its degrees is given by H. Gooden. It is to be particularly remarked when one has to do with tipplers and genuine habitual drunkards that such people are most untrustworthy. At first sight, one does not know every tippler, but one can judge them from their tearful whimpering and accusations of others. 
when the question of the conjugal fidelity of his wife is ostensibly brought forward and maintained by a man he is almost always a chronic alcoholist ten about the signification of homosexuality one must be today particularly clear and take up a position on the question it should be thoroughly understood whether the same is a disease of the mind a vice or an innate peculiarity one has to put before oneself a long chain of developments which begin with the normal sexual man and extend over the man and woman of light character to the effeminate and the virago and from these to the declared hermaphrodite the unnatural character of the hermaphrodite and the repugnance we feel towards him must lead us to look on him as a being for whom punishment is not the proper treatment eleven upon the much disputed subject of the lessening of the ordinary mental faculties see shrink not seeing and kramer twelve the numerous and for us often weighty signs twilight conditions are well handled by Morshin in treating of the marks of the true and masked epileptic nightly wetting of the bed and the frequent prominent and inexplicable skin bleedings on the neck shoulders and behind the ears stigmata see the experienced fister nearly every epileptic lies is violent and a bigot thirteen masochism sadism and fetishism are treated in textbooks on psychiatry psychopathology etc only a suggestion of their important appearances is given here a masochism appears when the afflicted person allows himself to be ill-treated by his partner in order to be wholly sexually excited or to attain the full enjoyment of the act of generation b sadism conversely is when the afflicted person for the same object ill-treats his partner chokes bites pricks beats etc hereby alone many murders can be explained the man or woman having for once gone too far c fetishism appears when for sexual objects or for sexual stimulus a person purloins such things as plaits of hair cloth bags shoes stockings apron strings etc as a rule this peculiarity goes with secret vice d salaromania is the name given to the desire to soil and spoil clothes of women with ink acid etc one concludes this behavior has a sexual origin a sort of fetishism bound up with sadism end of section twenty seven Section 28 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, September 2015. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The Expert, and How to Make Use of Him, Continued. E. Hypnotism. In the first edition of this book, the author wrote, quote, at the end of this chapter hypnotism must also be mentioned it is a doctrine which has been received by specialists in so many different ways that it is impossible for an outsider to take up any decisive attitude with regard to it this theory of hypnotism partakes of the destiny of all problems which have been treated in a premature and unscientific way by people of doubtful learning and character it is therefore difficult to say whether in giving their so-called opinions they have been influenced by a desire to speak the truth or by other more or less obscure motives thus it has happened that among the most distinguished specialists some have considered hypnotism to be a positive science while others have only asked with regard to it who is the cheat or who the dupe 
but if the medical man can quietly study make experiments and observe it is not so with the jurist if hypnotism and what is claimed for it exist it would seem to be the duty of the investigating officer to attack a subject all the difficulties of which have as yet hardly been foreseen no one indeed knows how we are to approach this task nor how to deal with it in order to obtain a successful result nowadays jurists neither can nor ought to take action in the matter as yet they have not sufficient scientific material at their disposal and it is beyond doubt that the premature adoption of a point of view which has not yet been made clear would cause more harm than the conservative ignorance of a person who holds himself aloof but it is not necessary for us to take up such an extreme position we have only to retain an attitude of observation and expectation to take a great interest in the subject and study it making observations on our own account and calling in the expert on every occasion on which we fall in with a case in which it crops up so as to cover our own responsibility but let us go slowly we recommend investigating officers to become familiar with the work of dr von lilienthal hypnotism and the criminal law in the second edition the author wrote quote, since the first edition was published the question has taken another and more scientific aspect the jurist who casts a glance through the flood of books on the subject can no longer hold aloof as an outsider from the question of hypnotism the works of Delbruck, Forel, Bernheim, Sully, Ribo, Kraft Ebbing, Morel, Desoir, Riger, Ligeus, Muller, Obersteiner, Richet, Schrenk Natzing, Prayer, Mahl, Wetterstrand, Leibold, Bonus, Schmidkens, and in particular the contributors to the Rue de la Hypnotisme and to the Zeitschrift für Hypnotismus of Grossmann have cleared up the question in a scientific manner. The existence of hypnotism can no longer be doubted, and the jurist ought to consider how he must deal with it, since the last edition we have been bitterly approached with not attacking the question. Schmidkens says, Quote, professional lawyers have neglected the importance of suggestion to such an extent that others have been obliged to fill up the gap as soon as possible their negligence consists either in complete indifference or else in violent attacks henceforward let us no longer be reproached in this way but when medical men have given us incontestable and irrefutable material attack the question in so far as it concerns our profession we will at the same time know how to oppose any interference with our special business Farrell has said in a small treatise quote, hypnotism is obliged to traverse like every fresh truth three phases denial struggle and acceptance end quote. but the author is of the opinion that the last phase that of acceptance ought like every other new thing to also pass through three stages namely timid welcome unmeasured exaggeration and correct appreciation it seems that as regards hypnotism we have already arrived at the exaggeration stage of the phase of acceptance Farrell is right when he declares Quote, the adversaries of hypnotism who said yesterday it is all trickery and illusion and who say today this hypnotism is terribly dangerous it must be fought with and annihilated will perhaps say tomorrow but this is old history which we have long been aware of this last observation is very just indeed not taking into account the indians egyptians and other oriental peoples as to whose knowledge of hypnotism we have ample proof we find in history a number of others who have mentioned hypnotism in terms more or less clear Escalapius, boltstadt paracelsus helmote w maxwell a von nettesheim cardenas campanella giordano bruno porta a kircher anton mesmer braid Leibold, and bernheim no less than contemporary men of learning mark the stages of the development of this theory a theory which has today become so important if we desire to obtain an idea of the value of this theory for ourselves 
we must study however superficially the very essence of hypnotism otherwise the investigating officer will be incapable of knowing when he is face to face with a case of hypnotism and must consequently have recourse to an expert we must at the outset agree with max desoir das Dopalich, berlin eighteen eighty nine that human personality divides itself into at least two spheres which are theoretically quite distinct namely the waking state the superior consciousness and the dream state the inferior consciousness the latter state is by no means unknown to us it exists whenever we dream or when in a fit of sleepwalking or distraction we act without knowing what we are doing it is in the sphere of this inferior consciousness that all the acts of a person under the influence of hypnotism are placed and by arranging these phenomena in a category of known facts we attempt to form a clear idea of that state hypnotism has most resemblance to sleep suppose we were to see a person asleep for the first time the phenomenon would appear much more strange than anything seen or heard with regard to hypnotism but we may distinguish sleep from hypnotism by designating the latter as does Farrell, by the phrase state of suggestibility to suggest is to produce a dynamic change in the nervous system of a person under the influence of another person inducing in the subject an idea that this change is taking or has taken place as to auto-suggestion it is the suggestion a man affects upon himself either consciously or unconsciously we can therefore distinguish as determining motives one a supernatural agent magnetism mesmerism telepathy presentiment visions etc two suggestion is formulated since the time of braid eighteen forty three and libelt eighteen sixty four three all somatic corporeal or materialistic theories which presume peripheric influences on the extremities of the nerves fixity of look rubbing of the forehead etc the second theory suggestion alone has any scientific value only one kind of hypnotism is then established by science i e that consists of the suggestion of ideas it would be superfluous to analyze the way in which it takes place in practice whoever feels any disposition for these questions dangerous as they are may find the necessary information in almost any work on hypnotism but it is better to leave such experiments to medical men in the hypnotic state itself three stages may be distinguished one somnolence state in which the subject can still open the eyes two light sleep hypotaxis charm a state in which he partly submits to the influence of suggestion three deep sleep somnambulism with amnesia forgetfulness after waking muller also differentiates between deep sleep with or without post-hypnotic hallucinations i e the subject may after coming to remain under the influence of what has been suggested to him while in the hypnotic state we have also to distinguish Bernheim, Ligeus, Obersteiner, etc. A. Mental suggestion. Here the thoughts of one person act upon other persons. Perronet relates how he ordered a person to play the piano until it was suggested to him to stop. He placed himself behind the pianist while he was playing and began to wish energetically that he would stop playing. And at that very moment, he stopped b retroactive hallucination by which a person is persuaded that certain facts have happened the person believes these facts though they have never taken place c negative hallucination by which it is suggested to a person that certain objects present have disappeared e g that a person present has gone away the subject no longer sees the person though he is still there if it be asked up to what point people can be hypnotized we learn from forel that a man with a healthy mind may be hypnotized when there is no autosuggestion not to be hypnotized i e where the patient does not battle against the hypnotizer according to obersteiner one person in every three is absolutely proof against hypnotism one in three is moderately affected and one in three is perfectly hypnotizable Leibolt and Bernheim have hypnotized thousands of persons, very few of whom have opposed any resistance. 
Wetterstrand has found 97 refractory persons out of 3,148. Renturgen and Eiden found 395 out of 414 susceptible to hypnotism. Speaking generally, it may be said that from 80 to 95 percent of men may be hypnotized. People having mental illnesses are not included in this figure. They are hardly ever hypnotizable. The effects of hypnotism have been established scientifically. Forel says, By suggestion in hypnotism one may produce, influence, and impede all the subjective phenomena known to the human mind, as well as a large number of the objective functions known to the nervous system. Only the functions of the ganglions and the reflexive movements of the spine, as well as those of the base of the skull, seem to escape the influence of suggestion. Suggestion may even act upon the so-called somatic functions, such as digestion, perspiration, and menstruation. It may even, in very rare cases, produce bloody stigmata. The post-hypnotic effect, i.e., ulterior obedience to orders given during the hypnotic state, does not occur with all persons. It may last minutes or days, and Lygius even mentions a case where suggestion was effective at the end of a year. The hypnotized, says Mueller, may be in the most abject state of submission to the hypnotizer. From the point of view of phenomena of the mind and the nervous movements, he may be in a condition of absolute dependence. In the hypnotic state, it may be suggested to people that they are ignorant of certain languages, Pharrell, that they are animals, that they are of another sex or age to what they really are, Kraft Ebbing. The senses and memory may be sharpened, Obersteiner. The subject may recognize the owner of an article by the smell of it. The servant of a clergyman was able to recite Latin and Hebrew passages, which she was unable to do in a waking state. An old lady transformed herself in turn into a peasant, a general, a little child, a young man, Richet. If it is suggested to a hypnotized person that certain acts be done within a certain time, the suggestion is coercive in character. It must be done as suggested, but always with the idea that another has constrained the subject so to act, and the latter is generally aware that he has been so constrained by the person who has hypnotized him. But again, if it is suggested that what he does is of his own accord, he believes so. If all this be true, the whole question is a very serious one. As regards the handwriting of a person while in the hypnotic state, we find that such writing hardly differs from the subject's writing in the waking state. Ames discusses this at some length. He tells of an experiment tried in the following circumstances. A trial was made upon a young man, Mr. Guy Appelt Mason, who had never been hypnotized. He was put under hypnotic influence and was requested to write two specimens of his handwriting. After being awakened, he wrote a specimen in his normal state. He said that he had not written the hypnotized specimens, at least he did not remember anything about it. A comparison of the two specimens showed that about the only difference was the size. Mr. Mason, while in the hypnotic state, had been told that he had the toothache, etc., and consequently was more or less agitated when he sat down to write. While there were a few slight differences in some letters and in the pictorial effect, on the whole, the two specimens were wonderfully alike, and are most convincing that hypnotism, and no doubt other forms of double consciousness, cannot destroy the characteristics in handwriting. A curious feature in both specimens was the same misspelling of a word. We are thus driven to ask what importance the question of hypnotism has from the criminal point of view. Either, says Rigor, the whole question is of no importance in criminal law, having existed and having been known for long, but meriting no attention from the standpoint, or it has become important solely by reason of great discoveries made since the drawing up of our present criminal codes. If we combine these two opposing phrases, we may perhaps discover the truth. The thing has existed for long, has had its influence, but its criminal importance has not been appreciated at its true value and is only now becoming recognized by us. The effects of hypnotism were formerly well known, but not as such. Delbruck, indeed, shows that they have been utilized in poetry. 
gottfried keller in his book la verte henri relates the history of a child of seven years old who disgracefully slandered several boys older than himself by a quite imaginary story suggested to him to understand the complications we meet in connection with hypnotism we have but to consider some results obtained by specialists in that science if for instance operations and accoutrements may be painlessly performed in these days under the influence of hypnotism we may also be allowed to presume that common and immoral assaults may be performed upon hypnotized persons thus a man is said to have been castrated during an hypnotic sleep lygias made a lady confess before an audience to debts to the extent of six thousand francs he suggested to her that he had lent her that sum some time before at the congress of jurists at zurich a hypnotized boy swore that one of the gentlemen present had stolen his handkerchief and after a new suggestion he swore he had never made such an accusation leibold and bernheim state that more than one case of illness and even cases of death must be put down to suggestion and they recall the ordeals and judgments of god of the middle ages the thing seems almost unbelievable but really it is not so doctors and especially military doctors have often observed that the will of a man may in certain circumstances prolong life people dangerously ill live until the happening of such and such an event e g the arrival of an expected relative soldiers gravely wounded on the field of battle live until the moment when someone finds them thanks to the energy of their will in the russian and austrian wars it was several times noticed that soldiers of slav origin whose character is weak and resigned often succumbed to wounds which were not really mortal while the energetic character and love of life of the germans enabled them in spite of grievous wounds to struggle with death until the moment when help arrived but if the influence of the will upon life and death is so great even in a normal state it must be admitted that this influence may be increased in certain circumstances by the will of another in the same way that is to say by suggestion and especially auto-suggestion certain presentiments of death are explained the effect of suggestion on daily life cannot be presumed to be the culminating point that may be attained by hypnotism that goal will be reached when hypnotism is able to bring about certain purely somatic phenomena these phenomena are not only very remarkable but from a criminal standpoint may be full of the most surprising consequences if e g it is possible as stated above to retard or advance menstruation it is natural to suppose that abortions may take place by suggestion and in consequence by hypnotism it is even stated that blisters may be made to appear on the body of a hypnotized person by telling him that a strong plaster has been put on him where in reality it is only a piece of wet paper the same phenomenon is produced by touching a person with a cold object and suggesting that it is burning if all this is true we should not be astonished if the simple contact of a finger and the affirmation that there are psychotrices there produce bloody stigmata in this connection another question naturally arises is it not possible to bring about in like manner all kinds of ecchymosis traces of strangulation etc which may have the gravest consequences in another sense is there not room for fear that in certain circumstances all sorts of abuses are committed on persons susceptible to hypnotism Liegios, on this account, advises people not to stare for long at one point when alone with a stranger, for in this case the danger of being hypnotized would be very great. It is related that one of the Baroness's Rothschild was thus hypnotized and robbed in a railway carriage. Farrell even goes so far as to advise persons who are easily hypnotized to be hypnotized by a medical man in whom they have complete confidence, and who would suggest to them that no one else is able to hypnotize them but he himself. Here, indeed, is prophylactic vaccination. Many professors of hypnotism fear that investigating officers may suggest false depositions or false confessions to a witness or accused person by bending their recollections by unconscious suggestion or retroactive hallucination. It is certain that this happens. The explanation is quite natural, since by persuading oneself and others one is liable to commit very grave mistakes without its being possible to say that there is willful suggestion. 
in all cases it is possible to control the accuracy of a witness statements by exercising an excess of complacency one has only to question him in the same manner as before upon facts which one knows have not happened if the individual in question still replies in the affirmative it is very probable that all he has stated before is also untrue as to acts done by the hypnotized person after hypnotism post-hypnotic action they do not appear to be very dangerous the hypnotized person when asked to do so while under the influence of hypnotism will drink a glass of water bow to a person etc but he will show repugnance and embarrassment when he is told to overturn a chair throw ink about or do other absurd things but if he is asked to do something serious e g to throw someone out of the window or give a blow or to seize a person by the body he will not do it for as the absurdity of the demand increases so also the resistance of his own will grows for that will must triumph over the foreign will which has suggested these things in proportion to the absurdity of the exactions of the foreign will in relation to this another question arises to what extent are the statements of the hypnotized person to be believed we cannot trust them very far fowl has recently said in a private letter that it must not be forgotten that when all is said and done it is always the same cerebral substance which is dictating the statements in the waking as well as in the hypnotized condition so that the force of will not to speak the truth can only be paralyzed to a certain extent if one wishes therefore to undertake experiments which in themselves are not allowable i e to try to find out the truthfulness of the hypnotized witness or accused persons the results obtained will be little worthy of reliance opinion is divided upon the question whether justice can profit by hypnotism and if so what the profit will be it will be interesting to study what men such as duprel legis frank c Mueller, van deventer schmidtkunz and l drucker etc have said on this subject if we sum up all the cases imaginable in which the criminal expert has to deal with hypnotism we can say one it may affect the property or moral character of the person hypnotized two every kind of extortion may be committed with its assistance three it may suggest crimes to be committed four it may suggest illnesses etc five the courage necessary for the performance of a crime may be suggested with its help six persons who have committed no crime may be unjustly accused by a person under its influence seven on the other hand a person who has knowingly committed a crime may plead suggestion by another eight traces of wounds and strangulations may be produced by suggestion and subsequently serve as proofs nine abortion may be brought about by suggestion ten all kinds of illnesses especially of the nerves and convulsions may be the consequence of illicit or awkward hypnotizing eleven involuntary suggestion may be practiced by the investigating officer himself or other persons to be questioned we may say generally speaking that the dangers of hypnotism are not so very great and are better known than formerly thanks to new theories which have carried us a considerable way forward difficulties always become less as we learn to know them better all the investigating officer need keep well in mind is that he should call in an expert on every occasion when he discovers the least trace of hypnotism if we compare what has been said at the criminal anthropological congress in brussels for example by benedict voisin barillon croc Hous, la dame maison moté mendel upon criminal suggestion with the modern conception thereof we find a remarkable coolness or indifference in the value attached to it we cannot be far wrong in ascribing this healthy change chiefly to the great lawsuits of modern times in which suggestion played an important part and in which the first masters took trouble to make the problem clear it was thus with the process against anderson gray cowley county kansas then the much talked about fascination trial and again the extremely learned proceedings against the murderer birchthold in munich in all these processes one had the living material the visible effect before one 
one felt the gravity and the significance of the question and so exerted oneself to make the thing clear and exclude all extraneous matter one went on to describe the quote, fascinierin, end quote, fascination already in eighteen fifty five called by brad monoidocerin of suggestion and to give the public clear statements about it that for example put forward by professor hurt of breslau in the zinsky case was perhaps the clearest on the subject he said quote, one can compare the superficial part of the brain where according to the observations of today the memory feelings and sensations play so far as concerns a conscious normal thoughtful person with a sheet of paper which is ornamented with thousands of letters these letters are the thoughts when i by some means or other as for example was done by the accused with baroness z by sharp looks and strokes with the hand before the face put the victim into a sleeping condition then the letters fade more and more as the individual gets tired and are finally imperceptible in deep hypnotism indeed altogether wiped out when i then suggest something to the patient i write new characters and signs on the piece of paper which the sleeper hears reads and without criticism believes to be true that is to say takes for his own thoughts the clearer the writing of the suggester the more impressive the suggestions that follow and on waking they cleave to the consciousness of the hypnotized subject he takes them home with him and works with them the more frequently the suggestions are repeated and the deeper the hypnotic sleep is so much the clearer and lasting are the characters which belong to it and so much the more likely to influence the actions of the person sent to sleep post-hypnotic suggestion End quote. equally weighty and important were the different opinions given by dr freiherr von schrenk notzing and professor grashi in the birchhold trial in which mainly the question of suggestion of the witnesses as well as the further question of how far in that particular case the province of the expert extended led to the final solution again the question of the working of post-hypnotism is not nearly so interesting as it once appeared to be as the strength and length of the effect are shown to be very insignificant this is best illustrated by the case related by ernest naville in which dr leibolt suggested to an idle stubborn child the desire to work this lasted however only a short time the child became once more idle and attempts at the same suggestion did not succeed this case is well established without doubt we shall continue to study the question with the greatest care and call to our help the expert when a case of hypnotism comes before us but the complicated importance which the matter was formerly believed to possess no longer exists f color blindness color blindness is more widespread and more important than is generally believed since 1777 when joseph hudart first mentioned this peculiarity when writing to joseph priestley and john dalton dealt with the subject more deeply in 1794 color blindness has been the object of most extensive study and investigation the number of persons who ought to be considered victims of color blindness to a greater or less degree cannot be established the percentage given in the respective works of Wilson, Seebeck, Young, Helmholtz, Maxwell, Favre, Ferris, Stilling, Blaschko, Holmgren, and others varies from 3.25% to 8%. We may assume the average to be 5%, thus making one man in every 20 to some extent colorblind. It should be added that color blindness is much more frequent among men than women, and its most usual form is a confusion of red with green or yellow. Frithjof Holmgren draws the following distinctions. 1. Total color blindness, i.e., the individual in question can only distinguish that a color is dark or light. He can only see, e.g., red on red or gray on gray we cannot say how he really sees the color for we are unable to discuss it with him owing to our having no corresponding notion of it ourselves two partial color blindness a typical i e the individual cannot distinguish certain determinate colors as a rule he cannot see a red b green c violet b incomplete i.e., he distinguishes with some hesitation either all or only certain colors. 
the importance of color blindness arises in many contingencies in the first place it is rarely admitted by those who are victims of it most men are unaware that they are thus afflicted and when they do know they hate to confess it as though they were guilty of some crime it is beyond doubt that it may be very important to an investigating officer it is especially dangerous in all cases where color signals are in question for it may bring about grave accidents on railways ships or in mines it must be taken into account when there is a question of the color of e g a garment in identifying persons the man in the green coat or when looking for traces of blood a colorblind man can see blood only on a green background as for instance on the grass or on green or yellow clothes and that with difficulty if therefore an investigating officer has the slightest suspicion that he has to deal with such a person and if the designation of the real color is of importance he will hand over the witness to a medical expert g the teeth the very important help which can be given by the experienced dentist is far too little appreciated. He should always be consulted when any traces caused by teeth are discovered, e.g., wounds caused by biting, forgotten or discarded smoking materials, cigar ends, pipes, cigar or cigarette holders, etc., marks on pens or pencils, etc. In questions of identity, dentists in cities can frequently help by making sketches of teeth they have operated upon. When one considers the assistance a dentist can give, we cannot help thinking that he is called in far too seldom. Some time ago, a banker was murdered in St. Petersburg, and near him was found a cigar holder with an amber mouthpiece. The holder was so shaped that it could only be held in one position in the mouth, and a close examination showed that it had two marks, which must have been made by two teeth of unequal length. The banker had no such irregular teeth, but his nephew had, and, their suspicions aroused by this simple but important discovery, the authorities soon learned enough to warrant them in arresting him on the charge of murder. End of section 28Section 29 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in June 2015. Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers and Lawyers, Volume 1 by Hans Gross, translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter 3. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him, Continued. Section 3. The Microscopist. However perfect the construction of the microscope may be, however great the services rendered by this admirable instrument, it is not yet much employed by the investigating officer to examine blood, establish the existence of sperms, to compare hair, is about all the good, at present, the microscope observer is to the investigating officer. Other examinations are the exception, although there are innumerable cases where the microscope expert might be able to give the most interesting information and even clear up more than one dark mystery and the explanation of this is that the investigating officer does not know what the observer at the microscope is capable of telling him and that the latter is unaware that the investigating officer requires his help or in what way he requires it the result is that they remain strangers to one another where they should in many a case walk hand in hand together this ignorance of one another goes so far that in the numerous works upon microscopes and their employment, all the services they are capable of rendering are mentioned, with the exception of those they are capable of in the domain of criminal law. If we consider the benefits we owe to the microscopist in the domain of hygiene, we are almost forced to say that the microscope alone has rendered this science practicable bacteriology, examination of water, air, soil or food, 
the determining of the nature of a large number of illnesses and many other important branches of the science of hygiene would have absolutely no existence unless it were for the microscope and the reason is simply that the hygienist knew the services the microscope was able to render him he asked for those services and received them just as the investigating officer would have obtained them if he had thought of questioning the microscope expert if these two persons come into contact so rarely it is the fault of the investigating officer and not of the other for the observer at the microscope is in no way obliged to ask the investigating officer what he wants besides he cannot even know in spite of the best will in the world when his existence will be of utility for the domain of the criminal law is too much out of his line and he does not know the difficulties and requirements of the investigating officer to remedy this difficulty nothing can be done but to collect in practice as many cases as possible in which the investigating officer has invoked the help of the observer at the microscope and with success only when a large number of such examples have been collected will it be possible to systematize them and thus inform the investigating officer not only of isolated examples of cases in which the microscope expert can help him but also furnish him with a list of these cases systematically grouped and coordinated speaking quite generally it may be said that the microscope expert is useful in all cases where it is desirable to see anything more clearly than with the naked eye also where it is necessary to establish the composition of an object without destroying or deteriorating it which the chemist is nearly always obliged to do finally in cases where it is necessary to distinguish and differentiate the physical as opposed to chemical parts of a body that is to say when mechanical separation and not chemical analysis is desired for example determination of various powdered bodies of a mixture apart from the elements of which those bodies are constituted in the following paragraphs a small number of cases will be cited in which the investigating officer has a right to hope for the help of the microscopist it should be remarked that these examples are not intended to form a complete or nearly complete list of all possible cases the object of the author is to encourage and to continue this work in the same sense and ask his colleagues to call in a microscopic expert on every occasion he may be of any use and thus greatly benefit criminal justice the reader is moreover warned that practically no difference is made with respect to examinations made with a magnifying glass such a distinction cannot be drawn for in certain cases the one instrument is employed and in others the second while both are often used together both examinations are united in the term microscopic examination a traces of blood when the existence of blood stains is to be determined it is the investigating officer's duty to look for them with the utmost attention collect and preserve them with the greatest care and hand them over to the expert as soon as possible what the investigating officer should do in such a case will be considered in chapter fourteen traces of blood here we simply point out how and at what stage the expert must be utilized it will be especially important to obtain his cooperation at the outset so that he may be of assistance in discovering the traces this search is to be made methodically and nothing omitted which may possibly prove to be a bloodstain a saving of time and trouble will also be effected by not bothering with articles which bear no traces of blood it must not be forgotten that traces of blood do not always bear the aspect given them in criminal romances a blood stain may according to its background assume all imaginable colors it may also have been hidden by something which chance or premeditation has placed there in fact the search for blood traces in extensive areas such as large rooms fields or woods is not so easy as one might imagine in the way of example it is cited 
that blood spots which were quickly exposed to the sun according to the experiments of hamels even after five days became fawn grey special experience and knowledge such as an expert alone possesses are necessary for this reason his help must be invoked as often as possible but if the expert is being made use of his advice and experience must also be utilized to preserve and pack up the objects this is important because the expert when examining them knows from having seen with his own eyes exactly what procedure has been followed what measures have been taken and what the aspect of the objects was immediately on their discovery he can thus form a fair opinion of changes which sometimes take place the author would also add not from a feeling of distrust for he believes the investigating officer to be even more conscientious than the medical man but for other reasons that everything should be done by the investigating officer and not by the medical jurist for it is his opinion that the report may be impugned if it is stated therein that the blood stains were collected and preserved by the chemical examiner it is the investigating officer who should attend to this business at the same time mentioning in his report that he has done so under the supervision of the expert that is the medical officer this procedure guarantees the truth and increases the value of the operation it also points out the auxiliary role of the expert as to his primary role we must try and find out what the investigating officer should ask the microscope observer that is to say what he has the right to ask and what is his duty to ask above all it must be recollected that the fresher and more intact are the traces the better the expert can reply it goes without saying that a large number of objects facilitate the work and though small quantities may give a satisfactory result yet it will be the duty of the investigating officer to give the expert as large a quantity as possible he ought never to leave behind any objects under the pretext that there is already enough of them. One never knows what turn the case may take. One cannot say at the outset that different objects will not give different results. It is certain that the expert can in nearly every case distinguish blood stains from other stains. Even when the stains might lead us into error by their more or less perfect resemblance to blood, science possesses sufficient means of enabling an indisputable judgment being formulated however great the resemblance between blood stains and marks of paint rust chewing tobacco and the mouldiness of certain mushrooms the expert cannot be deceived it is not the same however if he be asked whence the blood comes science of today can distinguish the various kinds of blood by the shape and color of the blood globules it is known that those of amphibious animals fish birds the camel the dromedary and the llama are elliptical and those of all other mammifers are quite round but as a matter of fact the size of the globules of blood varies in the different mammifers they are largest in man we have also a number of measurements at our disposal which indicate the size of the blood globules of the various mammifers these lists are only of theoretical value to us and are but very rarely utilized in questions of law in the first place the dimensions indicated are not always the same it is only possible to give a maximum and a minimum for each animal for example for a dog zero point zero zero six zero to 0 0.0074 millimeters for a rabbit from 0 0.0066 to 0 0.0070 millimeters so that a globule of blood the size of which is found to lie between 0 0.0066 and 0 0.0070 may belong to either of these animals moreover these lists indicate measures of a thousandth part of a millimeter or often even of ten thousandth parts of a millimeter the absolute accuracy of a measurement cannot therefore be answered for in a criminal matter 
Finally, it must not be forgotten that these measurements are only definite when the blood cells have been dried in discs and have been submitted to no foreign influence. It will be rare to obtain all these conditions for a blood stain serving as corpus delicti. It is therefore permissible to presume that there are exceptional cases in which definite results may be attained. The author would reiterate that no investigating officer should be content with merely placing the objects in the hands of the expert and awaiting his report. He does his duty only when he interests himself in the expert's work, when he goes to find him in his laboratory, watches his results and communicates to him new information obtained in the course of the inquiry, and consults with him upon that information. If he does not do this, it may happen that the pivot on which the case in hand turns is quite different at the time when the expert sends in his report to that when he first took cognizance of the objects. This singular fact may then happen, the expert is still contenting himself with trying to find replies to questions which have long ago ceased to be of importance, while he does not reply to questions which in the meantime have become important. This evil can only crop up where the relations between investigating officer and the expert are not constant and close. The author affirms that he has never received a bad welcome nor found any impatience on the part of the expert. The hours he has spent in various laboratories are among those most full of suggestions and most instructive in his career. To come back to our subject. Let us presume that the expert declares to the investigating officer that the globules of blood of a corpus delicti are well preserved and can be easily measured. Let us also presume that the accused asserts that the stains in question come from some animal he has killed. And let us finally presume that the animal indicated by the accused is not a rabbit, dog, Indian pig, or other animal frequently found in physiological laboratories but on the contrary, an animal whose blood globules have never been measured or registered as regards their size. The globules of blood are perhaps very large, as large as those of man, or perhaps are very small, smaller than those of mammifers whose blood has been already tested and measured. In the former case, that is when the globules are very large, the statement of the accused must at least be considered to be possible although generally unworthy of credit. In the latter case, that is when the globules of the animal are extraordinarily small, the allegations of the accused will be immediately recognized as absolutely false. The author's opinion is that in such a case the expert ought to be requested to obtain some blood, not of one merely, but of several of those animals, and measure the blood globules. Considerations of expense will of course be objected, and it will be asked what the cost of such information will be. We do not hesitate to state that the money question is of value in criminal law only when the expense is superfluous, or if like results can be obtained by more economical means. Beyond that we declare that it is immoral and unworthy of a civilized state to omit to obtain information which may condemn a guilty or save an innocent man, simply because it would cost too much money. No citizen should complain of seeing the money he has paid in taxes being spent in the cause of justice. Another question that may be asked is whether the blood in question is arterial or venous blood. This question is generally confounded with the following. Do traces of blood which have been discovered proceed from a large or small wound? Venous blood may indeed also spout out. For example, if a brisk movement is given to a wounded member, or if it is contracted strongly and suddenly, but as a rule only arterial blood comes out with any force. If therefore there are large splashes of blood upon an article, especially upon a plain surface, for example, a wall, it is natural to suppose that an artery of a wounded or killed person has been severed in the neighborhood of those splashes. The medical man can therefore say not only that it is arterial blood, 
but he may also be able to indicate at what distance and in what position the individual was at the moment when he received the wound. In certain circumstances one can and even ought to ask other questions. Does the blood come from a wound, or piles, or an abscess? Is it the blood of menstruation or blood lost during defloration? Is the blood mixed with brain or other matter of the body? Is it due to bites of fleas, bugs, or mosquitoes? But it is not always possible to answer these questions. A definite decision can only be arrived at when foreign matter characteristic of the actual case is found in the blood, for example absence of fibrin, presence of oxyhemoglobin or blood particles in cases of flea and bug bites. In this connection the expert may be able to furnish very precious information, but not in every case. As regards excrement and other residua of the blood proceeding from blood-sucking insects, see Schauenstein, Janicek, Hoffmann, Schöfer, Frigerio, Bryant and Short, Ludwig, etc. As regards the age of a blood stain, the question may be put, but in most cases the reply will be vague. The general impression of the case, the examination of accessory circumstances and all the material available, may perhaps enable the expert to form an opinion on this subject. Success is sometimes obtained by employing arsenic or chlorine water. The reply in every case will be very approximate, at least when there are no other particularly significant circumstances which can be taken into account. See also Chapter 14. B. Excrement. It may be asked whether an expert can shed any light upon the examination of excrement. We say without hesitation that the expert can give the most valuable information. In regard to this, two very instructive cases are usually cited in the books. In the first of these, a person had been murdered. It was probably a crime passionnel. Suspicion fell upon a young man, the outside of whose trousers was stained with human excrement. The examination of these stains and of the fecal matter of the intestines of the murdered person showed conclusively that there was no connection between the two fecal matters one coming from meat and the other from vegetable food. The second case gave decisive results. Near a small town there was discovered floating down a stream the corpse of a young woman who had been robbed and murdered. The post-mortem was carefully performed and the fecal matter examined with attention. Seeds of fresh figs were found in it, but in the small town in question there were fresh figs in the garden of only one house, with the aid of this clue it came out that the servant of that house had enticed the young girl into the garden, given her figs, and then raped and killed her. The state of digestion of the figs exactly corresponded with the time which had elapsed between the eating of the figs and the murder of the girl. In a recent case an old woman was murdered, and fecal substance found at the scene of the crime contained ascarides, threadworms. The excrement of six men suspected of the deed was examined, and only in that of one man, and that after repeated and varied experiments, were ascarides found. He was charged and convicted of the crime. Excrement is also important in other ways. Möller recounts that it was turned to good purpose in the case of an arrested criminal whose excrement was submitted to microscopic examination after he was taken into custody. Although such examination cannot be entirely relied upon, yet it can be recommended in some cases. When, for example, in the case of an important criminal, the suspected person is arrested very soon after the crime, his last dwelling place and nourishment may be of importance and then the examination of his first stool after his arrest is to be recommended. In Treating of Superstition, Chapter 10, we see that wrongdoers not unusually deposit their motions on the place of the crime. In such cases the preservation of fecal matter may be of much importance. 
it is recommended that these questions should at least be taken into consideration. End of section 29section 30 of criminal investigation volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by abai in june 2015 criminal investigation a practical handbook for magistrates police officers and lawyers volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him. Continued. Section 3. C. Hair. Hair may be found under all manner of circumstances, and more may be learned from it than is generally supposed. It goes without saying that here again the investigating officer's business is not to make the necessary examination of the hair when found, but in all cases where there is any possibility of finding hair which may serve to detect an unknown criminal, to look for it and pass it on to a medical man or a microscopist. If we consult a scientific work treating on this subject, for example Dr. Emile Pfaff's the hair of man, its physiological, pathological, and legal importance, we shall be able to obtain therefrom conclusions as interesting as diverse. As to examination of hair, it would be out of place to detail here all the results of science on the subject, but the author desires, guiding himself by the works of Pfaff, L. Sonnenschein, and Dr. Alexander Klassen, Dr. von Hoffmann and Drs. Oesterlen, Maschka, etc., to indicate from what points of view the microscopist may be useful to the investigating officer when the latter sends him an important hair. We should in the first place not lose sight of the faculty of absorption possessed by human hair. It is capable of absorbing gases, odors, etc., with extreme facility and retains them for a relatively long time. This detail is of importance when it is desired to determine whether a man, be he alive or dead at the moment of examination, has been in a place impregnated with a gas or a smell, a point upon which the whole case may turn. It is true that these gases do not remain for a long time. The examination ought therefore to be undertaken immediately or, if that cannot be done, the hair must as far as possible be protected from exterior influences. The investigating officer ought to take the precaution of placing the hair in a perfectly clean receptacle of small size and hermetically closed. It is hardly necessary to remark that in all such cases the receptacle should be clean. It ought besides to be of relatively small dimensions, as superfluous space will absorb the gas of the hair. Finally, the manner of its closing must be such as to prevent the air escaping. Such details are frequently overlooked. The hair should be taken with absolutely clean hands and placed in a bottle having a wide neck and fitted with a close-fitting cork, or better still, in a receptacle of white metal or, in case of need, in an ordinary bottle. The stopper or cork and the inside of the lid of the metal receptacle, as the case may be, should be slightly rubbed over with absolutely pure fat. This fat will render the closing more secure, will attract and absorb the escaping gases, and may itself be an object for examination. Here again the investigating officer ought to do what an expert would do. He ought to describe with scrupulous exactitude the manner in which he has proceeded. The expert will then be able to know if the methods followed by the investigating officer in preserving the objects do not sufficiently guarantee the correctness of his examination, or if on the other hand it excludes the possibility of error. In this way, by stating clearly his procedure, 
the investigating officer will be fortified against the common objection that such examinations cannot be satisfactory as no one knows what has happened to the object while in his hands if the hair is preserved in a box of white metal the lid may be soldered on an operation which the most awkward tinsmith of the village will be capable of performing but special care must be taken to see that he does not heat the box or its contents on the box being handed to the expert he must be minutely informed of all that has been done it is then his task to ascertain whether the hair has absorbed and retained smoke perfume poisonous vapors or characteristic odors and gases etc another important role of the microscopist consists in examining hair which has been found in suspicious places for the purpose of ascertaining whether or not it belongs to a particular individual the commonest case is where hair has been found in the hands of persons who have been killed this happens more frequently than one would believe indeed if the hands of the victims were more carefully examined it would be found even more frequently it is often irritating to see how the first constable who arrives or the doctor who first inspects the corpse examines the hand of the dead person carelessly and imperfectly they sometimes even wipe it or seize it briskly they notice the hair perhaps if it is in tufts in the hands but they most certainly miss isolated hair when they act in this manner the hands must therefore be examined in the most minute manner and that only by authorized persons the preservation of the object when found ought to be commenced at once and with all possible care the best thing to do is to fold it in a piece of clean paper and enfold the letter in a second piece on the first or inner cover write at once how and by whom the hair has been found it is not sufficient to state hair found in the right hand of n n the situation of the hair must be expressly indicated for example between the thumb and first finger or lying obliquely across the root of the first finger and the ball of the thumb the best method is to make a drawing as minute as possible this is not difficult the investigating officer has but to place his hand with fingers extended upon a sheet of paper and then trace its outline with the pencil whether the fingers of the corpse were contracted or not is indifferent in the present case the important thing is to have a sketch of a hand on which the length and position of the hair may be indicated with a stroke of the pencil anyone is able to make a drawing of that kind the drawing plate one figure three here given has been intentionally made in a primitive manner and yet the sketch will show the position of the hair better than a long description it may also be important for the expert to know where the end and the root of the hair lay there are two ways of indicating this one if the particular hair is not to be handled on account for instance of blood attaching thereto the only thing then to be done is to place the hair on a sheet of paper and fix it thereto with bands of paper gummed over it these bands should not be gummed all over but only at the extremities so as not to injure the hair with the gum a sketch is then made as before and the extremities of the hair set out on the paper carrying the hair itself as well as upon the sketch using the same letters there can then be no doubt of the position of the hair on the hand of the murdered person two if it is unnecessary to take such precautions for example in the case of a hair found in the hand of a strangled or drowned person the position of the root and the tip of the hair may be decided at once the procedure followed is the same as that of wig and plate makers who are obliged to arrange the hairs so that all the roots and all the tips respectively come together the hair should be therefore seized between the thumb and the first finger so that the hair is perpendicular of course the position of the hair in the hand of the dead person has previously been well determined keeping the finger immovable the tip of the thumb is rubbed gently up and down the hair using the tip of the first finger as a rest 
The root of the hair is then of necessity in the same line as the hair itself. If the hair moves downwards, the root is below and moves down. If the direction in which the hair moves is upwards, the root must be above and moves upwards, but the tip of the hair must finally lie between the finger and thumb. Indeed, a hair, when enlarged and depicted schematically, appears as in figure 7. The hair has corticiform prominences which run from the root towards the tip. When it is between the fingers which rub upon one another, it can only move if the corticiform prominences catch upon the unevenness of a finger. The hair therefore moves along, the root always going away from the finger. When the tip has thus been determined, or, to speak more accurately, the direction of the tip, and when the root, or rather the direction of the root, has been established, it is noted on the sketch. If several hairs are found, the same procedure must be followed for each of them. Each one should be separately preserved, presuming that they are not stuck together with blood, and each one is placed aside there and then. The beginner should take warning not to think that he will be able to keep everything in his memory, and that it is unnecessary to note down and describe everything, for we do not remember everything, particularly after a certain time has elapsed, and when the emotions which are always produced in an important case interfere with and confuse one's impressions. The examination of hair may assume an important role in various sexual crimes. Two instances are generally cited in the books, in both of which the acts were committed with animals. In the first case, a horse's hair was found between the foreskin and the glands of an individual suspected of having committed an unnatural crime upon a mare. In the second case, a servant woman was accused of having had connection with a large dog, and when the hair of her sexual parts was examined, the black hair of a dog was discovered. The same phenomenon sometimes occurs in cases of rape. It is possible that during violent sexual intercourse the hairs of the sexual parts of one person come out and get mixed with those of the other, and it may even happen that on account of uncleanliness they remain there for a fairly long time. In such cases, therefore, it is recommended that an examination be made with the object of discovering such strange hairs on both persons that is, of the accused as well as of the victim, and if any be discovered, they should be handed over to an expert for examination. It must be remembered that every hair discovered during the course of an inquiry may be of the greatest importance when it is possible to prove beyond all doubt that it belongs to the accused person. Pfaff cites a very instructive case which well illustrates this. A man was gravely wounded by an unknown person on a very dark night. The author of the crime, whose appearance was absolutely unknown, dropped his cap in his flight, and it was brought to the authorities. Inside the cap two hairs were sticking. These hairs were sent to the medical jurisprudent for microscopic examination. Pfaff found that the hairs were light grey, but that they had in the medullary substance a large number of pigmentary cells which were as black as jet. He concluded from this that the hairs belonged to a dark man still fairly young, but who was beginning to grow grey. It was also established that the individual must have had his hair cut very shortly before the crime, for the sections of the hairs were still sharp. Finally he found the roots of the hairs were very much wasted. He concluded from this that these hairs, which carried mammillary prominences in their epithelial parts, which must have been produced owing to perspiration, must have grown at the edge of a kind of tonsure caused by the beginnings of baldness, and he further concluded that the individual in question was inclined to stoutness, since he had perspired freely in the head. The observer at the microscope thus gave the following description of the criminal. A man of middle age, of robust constitution, and inclined to obesity. Black hair intermingled with grey hair, recently cut, commencing to grow bald. Similar deductions may be obtained in many cases. 
one must never be prevented by the trouble that is necessary nor the cost which must be incurred in making them it happens fairly often that a criminal while taking flight or in the course of the struggle loses his head covering and that the latter is handed to the investigating officer but how often is this head covering examined to see whether or not hairs may be found there and how many times when hairs have been found are they sent to a skilled microscopist examination of hair is also necessary when we may establish thereby the identity of a corpse or the age constitution etc of a dead person which information owing to advanced decomposition would not otherwise be obtainable if there be the least suspicion of crime a little of the hair of the corpse should always be taken and handed to a microscopist in order that anything which can be established may be established if the question be asked what in a general way the observer at the microscope can teach us concerning the distinctive characters of hair the answer will be that he is above all and with absolute certainty able to distinguish between the fibres of plants and between the hair of animals and the human hair he also knows how to distinguish between the hair which grows on the various parts of the human body the books set out for example pfaff the distinctive signs which characterize the various kinds of hair for example the hair of the head of a man and the hair of the head of a woman eyelashes eyebrows the hair of the nose and ear of the beard and moustache of the hair in the armpits and on the back of the head of the forearm on the shoulder on the chest in the pit of the stomach and the umbilical parts of a man also between the hair on the upper and lower parts of the buttocks on the foot and on the sexual parts of a man and woman on the perineum the anus and the scrotum all these different kinds of hair have their distinctive characteristics which prevent any error being made in differentiating between them the expert may therefore be asked if necessary upon what part of the body the hair in question has grown and further whether the said body is that of a man or a woman the expert is also able within certain limits no doubt to determine the age of a person by examining some of that person's hair it is especially easy for him to do so if the hair be given to him with its root for the root of a hair dissolves in a solution of caustic potash and the younger the owner of the hair the more easily does it so the hair of children will dissolve immediately but that of old people will resist the action of the solution of caustic potash for hours with several hairs of the same person various experiments may be made and the average time necessary for the dissolution of their roots be established it may then be determined what are the persons of a known age whose hair will dissolve in the same space of time and the approximate age of the person whose hair is the subject of examination may thus be determined there are indeed other means of determining the age of a person from the hair for example by the diminution of the pigmentary cells of the medullary substance and the spaces or gaps thereby produced thanks to this means we can tell whether perfectly white hair belongs to a young man who is growing gray early in life or to a really old man the hairs of the sexual parts of a young girl have the tips very fine while the tips of those of an old woman are calviform in both sexes the hair in the armpits is very slender in youth and as the subject ages it will in that locality reach a diameter of zero point one five millimeters and even more in a word the observer at the microscope has at his disposal besides the methods of the dissolution of the roots of hair by a solution of caustic potash the means of furnishing at least approximate information as to the age of a person moreover as we have seen a medical jurisprudent can at least in certain cases indicate with more or less accuracy the characteristics of a person from an examination of hair sometimes indeed he will be able to say in what manner the hair has been looked after use of various pomades dyes etc 
from which many an important clue may originate. Even the exterior aspect is able to teach us whether it has been drawn out, cut, chopped, and this in some cases is of the greatest importance. For instance, an examination of hair cut at the place where a wound has been made on the head often teaches us more concerning the weapon employed than an examination of the wound itself. The investigating officer should therefore never neglect to hand over the hair to a medico-legal expert for microscopic examination when a wound on the head is in question and the weapon employed is unknown. Some other circumstances also merit the attention of the investigating officer. On every occasion that he notices any peculiarity whatsoever about the hair of a corpse, either at an inquest or an exhumation, he ought to immediately question a medical expert. For instance, a common symptom in cases of poisoning by arsenic or mercury or narcotics is the easiness with which the hair can be torn out, especially the hair of the private parts. Hair is of great importance legally from another standpoint. It resists decomposition for an extremely long time. It is evident that we cannot cite as an example mummies and mummified bodies preserved in vaulted tombs or other favorable places, nor even the example of dried pericrania. It is natural that the hair will remain preserved when the conditions of preservation are so favorable that those parts of a body which putrefy easily, such as the muscles, tissues, skin, etc., do not decompose. But we speak of that large number of corpses which, found in extremely unfavorable conditions of preservation, still carry the hair astonishingly well preserved. If then the question be whether a corpse ought to be exhumed, or whether the time which has elapsed leaves no room for hope that an important result will be brought about, the exhumation must always be decided upon when there is a chance that an examination of the hair of a corpse will furnish any information about the individual, as for instance his very identity. If the death of the individual has taken place not very long before, it must be presumed, if the conditions as to the soil, etc., of the place of interment are in any way favorable, that the hair is well preserved. Here it may be noted that the hair of young persons decomposes more rapidly than that of old persons, that dark hair keeps longer than fair hair, and that the hair of the head keeps best of all, the hair of the sexual parts putrefies the most rapidly. Gouda states that hair mixed with substances in putrefaction changes color to no considerable extent. At the most it will become a little lighter or a little darker. This observation is of importance when the identity of a person is sought to be established. So Caspar Liemann draws attention to a case in which the hair of a person buried for two years had so altered that his relations would have failed to recognize him, had not his false teeth precluded any doubt. Under such circumstances, attention should be drawn to the fact that in decay not only temperature, moisture, surroundings, and so on, but also very essential individual peculiarities work together, so that conclusions drawn from the degree of the decay as to the time of death will be seen to be very important. For the decision of this time, the appearance of certain insect larvae may be of great importance. A complete discussion of the question relating to rigor mortis, putrefaction, etc., and the deductions to be drawn therefrom will be found in the standard work on medical jurisprudence by Taylor, edited by Stevenson, Volume 1, Chapters 3 through 7. An admirable summary of the question, drawn up with special reference to Indian conditions, will be found in Outlines of Medical Jurisprudence for India, by Gribble and Heher, Chapter 7. Reference may also be made to Lyons Medical Jurisprudence for India, by Lt. Col. Waddell, I.M.S., 3rd edition, pages 67-74. through 74. 
however great the services which are rendered by the microscope may be the jurist must not always count too much upon its assistance especially it is of help when the identity of hair is in question or the determination of whether a particular hair belongs to a particular person if the reply is in the negative the matter is completely elucidated in this case we have an absolute proof of the innocence of a man and that is one of the finest triumphs science can bring about for the observer at the microscope is able to say with absolute certainty that a tuft of smooth fair hair does not come from a black curly head and this single piece of evidence should suffice to solve the question but the same cannot be said when the question is answered in the affirmative and it appears that the two samples of hair are identical there is indeed but one identicality whereas non-identicality permits of innumerable differences and in this case chance may take a much more important place than in the former and we criminal lawyers know better than any one what chance is capable of doing quite recently an old woman whose business was the pledging and redeeming of articles at the pawn shops was murdered in the hand of the corpse were found three hairs which the woman must have torn from her aggressor during her desperate resistance suspicion fell upon the victim's own son and the three hairs found upon the corpse as well as some samples of the hair of the son who was in custody were sent to microscope experts the latter happened to be two scientific celebrities whose names were well known all over europe they went into the matter with the greatest care and with all the aids of modern science and circumstantiated their results in the most detailed manner the three hairs found in the hand of the corpse were from six to seven centimeters in length were dark brown in color had been torn out the roots were preserved and seemed to have belonged to a man of from twenty to forty years old under the microscope two of the hairs were brown but the third had some parts of brown and others black a fact which immediately struck the specialists as well as the outsider just above the root it was brown half a centimeter further on it became black then again brown and half a centimeter further towards the tip it became black again this is a phenomenon which specialists tell us is most extraordinary and very rare hair of the accused person was then taken from three different parts of his head it being cut just above the roots this individual was twenty-nine years old his hair measured from six to seven centimeters in length it was dark brown in color and examined under the microscope was about the same thickness as the three hairs finally they counted the hairs and placed them one by one under the microscope about two-thirds of the hairs were brown and the other third presented absolutely the same peculiarity as the brown and black striped hair mentioned above and yet the sun in spite of the strange coincidence of this phenomenon which according to these experienced medical men is so rare was not the assassin of his mother when subsequently the murderer of the old woman was discovered it was found that his hair was also striped in the same way and was astonishingly like that of the son of the deceased woman we learn from this case that even the fact that distinctive signs of quite exceptional character are to be found in both the specimens examined does not always prove that the hair under comparison is indeed hair coming from the same head almost every man has on his head a few of the other essentially different hairs for instance blonde persons have almost always a few dark thick hairs the author knows a lady who has rich wavy soft hair but on one place about as big as a rupee on account of a scar caused by a wound received early in life the hair is straight rough to the feel and noticeable lighter in shade no one would believe that a hair from the scarred place and one from another portion of the head belonged to the same person dr gouda remarks that when proof of the identicality of hairs is to be considered the matters with which they are artificially colored must not be forgotten this coloring matter may be got rid of in various ways 
for example, washing in water, dilute hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, or chlorine water. End of section 30. Section 31 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in June 2015. Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers and Lawyers, Volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him. Continued. Section 3. D. Other Cases Relating to Medicine. Besides the cases already mentioned, which are frequent enough, the investigating officer will order microscopic examination in cases relating to post-mortems and other medical-legal inquiries. Suppose, for instance, that the question is to establish whether an individual has been in an atmosphere filled with dust, smoke, or other substance, or in a liquid other than pure water, the microscopic examination of the respiratory channels and also often of the hair will generally furnish accurate information. The spittle of living persons and the contents of the respiratory channels of dead persons should be examined. Even a microscopic examination of substances contained in the stomach, obtained by vomiting or at the post-mortem, often gives better results than a chemical examination will, when it is desired to determine, for example, the nature of the food absorbed. The same holds if organic poisoning be suspected, especially vegetable poisons, the presence of which cannot always be proved chemically. The author is firmly convinced that a great number of murders by poison would be discovered if the contents of the stomachs of people dying by suicide, or whose cause of death is set down as doubtful, were examined. Considering the great number of poisonous plants which grow freely on the earth, and remembering that their properties are known to everyone, and that the alkaloids of a certain number of them can hardly be determined, we cannot help being convinced that many plants are employed for criminal purposes much oftener than is officially known. An old botanist, Dioscorides von Anarzabos, concludes his botany with these words. There are many other plants growing in the fields and forests, hedgerows and brushwood, but no one knows their names any more than I do. As regards poisonous plants, we are in much the same position as we were 2,000 years ago. If we take the first work on toxicology to hand, as Blythe on poisons, or a treatise on the poisonous plants of a country, or even a work on legal chemistry, or for India such a book as Cheevers or Lyons Medical Jurisprudence, we will find a number of noxious plants enumerated, of which it is said that the proof of their having been absorbed by a human organism can only be determined by botanomicroscopic means, that is to say that a botanist ought to search for particles of the plants in evacuated and digested matter and examine and determine their nature. We cite but a few of these plants, the water hemlock, Cicuta virosa, the little hemlock, Etusa cinapium, the water onanthi, onanthe crocata, the spurred rye, Secale cornutum, the black hellebore, Helleborus niger, the sabine, Juniperus sabina, and all the poisonous mushrooms and toadstools, etc. All these plants may be easily found anywhere in Europe. In one evening ramble enough may be collected to poison a whole village. Several of these plants, as the sabine and hemlocks, are to be found in India. There also are commonly met with the sabadilla, Veratrum officinale, 
Veratrum album, viride, etc., commonly called hellebores, marking nuts, semecarpus anacardium, madar, calotropis gigantea, croton seeds and oil, croton tiglium, and datura, datura fastuosa. As most of these plants are administered in India, both as poisons and as abortifacients, in the form of seeds, leaves, bark, etc., it is evident that microscopical examination for the purpose of detecting solid particles, where these are not visible to the naked eye, is of prime importance. Both marking nut, and especially the lal chitra, or plumbago root, plumbago celanica, is introduced in solid pieces into the vagina as an irritant, portions being frequently retained, death is the common result of non-expulsion. See chapter 16, sections 6 and 7. The microscopic proof will not be very difficult to carry out if the plant has been given in its entirety, that is to say as a vegetable or even in a dish, for example toadstools served up as mushrooms. It is usually easily discovered in the stomach, intestines, or vomited matter, etc. If it has been given as a decoction, it will perhaps be possible to find in the urine a more or less large particle of the plant. The greater number of these noxious plants have so characteristic an aspect that a small piece, such as the point of a leaf or the fragment of a thorn, is sufficient for the microscopist and botanist to recognize. See Chapter 5, Section 6, Chapter 16, Section 6. As to microscopic examination applied to firearms and ammunition, see Chapter 11 and Chapter 16, Section 3. E. Falsification of writing. The first examination to which writing, supposed to have been falsified, is submitted is that of the microscope. The microscope in no way damages the object and in every case brings us very near the solution of the problem. Manipulations made upon the paper, such as erasures, obliterating with water, the employment of corrosives, etc., which are invisible to the naked eye, become astonishingly clear under the microscope. Differences between makes of paper may be discovered with complete certainty as when, for instance, a false sheet of paper, which has an absolute resemblance to the other sheets, at least as regards its exterior aspect, is inserted into a document. False seals, watermarks, false grease spots, and yellow stains may all be at once discovered under the microscope. The ink of genuine writing will resemble, to the naked eye, that of the forged part, but under the microscope differences will appear so clearly that they will be recognized by the naked eye, attention having been thus directed to them. Even the nature of the pen employed may be deduced, and it may be determined whether the pen had a sharp point and entered the paper deeply, or whether it had a broad and soft point which glided lightly over the paper. Thanks to the enlargement, writing executed with a steel pen may be distinguished from that done with a quill, or that with a hard pencil from that with a soft one, etc. See Falsification of Documents, Chapter 18, Section 2, and the present chapter, Section 8. F. Examination of cloth, woolens, linen, etc. The examination of cloth stuffs is of some importance when the question is the identification of woolen cloth, linen, thread, paper, etc. It goes without saying that in these cases the advice of a merchant or manufacturer will in the first place be taken when it is desired to know whether a piece of cloth belongs to such and such a weaving, or a piece of paper bearing a certain trademark has been made by a particular mill, etc. In ordinary thefts, that is what will have to be done, but if the case is one of great importance, the advice of a manufacturer, merchant, etc., will not be sufficient, but an expert will have to be questioned. 
with the help of a microscope the latter will be able to judge of the fineness of a stuff by the number and the strength of the threads which cover a square centimetre of the texture as well as by the manner in which they are twisted as regards each individual thread he will determine its substance and state whether it is of cotton flax wool or silk etc finally he will be able to say by studying other details whether the fragment found is part of a particular garment whether a handkerchief has been taken from a certain dozen of handkerchiefs whether the threads with which a corpus delicti has been sewn are the same as those which have been employed in mending the coat of a person suspected or whether the paper forming the wad of a firearm is the same as that found in the house of the presumed murderer etc the manufacturer would have made a thousand mistakes and would have declared for example that a particular stuff was made by him when in fact it had been cleverly imitated by the criminal but the microscope would not be duped in this way the cases in which examination is necessary are more numerous than one would believe but it will be always well when the identity of material is in question not to be content with an exterior resemblance however similar the articles in comparison may appear to be the observer at the microscope ought always to be examined before forming a conclusive judgment experience teaches us that many things which are really identical are thought to be different and inversely many things appear to be absolutely similar which are in fact not at all so the identity of a thread is often of extreme importance and may be established by the microscopist with very great accuracy it must not be forgotten that to obtain his results it suffices to have almost imperceptible little ends of threads, and such are always at our disposal whenever a wrongdoer leaves some object behind him on the scene of the crime. In one case some threads offered important clues. These threads had been sewn into an apron which had been left behind by some burglars. The apron was of the same blue linen used in the aprons of innumerable workmen, but the thread of the hem was without doubt the same as the only sewing thread found in the house of a suspected individual. Here is another example. The thread with which the exercise book of a schoolboy had been sewn together established the identity of the corpse of a child. There was no doubt that an outrageous and murderous attack had been made upon the child whose corpse was found in a nude and half-decomposed condition under some branches in a forest. The school books of the child were missing. At a short distance from the corpse was found an exercise book in fairly good preservation. The cover and the written pages had been torn away, and no definite indication could be obtained from the book. But the mother of the child knew with what thread she had sewn up the last exercise book of the child, and she handed it to the investigating officer and microscopic examination proved the two threads to be the same in another case a thread with which some strips of tinder had been sewn together for the detailed account of this case see under arson chapter nineteen was compared with a thread in the fur cap of the accused and brought about his conviction in another case a microscopic particle of thread had remained attached to a chisel at the place where the blade meets the handle the experts were able to affirm that the particle of thread must have belonged to the upper border of the pocket of the waistcoat worn by the supposed criminal on the day of the crime the observer at the microscope can also give us much information as regards linen from which the marks have been unpicked extreme care and special skill are required for this operation to enable him to tell that at such and such a place a mark has been unpicked but in the majority of cases he will be able to give us the most ample information and discover what has been unpicked at the place this information is of great importance when it is desired to establish whether the unpicked mark is identical with that on another garment for example of the same dozen in this case the observer at the microscope will look for the little traces of the thread 
with which the mark was made. He will nearly always find these traces, especially when the linen has been washed and ironed several times. If the piece of thread found is then compared under the microscope with the thread with which the other articles have been marked, it is possible to establish its identity with almost absolute certainty. It is hardly necessary to mention that it is often of great utility to make an attractive examination of paper. In serious cases of forged documents, libels, threats, and all other crimes committed with or on paper, domiciliary search is frequently indispensable and will always bring about the discovery of a more or less large quantity of paper belonging to the accused. If paper presenting the least resemblance to the subject matter of the crime be found, it should always be submitted to the examination of the specialist. The objection will be often wrongly made that the majority of the people of a locality buy their paper at the same establishment, or at least at a very small number of establishments, so that the most certain proof of the identity of two papers cannot serve for very much. But in these cases it is characteristic that nearly every individual who commits a forgery is afraid to make use of paper sold in his own neighborhood. Experience teaches us that if such a document be shown to sellers of paper near the house of the accused, the result will nearly always be negative. The paper in question will not be found to form part of the recent stock in such shops, for the author of the crime is afraid to use this paper. In most cases the corpus delicti is torn from an exercise or other book, or is the second page of a sheet of paper of which the first sheet has been already used. If the other half is found at the residence of the accused, the proof of identity made by the observer at the microscope will be practically conclusive. End of section 31 Section 32 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in June 2015. Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1 by Hans Gross, translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him, Continued. Section 3. G. Examination of Stains. It may be affirmed with almost absolute certainty that the examination of stains is a veritable touchstone for the observer at the microscope. Here he can obtain the most decisive proof from the smallest and, in appearance, the most insignificant objects, but in this class of cases the investigating officer also has an opportunity of showing his skill in carefully preserving the corpus delicti in its original condition and without in any way damaging the stains. But will he be able, generally speaking, to fix his attention upon these little objects, and, from the results furnished by the expert, draw the conclusions which proceed from them? Here again it is the old question, all the skill of an investigating officer consists in knowledge how to conclude, combine, and utilize. Let us take a few examples haphazard showing the great value of the examination of stains. 1 on weapons and tools. Besides those cases in which blood is the object of search, the examination of weapons is important for other reasons. The weapon may, for instance, while being cleaned or carried about, be dirtied by contact with various substances. The following case has come to the knowledge of the author. A drunk and swearing individual entered the garden of a café where he met a dragoon who split his skull with a blow of his sabre. At the request of the investigating officer, all the sabres of the dragoons who had leave from barracks on the previous day were collected next morning and submitted to microscopic examination. 
no trace of blood was found upon any of them, but one had a tiny little notch in its cutting edge, in which was a fragment of a blade of grass, which was hardly visible in spite of considerable enlargement under the microscope. As the inquiry had been commenced at once, and as the blade of grass in the notch had been sufficiently protected by the sheath of the sabre to prevent it from drying, it was possible to say that this blade of grass could not have been sticking to the sabre for any length of time, since it had preserved its freshness. The dragoon to whom the sabre belonged must have, as indeed he afterwards confessed, cleaned his blade upon the wet grass after having delivered the blow. He had then wiped it with a cloth, but the fragment of grass had remained in the notch. This case is instructive, for it shows that the examination should not be restricted to the search for a single object, as in this case traces of blood, but it ought to be extended to all the isolated or extraordinary peculiarities which the object may possess, but the work of the expert is of no real utility if he be not instructed as widely as possible by the investigating officer upon the course of the case and its smallest details. If in the above case the expert had received an order only to look for traces of blood upon the sabre, he would have fulfilled his task by merely giving a reply in the negative. But here he knew the case in detail, and he was able at the first sight of the blade of grass to make up his mind as to how it came there, and say that it was of the greatest importance. In the same way traces of earth, dust, fibres, and dried-up liquids, etc., may furnish excellent clues. The investigating officer will of course never dispense with the obligation to order microscopic examination for the sole reason that he can see nothing particular upon the weapon in question, etc. In the first place the microscope will be able to bring about the discovery of many important things which have not been perceived by the naked eye, and in the second place every expert knows that he ought to take the weapon or instrument to pieces and search for suspicious substances in the joints and places of adjustment. Thus a hatchet may have been cleaned in the most careful manner, so that nothing will be discoverable even with a microscope. But if the iron be separated from the handle, perhaps objects of great importance will be found either in the aperture or on the part of the handle where it meets and joins the iron. The following instance may be cited. In a district where hops are grown with much success, a large quantity were cut down one day, a short time before the harvest, to about the height of a meter from the ground. These hops belonged to one of the most skillful cultivators, and, the plants dying, he suffered damage to the extent of more than a thousand florins. Suspicion fell upon a neighbor who also grew hops, but with much less success. That he envied his more skillful and industrious competitor was well known, for he had made no attempt to hide his feelings. The police officer who made the first inquiries, had already on the day following the crime taken possession of the pocket-knife of this person and handed it to the investigating officer. It was a large knife with a very strong bent blade such as it is used by gardeners and vine-tenders. There was only one peculiarity about it. It had been quite newly sharpened. One could not help thinking on seeing it that it would be an excellent instrument for easily and quickly in passing, so to speak, cutting down strong branches of hops. The knife was handed to a medical legal man who was a thoroughly good operator with the microscope, and he was completely instructed upon the case. The inquiry necessitated preliminary study, consisting of the examination under the microscope of the structure of the hop plant, and especially of its rind. It was found that the branches of hop were covered with little and big spurs of a very characteristic nature. The rind or peel of a large number of other plants, which also have these little spurs, was then examined, and the spurs thereon were found to be so different that it was absolutely impossible to confound them with those of hops when placed under the microscope. Even those spurs which resembled them the most, 
namely the spurs on the branches and stalks of the melon, the cucumber and the pumpkin, have distinctive signs which exclude all possibility of mistake. The outside of the knife was examined, but nothing was discovered. The rivets were then taken out, and on a close examination of the place where the end of the blade is joined to the handle, a large number of such spurs were found. On examination under the microscope they were found to be spurs of the hop plant, and it was impossible for anyone to doubt that the knife had been used quite recently to cut hops. On another occasion the microscope was instrumental in furnishing an important proof that a bar of iron, in the form of a crowbar, carried traces of brick dust. This piece of iron had a rusty place about four to five inches from its sharp end, and there a red stain was noticed. Under the microscope it was found that this stain was the remains of some brick dust encrusted in the iron. There was no manner of doubt that this rusty part of the crowbar had been brought down with force upon a brick. Now, in the case of burglary in question, a similar instrument had been made use of as a lever in attacking a wall. It could therefore be presumed that the crowbar had been inserted into the wall and had been pressed with force against the brick, thus causing the stain in question. Moreover, this particular crowbar had been in constant use, so that the brick dust could not have been of long standing. It was therefore practically certain that this instrument had been employed in this burglary. Very often one can also decide with regard to instruments for working in wood whether they have been used for certain work, as by notches in pickaxes, hatches, large knives, chisels, etc., in which may be seen with the magnifying glass remains of the material. In the same way it can be decided what sort of wood has been sawn by the teeth of a saw. Thus it was once shown by microscopic examination that certain sawdust in the teeth of a saw proceeded from pine wood, not cherry wood, although the bystanders could not be sure about it with ordinary eyesight. The dirt under the fingernails of the victim and of the alleged author of the crime should also be examined under the microscope. This dirt teaches us in the most definite way what has taken place, for it is composed of what has last come into contact with the individual in question. If the latter be a living person, no time should be lost in taking possession of the dirt. We remember a case for example, in which there was grave suspicion that the dirt under the fingernails of a criminal proceeded from blood. The microscopic examination, carried out at the inquiry office in Nuremberg, 1896, decided that the colouring substance was Berlin blue. 2. Dust According to Liebig, dirt is matter in the wrong place. So we may say, dust is our environment or surroundings in miniature. An object covered with dust gathers to itself infinitesimal particles of bodies which happen to be at a greater or less distance from it. Neither dirt nor dust are determinate bodies. The former is composed of small particles which come into contact with an object and remain there for some reason or other while the latter is composed of small particles ground up to form the powder deposited upon the object. Dust may indeed be brought from great distances by the wind, but in the majority of cases it comes from the immediate neighbourhood, thus by recognising the constituents of the dust upon a specified article, it is possible to indicate approximately the objects surrounding it. The dust of the desert will contain little besides pulverized earth, sand, and small particles of plants. The dust of a ballroom, crowded with people, will in great measure proceed from the fibers from which the clothes of the dancers are woven. The dust of a smith's shop will be for the most part composed of pulverized metal. And that upon the books of a study, nothing but a reunion of the particles of earth carried in on the boots of the master of the house and the servants, with very tiny particles of paper. Examining more closely, we find that the coat of a locksmith contains a different kind of dust to that on the coat of a miller. 
that accumulated in the pocket of a schoolboy is essentially different from that in the pocket of a chemist while in the groove of the pocket knife of a dandy a different kind of dust will be found to that in the pocket knife of a tramp all these examples are drawn from the author's own practice and in all of them neither a determinate body nor a particular particle of a determinate body was being searched for but the dust was collected for microscopic examination and in each case new clues were found therefrom enabling the inquiry to proceed one day for instance there was found upon the scene of a crime a garment from which no information could be obtained as to its owner the coat was placed in a strong and well gummed paper bag which was beaten with sticks as vigorously and for as long a time as could be done without the paper tearing the packet was left alone for a short time and then opened the dust being carefully collected and submitted to a chemical examiner examination proved that the dust was entirely composed of woody fibrous matter finely pulverized the deduction drawn was that the coat belonged to a carpenter joiner or sawyer etc but among the dust much gelatin and powdered glue was found this not being used by carpenters or sawyers the further deduction was drawn that the garment belonged to a joiner which turned out to be in fact the case the dust which collects so quickly and in such quantities in the pockets of clothes is also very important this is especially so when the clothes are not frequently brushed and shaken it tells us from its composition the whole history of a person during the time he has worn the garment in the first place it is no doubt composed of pulverized particles of the material of which the pocket is made to this is added the dust of the atmosphere in which the person lives which may enter the pocket directly or through the cloth or other fabric then there is the dust deposited by articles placed in the pocket such as crumbs of bread tobacco dust particles of paper metallic powder wood dust etc finally we have the dust covering the hands so often placed in the pockets all this forms a composition which will contain at least one element from which the quality trade and occupation of a person may be determined just as important is the dust in the groove of a pocket knife that is in the space between the two sides of the handle in which the blade lies when the knife is shut however clean a pocket knife be kept an astonishingly large quantity of dust and even larger particles will collect in it in almost all cases the nature of this dust can be accurately determined and it indicates with the greatest certainty where the knife has been and what it has done all such articles always or nearly always carried on the person give the same information that is the leather folds of the outside of a purse or card case the outside edge of a watch case as well as the interior edge which is indeed called the dust catch also the jewels of watches with the incrustations thereon which pick up all manner of dust examinations of this description should be undertaken in all cases where it is desired to establish the identity of a person who carries such articles about him and also when the articles are found by themselves and information is sought regarding their owner and finally when the articles are found in the possession of people who have evidently no right to them and their true owner is being searched for no doubt examinations of this sort never guarantee certain success but they should not for all that be classed among those forlorn hopes employed when we are at our wits end to know what to do if the work be executed with care by the expert or investigating officer the percentage of successes will not be inconsiderable especially if we have other materials and clues to aid as unfortunately is not always the case with which the results obtained by microscopic means may be combined it may be confidently asserted that it is never allowable to neglect these inquiries in any case of importance they may succeed and this is sufficient reason for saying that it would be unpardonable to neglect them and if this microcosmic inquiry does succeed 
the investigating officer may say with pride, Das sind die Kleinen von den Meinen. These little ones are mine. Faust. His little sprites indeed will have obeyed and seconded him. 3. Stains on clothes, etc. Here again, microscopic examination is generally restricted to the search for stains of blood and sperm, and yet what precious information can we not obtain in other directions? In a crime of any importance, no stain on the clothes of a suspected person should be permitted to pass unnoticed, nor must one allow oneself to be drawn into forming a preconceived opinion and asserting, who knows from what time this stain, which has moreover no connection with the crime, dates. But it is impossible to distinguish with the naked eye whether a stain is really too old to be of use, while with a microscope the matter may perhaps assume quite a different complexion. We cannot then assert at first sight that a stain has no connection with the crime, microscopic examination is alone capable of telling us this, and even the connection may not be discovered at once, but only on subsequent investigation. Besides, it is not necessary for the stain to have direct connection with the crime to make its composition a matter of interest. Thus we may instance the discovery, in a murder case, upon the trousers of the suspected murderer, of a large stain of singular aspect, which had thickened and stiffened the material at one place. The microscopist, who was examining the trousers for blood stains, examined this stain under the microscope, and was able to establish that it was composed of a mixture of ashes, sawdust, and glue, it was therefore putty with which joiners fill up cracks and other inequalities in wood. This stain could not possibly have any connection with the crime, for investigation of the locus in quo proved that there was none of this fresh putty about. But the investigating officer questioned the suspected individual upon the origin of this stain, and received, though in a slow, hesitating manner, what seemed to be a fairly satisfactory explanation, which, however, he proceeded to verify. As the inquiry became long drawn out, and no further proof could be adduced against the suspect, he was on the point of being released, when it was found that his explanation was completely false. It was presumed that his conscience was not perfectly clean, as he had attached importance to a stain of whose origin perhaps even he himself was unaware, and had thought fit to recite an entirely false story about it. His release was postponed, and he was subsequently convicted of the crime. Microscopic examination of marks of dirt will often be regarded as the only experiment possible when one has no halting place for the purpose of carrying out a long and costly chemical examination, and it is necessary at least partially to decide the question. By a microscopic examination little or nothing is lost. It costs little, can be quickly performed, and perhaps a decision can be arrived at. For example, marks taken for stains of sperm might under microscopic examination prove to be paste, food, etc. Even if the microscope gives no sure information, one can always have recourse to chemical examination. Speaking generally, it may be said that what has been stated above concerning dirt and dust applies equally to stains on clothes. They proceed from the place where the wearer of them has been, and also from those substances with which he comes in contact. In many criminal trials, the work of the investigating officer consists entirely in establishing at what place the accused was at a specified time. The stains which he discovers and the nature of which he can identify will perhaps enable him to determine at least some stages of the road followed by the accused. 4. Mud on footwear Mud or sand attaching to feet and footwear often indicates more readily than the most minute investigations the place where the individual carrying it has been. 
Such examinations are of the greatest interest when we have to deal with dead bodies or suspected persons. It is desired, for example, to know whence come the former and where they have stopped last, or again whether the latter have been at the place of the crime. It goes without saying that such an inquiry has small chance of being conclusive if the ground is everywhere of uniform nature, for example, the same clayey soil for several leagues around, or mud in the streets of a city, etc. But even in these cases it would be imprudent to advise the neglect of examination of the mud upon boots, shoes, sandals, or other footwear, and on feet, for such examination may possibly bring about the discovery of fresh details, sufficient at least to indicate the direction in which subsequent information may be employed. Suppose the case of a man found dead in a town. There is every reason to believe that he has not left the town. There is no other mud upon his shoes than that of the streets, which is practically identical throughout the town. If it is important to know where the individual has last been, for example, whether he has been killed far from or near to the place where his body has been discovered, it will be well, at all hazards, to hand over his shoes to the microscopist, who will examine the various elements of the mud upon them. It is even possible for these elements to allow of certain conclusions, for example, manure, vegetable debris, the fruit of trees, to be found only in certain roads and lanes in the city, may be discovered. Also fragments of minerals only employed in the composition of certain roads, or chalk, or brick dust, which permit of the deduction that the man has been in a workshop or manufactory. The matter is easier and has more chances of success when the investigation takes place in the country. There the nature of the soil is more varied, the rooms of the houses are not paved, and the floors are often covered with characteristic materials. The author is acquainted with two cases of this kind. In one it was desired to convict a man of theft in a mill, in the other the accused was suspected of having hidden a large sum of stolen money in a hollow willow tree near the bank of a stream. In both cases the mud on the boots of the accused was examined, and in both cases two layers of mud were found, separated from one another, in the first case by flour, and in the second by fine sand. In the former the accused had walked with muddy boots and the flour lying about the mill, in the latter he had also walked, first in the mud, then in the sand of the river bank, and then again in the mud. In both cases the two layers of mud and the intermediate substances were identified so thoroughly as to preclude all doubt as to their origin. Professor Jeserich gives a third case in which diatoma were found in the sand sticking to the shoes of a murdered person, whereby the place where the man must have been was ascertained. End of section 32「Section 33 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him, Continued. Section 4. The Chemical Analyst. Here we may be brief. In effect, the chemist will be employed in all cases in which the microscopist may be called in. In many cases, both are necessary, for there are few cases of a purely chemical category. The analyst has frequent recourse to the magnifying glass or microscope, before or after his chemical work, for the purpose of completing or checking it. Conversely, the microscopist can hardly do analyst's work, and so we can only attain satisfactory results from the combined action of the microscopist and chemical analyst. Speaking generally, we may say that the investigating officer does not employ the analyst or chemical examiner frequently enough, 
and that many cases which have remained in a state of obscurity would have taken another turn if the expert had been consulted. This is especially true in all cases of poisoning, where recourse to a chemist is only had where pieces of arsenic as big as a pea, or a strong odor of phosphorus, opium, or other substances which exclude all doubt, are found in the stomach. Yet we feel we cannot be reproached with looking at the dark side of things when we assert that the chemical examiner should be resorted to in every case of sudden death which the inquest has not completely explained, or even in the case of a long illness which, without natural reasons, has ended in death, and this especially if any possibility of a criminal prosecution arises. When one skims through a work on medical jurisprudence and notes the numerous substances which, in relatively small doses, are capable of causing a man's death, when one remembers the uncertainty of the signs of poisoning as revealed by the history of the patient's illness and the death certificate, and when, finally, one thinks of the modern extensive diffusion of superficial chemical knowledge, and the facility with which nearly all chemical products, even the most dangerous, are procurable, one is astonished that many cases of poisoning even more difficult to discover do not occur. The investigating officer ought therefore always to pay attention to the possibilities in these cases, and considerations of money and trouble should not be allowed to enter into the question. Nor should the other side of the matter be lost sight of. Often death remains unexplained, and is believed to indicate a crime, whereby suspicion may rest for long years upon the innocent. It is the duty of the investigating officer to prevent the happening of such a state of things, just as much as it is his duty to bring about the conviction of the guilty. We are aware of a large number of substances, not venomous by nature, which, when they become tainted, are harmful or deadly. They may be absorbed through imprudence or without any one being to blame, so it is allowable to presume that these substances have caused inexplicable and suspicious deaths. But the chemist, if consulted, would clear up the matter. Take, for example, poisoning by coal gas, trichinous or tainted meat, poison developed in sausages or cheese, poisoned shellfish, oysters, lobsters, tainted fish, wine, beer, vinegar, or other articles of everyday use, in fact, the whole range of ptomaine poisons, finally, the frequent cases of poisoning through culinary utensils. The ptomaine alkaloids, for example, colodyne, lead to the most serious mistakes. They may arise entirely through the decomposition of the dead body, are often highly poisonous, and in many cases bear a great resemblance to the plant alkaloids. Their behavior under physiological tests may also lead to confusion. For full details, the reader will refer to such standard works as Lauder Brunton's Materia Medica and Blythe on Poisons. A useful working summary will be found in Legal Medicine by Major Collis Berry, IMS, Volume 1, Chapter 43. Equally important in this connection is poisoning by carbon monoxide fumes. Bruardel, De Coste, Ogier, and Hoffman relate a case in which a man was killed through gas fumes in a lime kiln. His wife, though innocent, was condemned as a murderess and remained in prison for some years. In short, every suspicious death requires minute investigation by the investigating officer. It is not sufficient merely to ask the analyst whether there be poison in such and such a stomach, without giving him any indication of the direction his researches should take. If he has no starting point, his examination becomes difficult and costly. But, if he knows all that the investigating officer has been able to learn in his inquiry, he will easily, quickly, and surely complete his share of the work. If we wish to know what the investigating officer can demand of the chemist, we should say, the investigating officer ought not to have too many scruples in this connection, especially as regards the question of time. We know that after a long space of time, the existence of certain poisons, particularly arsenic, is ascertained. Footnote. 
Proulx relates that once on the deal boards of a floor, upon which a person poisoned by arsenic had spit, arsenic was still found, although the floor had been scrubbed forty times. Phosphorus has been discovered six weeks after death. End footnote. And the interval during which organic poisons may be discovered after their absorption is never so short as is commonly believed. Sonashine and Clausen found that traces of morphia in the intestines could be discovered after eighteen months, although the corpse had been buried in circumstances favoring decomposition. It is not, therefore, for the investigating officer to decide whether too much time has elapsed since the death of the victim. Let him leave the solution of this question to conscientious and experienced experts. Moreover, the investigating officer ought not to fear, in certain circumstances, to raise the question of whether the poison has not been introduced into the body otherwise than by the mouth, but has been given perhaps in quite another manner, for example, through a wound either already existing or made on purpose. It is related, it is true, in a novel, that in a certain German military hospital, 1871, a jealous woman, who was acting as a nurse, took from the wound of a soldier on the point of death a composition of blood and pus, which she introduced into the wound of another soldier who was slightly wounded, with the object of bringing about his death. As we have stated, it is simply a story from a novel, but the thing is quite possible. Just as possible, and indeed very frequent, are cases of death caused by the prick of a poisoned needle. These wounds are made in passing, and no one pays attention to them, owing to their apparent insignificance. Such are some of the difficult questions an analyst may be asked. Besides in inquiries relating to the death of a man, the investigating officer will also have recourse to the analyst in all those cases which belong specifically to the sphere of the microscopist. The investigating officer will himself get to know by practice which of the two will be capable of solving a particular question, but if he does not know, no great harm will be done, for the specialist he asks will soon tell him that the work is the business of his colleagues. Section 5. The Expert in Physics If the medical jurisprudent cannot enlighten us, if the microscopist and chemical analyst are incapable of elucidating the matter, recourse must be had to the expert in physics. The cases in which one can and ought to approach him are legion. No one would be able to completely enumerate them. Each day brings new ones, and every zealous investigating officer, desirous of developing his knowledge, will increase them yet more. Here we will again repeat an observation already made. In order that the physicist may lend his aid to the investigating officer, the latter must ask him for it. The investigating officer it is who must go to the physicist to ask if he can help him in a given case. It is not for the physicist to come and offer his services to the investigating officer. The expert in physics studies, experiments, discovers, and publishes, it is for the investigating officer to read, weigh, and question. The investigating officer ought then to recall his former knowledge, generally at once forgotten, which has accompanied him from college into practical life. He should try to complete it and keep it in touch with modern science by reading at least the reviews which always teach the reader something about the new results in various natural sciences and the services rendered by them and also, as it is his duty to inquire of everything he sees and hears, how it may be utilized in his profession, and he can utilize all science, so he ought never, in reading these reviews, to forget to ask what advantage may be gained from what he has just read. He must attempt to imagine practical cases in which he could call in the expert in physics to utilize the new results of the science. In real cases, when they arise, he will certainly remember his meditations and call in the physicist. Indeed, we require that the physicist, as well as all other experts, should interest himself in his business, 
when he has been often questioned and knows approximately what the investigating officer requires he ought to make inquiries on his own initiative and draw the attention of the investigating officer to the information which he is able to furnish and of which the investigating officer is ignorant in the following pages we shall enumerate a few cases in which the physicist can second the investigating officer confining ourselves to general indications and contenting ourselves with citing some examples we simply wish to demonstrate that the physicist in many cases is really capable of giving us information and enlightenment footnote the authors would be very happy to receive communications regarding cases in which the investigating officer has been aided by experts in natural philosophy End note. speaking generally it may be stated the physicist must always be called in when it is important to determine the effect of the natural forces which have exercised any influence upon a matter within the purview of the penal code it goes without saying that every man is capable of determining this effect but the scientist can better observe it and with more accuracy and justice especially in cases requiring special knowledge such as those involving calculations and the use of scientific appliances let us presume for example that the fact of an article having been thrown has become of some importance in a criminal case a stone has been hurled against a window wall or upon a roof the questions now are to establish the spot where the person who threw it was standing the force with which he threw it the size and weight of the stone the direction in which it ricocheted the time at which the event took place and many other similar questions true it is that any one can draw such conclusions and make such observations any one that is to say who has two good eyes at his disposal and who has not forgotten what he has at other times learned concerning ballistics or the science of calculating the force with which things are projected but with what accuracy and correctness will not a man do this who all his life has been occupied with the study of these questions and who comes armed with all the special knowledge required for such a case where an outsider sees nothing useful the specialist perhaps observes all that is necessary to clear up the case the same may be said of a large series of optical questions when for example it is desired to know how a light effect has been produced what has been its action what amount of light has been necessary for the perpetration of determinate acts how a certain shadow has been produced how far it has stretched what object has caused it at what moment of the day the sun has produced such and such an effect or at what hour in the night the moon has shone in a particular manner and a thousand other questions in a recent case in the cutapa district a man who was attacked in the night was said to have been lying on his left side on a cot facing the northern and open side of a shavadi or shed the foot of his cot being a few feet from its eastern wall it was alleged the stabbing took place about midnight and just as soon as the moon was rising the injured man stating in the witness box that he was lying awake and quote, watching the moon rise end quote, when his assailants came up and attacked him and therefore he recognized them no one in court was able positively to say whether at that time of the year he could possibly have seen the moon which if his story was true must have been a very northerly one had this witness's story not been completely broken down and found to be false in other directions it is probable that he would have been believed when he asserted that he saw the moon rising it would have been impossible to have adjourned the case which was a sessions one to a date upon which the moon would have been in an equivalent position and it is very doubtful whether any physicist could have been summoned for that trial but had the investigating officer taken the precaution of verifying beforehand the man's story by communicating with an expert in natural philosophy there would have been no such difficulty as was raised in this trial upon this point other information relating to the sun may also be of great importance 
whether, for example, the sun has been able to give a certain amount of heat, and at what moment of the day, and what accessory circumstances must be taken into account, whether the rays of the sun can have fallen at a particular hour of the day upon a glass of water, so as to make a sort of burning glass, whether the heat of the sun can have changed the shape of certain objects, for example, by shriveling them up, breaking them, causing them to split or expand. Other questions concerning the effect of light are, how long a piece of cloth must have been exposed to the heat of the sun in order to fade to a certain degree, how long it would take for a piece of paper, especially the modern kinds of paper which are full of ligneous material, to become yellow or brown with exposure to the sun's rays, or how long an object must have remained in the daylight to have undergone a certain transformation, etc. As regards drafts, the wind, and storms, very important questions may arise, whether, for example, during a fire, it is the wind or a draft caused by the heat which has carried a piece of burning straw or a wooden tile, shingle. What direction of the wind may be deduced from such or such circumstances, whether a particular object has been able to resist the hurricane, that is to say, in attempting to fix the time of its having been placed in position, was it in existence before the tempest, the time of which is known? Questions concerning rain and snow are at times more important still. What has been produced by their agency, from what direction they have come, how often it has rained upon a certain article, etc., in this connection, also, we have the effects of frost, which are of a determinate character, and may lend force to certain suppositions. It may be asked whether a particular object has been acted upon by frost, and with what force, and how often. Also, what other atmospheric phenomena have acted upon the body in question, and what has been the duration of the action. To this category also belong the following questions. A stolen object has been hidden and discovered. Has it been buried? And if so, wrapped up or not? And for how long? What was the nature of the soil? Were there other articles with it? The manner of their preservation, especially when not in the air, sometimes alters them, and these alterations are especially noticeable in objects of delicate color and structure, so that the physicist may often draw conclusions of great importance. There is yet another and well-known branch of the physicist's business, namely cases concerning the effect and properties of water. Has an article been in the water, and if so, for what length of time? Has it been carried along by running water or sunk to the bottom? If the latter, what is the nature of the bottom? How far has the article been carried by the water, and what was the nature of the current? How long must it have taken a body of given weight, shape, and size to traverse a given distance? When the banks are irregular and covered with vegetation, it may be necessary to make detailed and accurate trials and experiments. Other questions are the effect of water upon banks or flooded places, and the length of time such places have been covered. Investigations concerning corpses found in the water are particularly important. It is necessary, for example, to establish the successive conditions of the corpse in the water, where it has gone, whence it has come, what obstacles and currents it has traversed, etc. All such questions are within the sphere not of the medical man, but of the physicist. See Chapter 16, Section 5, Bodily Injuries. To this domain also belong inquiries regarding the effect of artificial heat, apart from actual burns on the body, when it is desired, for example, to establish the length of time an object has been exposed to a more or less severe heat, and the kind of heat, that is, whether produced by a particular stove, as by an ordinary cooking stove, or a special furnace. Other examinations should also be enumerated bearing on breakages, tears, splits, or scratches on all sorts of articles when desirous of knowing their direction, as also the time and manner of their production, whether, for example, naturally or artificially. 
This information is often of the greatest importance, and can only be obtained where the observer is intelligent, knows the exact nature of the damaged article, and how to appreciate the value of other phenomena accompanying the deterioration, such as direction, force, time, etc. This is heavy work, especially in giving advice on a case of negligence and the damage resulting therefrom, railway accidents, explosions, fall of buildings, landslips, etc. In such cases, minute examination of secondary details, for example a split screw, intricate calculations, and a penetrating eye are alone capable of elucidating the truth. Let us finally take a passing glance at those two great motive forces of our times, magnetism and electricity. The least service magnetism renders us is the discovery of iron in cases where a chemical examination is not possible for some reason or other. As for electricity, we do not yet know all the services it can render, and how far it will go, or exactly what results the electrician will some day be able to afford us in criminal matters. Speaking generally, the investigating officer ought not to forget that in many ways his work resembles that of the physicist, especially when he has to draw conclusions from the effects he finds upon articles. In dealing with such effects, he must determine the forces producing them, just as the physicist explains the phenomena of nature. If, then, the investigating officer questions a physicist in a general way, the latter, finding himself in his own domain, will perhaps not confine himself to the questions asked, but in his turn will raise further questions which the investigating officer has overlooked. In forgeries also, as to ink, paper, writing materials, files of documents, etc., the physicist can afford the chemist and the microscopist important help obtainable in no other direction. End of section 33。section 34 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him Continued. Section 6. Experts in Mineralogy, Zoology, and Botany. Experts in mineralogy and zoology are but little consulted by the investigating officer. The former is only utilized for the examination of minerals and to establish their particular properties, or he aids the microscopist when, for example, it is necessary to determine the nature of a mineral so as to deduce therefrom the origin of dust, dirt, or stains, etc., and indeed these are often important points for elucidation. The role of the zoologist is scarcely more extended. He can determine the nature and origin of animal wool, assist in forming a judgment upon blood globules, determine the functions of certain animals, tell us what they are capable of doing and producing, give us information concerning poisons proceeding from animals, aid the medical man in many histological, anatomical, and physiological cases, and thus complement the latter's knowledge. We must repeat that nowhere is there greater danger than when we neglect to call in the expert and ourselves dabble in the matter. No doubt the layman who observes closely will discover something and form correct conclusions, but the true working insight is only to be obtained and judged by the expert. The zoologist finds important employment when the question arises of how long a man lying in the open has been dead, under what conditions animal life of various sorts, especially insects, appear at different times upon every corpse. If the death does not take place in the cold part of the year, certain flies at once appear, somewhat latter certain beetles, etc., are found, until at last, sometimes after many months, certain animals bring about the final work of destruction of the non-osseous parts. 
in such circumstances zoologists can often afford important and reliable information finally some known attributes of animals are of importance it is only necessary to consider this and consult a zoologist so once in a certain case it was desired to know how many hours a drunken man had lain in water at first it was said that he could only have been there one or two hours because in his clothes live fleas were still found on account of the importance of the case inquiries were made and it was discovered that fleas can live as long as sixteen hours under water flies spiders caterpillars etc die much more quickly under water it is for the botanist to play the greatest role he can indicate poisonous or abortive plants discovering the smallest pieces he can determine the nature of powdered substances composed of plants seeds and fruits he can study the juices of these plants and the preparations made therefrom these indications are often important especially when such vegetable matter is discovered in a house search or upon the person or in the stomach and intestines of deceased persons or in the matter vomited or passed by them it must not be forgotten that the smallest atom of leaf the most minute piece of bark or fiber suffices for the botanist to recognize the entire plant it is often of equally great interest to know how to determine the nature and origin of a piece of wood with the assistance of a small piece which has been found when for example it is desired to indicate whether a splinter of wood comes from a weapon instrument utensil post or living tree etc or when the nature of the piece of wood may tell us the locality where a certain person or object is to be found the place whence it has come and the objects with which it has been in contact the botanist is also sometimes able to tell the age of an injury to a living plant its aspect before healing up the way in which it has been made and the instrument employed he may be able to tell us the force which must have been used to produce on a piece of dead wood such and such a mutilation or change the time when a leaf or a fruit must have been damaged for example by a shot from a firearm the place of origin of certain pieces of plant etc the shape of an instrument which has produced such and such a cut or mark on a piece of wood discovery of the traces of a clean cut by a knife demonstrating the absence of a toothed saw the intervention of the botanist may be of special importance in obtaining information regarding certain textile fibers for example in determining the nature of the fiber flax hemp jute cotton in identifying threads and parts of threads twine ordinary thread etc in studying the effect of certain liquids paints acids or alkalis etc upon vegetable fibers change in shape length color and aspect in determining the age of textile fibers and the place where they have remained including such questions as the age of a cord whether a piece of string has been for a long time in the water whether a piece of linen cloth has been exposed to great heat or whether some cotton stuff has been buried a whole series of questions are connected with the chemical and physical properties of vegetable matter in these cases the botanist should work with the microscopist the chemist and the physicist such questions are the absorption of gas odor and fumes by vegetable fibers the explosive properties of flax hemp and jute dust the spontaneous combustion of vegetable fibers impregnated with oil tow flax thread engineer's waste etc the hidden combustion of ignited fibers saltpeter treatment the duration and certainty of the combustion of materials composing wicks arson explosions the dangerous combustible properties of celluloid the spontaneous combustion of damp hay newly carbonized paper or vegetable carbon the proof of the existence of the juice of plants upon metals for example on a knife which has been used to cut fresh plants or fruit or upon garments for example stains made by grass upon coats and the age and the origin of such stains it is permissible to assert that the botanist may come to our assistance in the most difficult important and interesting cases section seven 
The Expert in Firearms As indicated above, the examination of firearms requires, more than anything else, the assistance of a whole series of different experts. As a rule, only a gunsmith is called in, but this the author considers a mistake. Nowadays, local gunsmiths no longer exist as in former times. They are as rare as the local clockmakers of old. For both the local gunsmith and clockmaker sell instruments they have received ready-made from the factory. At the most, they have only placed the various parts of the instrument together and know how to do certain repairs. The firearm and the watch are made only in the factory and the merchant or shopkeeper cannot be expected to understand in a special manner their interior mechanism. Even when dealing with a gunsmith who knows his trade, we find his knowledge restricted in most cases to being able to indicate the origin and the price of the weapon, the names of its different parts and other mechanical details, which, it must be confessed, will have in most cases a certain value but he will not be able to say much regarding the use to which the instrument may be put, the effects which it is capable of producing, the connection existing between the arm itself and the bullet employed, besides numerous other questions of capital importance. Recourse must therefore be had to the experienced sportsman, the medical man, the inspector of musketry, the physicist, the chemist, and the microscopist, in many other cases, moreover, where the question is to determine the effect of a bullet on different substances, yet other experts who are conversant with these substances must be questioned. In many cases, experts consulted by the author have been unable to give a satisfactory reply when an ordinary workman has answered without hesitation. The dresser of stone can tell us the resistance of the various kinds of stone, the locksmith can explain to us how a certain effect has been produced upon iron, and the botanist can indicate with accuracy the time and the season at which a bullet has struck a living tree and lodged in the wood. As regards the practical method of procedure in examining experts, care must be taken not to allow the different experts to make their experiments at the same time and give their advice together. The investigating officer who is directing the inquiry easily loses a concise view of the case when one expert draws conclusions from one side and another from the other side. It is difficult to understand the work of each, and it is impossible to reconcile the different statements and the conclusions given upon the whole. He must therefore, before all, obtain a clear idea of how the various experts are best to be consulted, and arrange to question after the others those experts who with their experiments destroy in part the documents and material objects at his disposal. Once the experiments are made and the reports sent in, the investigating officer will be able, following the case and the results of the reports, to bring the experts together either all at once or in several categories, in this way, he will perhaps find the agreement or the explanation of doubtful questions or questions resolved in different ways. When the experts are already au courant with the matter and know what they have to reply, they will agree together much more readily than if they have been allowed to work together from the outset. This method of procedure has yet another advantage. Important corpora delicti, serving as objects of conviction, are less exposed to being lost or injured when they are sent but to one or two experts at a time, instead of in the space of a quarter of an hour being passed through a great number of hands. Besides examination regarding the origin of a firearm, the effects produced thereby, the mode of its employment, and its connection with such and such bullets, etc., questions relating to the science of arms properly so called, and besides those questions which it is within the province of the medical jurisprudent to decide, there are yet other examinations of decisive effect which are within the competence of the chemist. Suppose, for example, it is desired to establish whether a bullet has been taken from a stock of bullets found upon a suspected individual, it will certainly not suffice to establish that it is of the same size, the same shape, the same caliber, and the same weight as the others. It is also necessary to prove that their chemical composition is identical. 
Pure lead is but rarely employed for the making of bullets, tin, zinc, antimony, bismuth, and arsenic being mixed therewith, even traces of silver may be found. If then the quantitative analysis of the chemist shows that the alloy is the same in both cases, this will be a decisive proof of identity. This examination may also be of great interest in many other cases. If, for example, we have the firearm of the suspected individual and a bullet, and if the weapon be coated with fresh lead inside, it is for the chemist to withdraw this lead from the barrel and analyze it as he has analyzed the bullet. If then the analysis of the bullet corresponds with that of the lead in the firearm, it may reasonably be presumed that that particular bullet has been fired from that particular firearm, especially if the composition of the lead is uncommon or contains an abnormal proportion of some other element. Even when it is impossible to make these two analyses and compare the results, as for instance when we possess only the bullet, it is well to submit the latter to chemical examination. This may furnish the proof of a composition but little used, which, in default of other clues, may perhaps afford some indication regarding the author of the crime. If the bullet has not been manufactured by the man himself, but has been made in some factory, its chemical composition may very well lead to the discovery of its place of manufacture, for in this industry the same alloy is not everywhere employed. Finally, in certain circumstances, there may be traces of powder upon the bullet, which, chemically analyzed, are capable of giving an indication regarding the explosive which has been used. Such traces sometimes remain upon a bullet, even when it is lodged in the human body. They are clearly distinguishable upon the French bullet, which the author's grandfather carried behind his eye for forty-six years, from 1799 to 1845, and which was only extracted after his death. Chemical analysis may be of the greatest importance when it is desired to know when or how long before a certain firearm has been fired. The investigating officer does not naturally have to deal with the manner in which such an examination must be made, an examination which, however, is very curious in that it can only indicate whether the weapon has been fired off a very short time before. The Mofusil investigating officer would therefore be very much behind time if he thought of sending the firearm to the capital for this analysis. Sonnenschein and Clausen, in their Handbook of Legal Chemistry, indicate the following process. It is so simple that it may be employed, if necessary, even in the country by any doctor or hospital assistant, and frequently brings to light decisive results. It is true that this process can only be employed if the explosive has consisted of the ordinary powder which still remains in common use. The firearm in question must be withdrawn as soon as possible from the action of the air. For this purpose, the barrel is hermetically corked, and the breech wrapped up in cloth. The examination must be carried out as soon as possible. First, the discharged barrel is rinsed with distilled water, and the solution obtained, filtered, and examined for sulfuric acid, with barium chloride, alkaline sulfides, with salts of lead, and salts of iron, with ferrocyanide of potassium. Let us presume that the barrel is dark brown, contains neither rust nor green crystals of ferrous sulfate, and that the solution is light yellow in color, smells of sulfuretted hydrogen, and with salts of lead gives a black precipitate. It follows that the firearm must have been fired within two hours. If the color is clearer still, and there is neither rust nor crystals, but traces of sulfuric acid are discovered, more than two hours, but less than twenty-four hours, must have passed since the moment the weapon was fired. If the barrel has numerous stains of oxide of iron, and the reagent proves the existence of iron in the water, the weapon has been fired at least twenty-four hours before, and at most within five days. If the oxide of iron is in large quantity, but no iron salts are found in the solution, at least ten days, and at most fifty days, have elapsed. If the firearm, after having been fired, has been immediately reloaded, without having been cleaned, the cylindrical portion of the pull-through, or the cleaning rod, 
has a dark gray color during the first four days, and during the following days it is a yellowish gray, and the water contains distinct traces of sulfuric acid. If the weapon has been cleaned before being loaded the second time, the color is light red or yellow ochre during the first two days, during the following days becomes dark red, and after twelve to fifteen days becomes and remains gray. The powder will have a light red color owing to the oxide of iron attaching thereto, and the reagent will show no signs of sulfuric acid. If the firearm has been reloaded immediately after firing, the color will be green, but will quickly attain that described above. If the barrel be rinsed with lime water, red coloring will also be noticed. Finally, if the wad is of paper containing alum or plaster, and the reagent shows the presence of sulfuric acid in the water with which the wad is washed, it proves nothing. In all cases, we also recommend the examination of the bullet with a magnifying glass. Information is then obtained about the number, pitch, shape, and depth of the rifling, the substance and structure of the wad which has left traces upon the lead, upon the manner in which the muzzle loader has been loaded, and upon many other points of importance. End of section 34《セクション35of Criminal Investigation Volume 1》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Robney《Criminal Investigation》A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers Volume 1 by Hans Gross Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam the expert and how to make use of him continued section eight handwriting as to the value to be placed upon the appreciation of manuscripts the most divergent opinions exist some have made a science of it and yet do not know how to sufficiently appreciate the results of their examination while others consider the knowledge so many persons pretend to possess as the mere product of the imagination or at least of gross exaggeration no lawyer is obliged to form a decision on one side or the other but he must take up a position on the subject and form an opinion upon it whether he believes in the study of graphology or not before however a lawyer decides this finally we should advise him to give the matter some consideration no sooner do we in a matter of human knowledge establish a certainty and assign limits to it no matter how wide those limits may be than we may find that knowledge cannot be thus limited in other words all knowledge is capable of development how far we do not know none will deny that it is worth while for all educated persons to form some opinion on graphology at least every one will allow that the writing of an uneducated peasant looks different to the writing of an educated lady that the child does not write like the old man that the writing of a farmhand will not be mistaken for that of a learned man however as soon as one has gone so far one has confessed that there is such a thing as graphology in fact one has acknowledged the principles of it to be correct if one goes further speaks of a copied pedantic interesting fickle nervous or energetic handwriting and recognizes the writing of the aristocratic lady the soldier the merchant the scholar one has gone a long way in the rudiments of graphology and would act inconsequently as is done by people prejudiced against graphology by declaring that the things established were not capable of a wider and more scientific development if data in greater number were collected if more cautious and more accurate experiments were made then it would be possible to individualize generalize and establish rules thus leading to the increase of knowledge a knowledge which must inevitably go very far that graphology when more exactly and scientifically studied can be brought to a more workable knowledge no one can well doubt that there is a line in some subjects beyond which we cannot go is easy to see would any one for example maintain that chiromancy the study of the connection between the lines of the hand and the fate of the criminal should be advanced to a science no earnest man would maintain that for the little we know of it chiromancy is anything but doubtful and where there is absolutely no truth there can be no development but as regards graphology there are acknowledged facts 
and it is therefore permissible to think that it is capable of development as early as the seventeenth century a work on the subject appeared namely the ideographia prosperi aldorisi by camillo boldo at the beginning of the eighteenth century an anonymous book was published in paris styled the art of judging the character of men by their handwriting gotha and lavater were interested in the subject and heinze who for a considerable time published appreciations of manuscripts in the leipzig illustrated journal also wrote a volume called di chirogramma tamonti other well-known experts have also written on the subject as for example Mikons, erlenmeyer etc dr schultz published in eighteen eighty one writing and its distinctive characteristics zamali mendius machmer and many others have also written treatises from which the investigating officer can learn many things which will help him in his profession the latest and perhaps the best work on the subject is aims on forgery its detection and illustration published in boston massachusetts u s a in nineteen o one we may say at once that there are few people so well fitted to be handwriting experts as investigating officers themselves ames in the work just cited states the expert is the man who knows and he then proceeds to briefly consider the lines of study and experience calculated to confer the highest order of skill upon a handwriting expert first the study and practice of handwriting as a teacher and the constant observation criticism and suggestion to learners afforded by such an occupation second the preparation of publications devoted to writing and other phases of penmanship involving the careful preparation of models for the engraver and the critical scrutiny of plate reproductions of such models third the preparation of critical and technical literary and scientific instructions for the student of penmanship fourth the accumulated experience arising from previous examinations of disputed writing and the multiplied precedents of court opinions rulings and the verdicts of juries in cases on which the expert has been previously employed fifth the occupation of an engraver or lithographer where the frequent reproduction of handwriting and especially autographs is involved the careful drawing of his models upon the plates prior to engraving and the critical comparison between models and reproductions lead to nice distinctions and the detection of delicate personal or individual characteristics six the constant professional observation of handwriting in any line of financial or commercial business tends to confer skill it should be said here however that the average bank cashier or teller bases his opinions and his identifications generally upon the pictorial effect without recourse to those minute and more delicate points upon which the skilled expert rightly places the greatest reliance such testimony cannot be compared for accuracy or value with that of the scientific investigator of handwriting it follows then that one who is endowed with more than ordinary acuteness of observation and has had an experience so varied and extensive as to cover most of these lines is likely to be best fitted for critical and reliable expert work it will be seen that an investigating officer of experience and intelligence and we are entitled to presume that a person in the position of an investigating officer is a man of experience and intelligence must at least have followed the fourth line of preparation laid down by ames a study of the books above mentioned will as we have said be of great service to the investigating officer but more important still are observation and personal study followed with zeal and regularity which will convince investigating officers that examination of handwriting has nowadays become a science the examination of manuscripts is of value to the investigating officer in two ways it enables him in the first place to know his men and next renders it possible for him to solve the preliminary question namely are the presumptions sufficient to assume that two writings are identical and to warrant the employment of an expert on the subject an investigating officer is in a better position than any one else to obtain the knowledge necessary for this not only has he to examine many writings but he nearly always comes to know the author of them he can therefore verify the conclusions he has arrived at on examining writing by personal dealings with the writer every criminal record offers from this point of view ample material in the notes and signatures of the investigating officers colleagues and clerks and the signatures and writings of witnesses and accused persons and often also in letters and other documents forming part of the papers in a case sufficient material is to be found 
all that is necessary is for the investigating officer to take an interest in the subject and it must be presumed that every zealous investigating officer does so the course to be followed is not difficult to point out the writing must be studied and an attempt made to read all that can be read in it the results obtained must then be compared with all the information obtainable from other sources as regards the individual in question and finally one must try to find out when things are not clear how and where a mistaken judgment has been formed all this indeed is easy to say but the work itself requires much time and trouble though these are largely compensated by the interesting results obtained as regards the first part of the work it is necessary to proceed in the most methodical way in the first place it is necessary to become familiar with old forms of letters generally used by old people who have learned them many years before but in doing so it must not be forgotten that the employment of such forms is no absolute proof that the writer is an old person certain persons who have an old writing master and whose character is not very independent often employ for long afterwards or even throughout their whole lives the letters they have first learned there are also people who have taken to the habit of using antiquated letters out of sympathy for the archaic or for an old person in the same way there are old people who have preserved their youthful character and who like to do everything as young people do they follow the fashions of the day they reject the old letters as they would an old-fashioned garment and adopt new forms of letters as soon as they come in but this is exceptional and as a general rule people do not change the writing to which they have become accustomed especially when well advanced in life aim cites two cases of character reading from handwriting which show what store he lays by fashion in writing he states as follows not long since the writer was present with a party of ladies and gentlemen where the reading of character from handwriting was the subject under discussion when one of the ladies took from her pocket two letters and handing them to him asked an expression of his opinion respecting their authors inspecting one of them he said the writer was upward of sixty years of age a careful methodical experienced business man and probably the head of some corporation or large business inspecting the writing of the other letter he said the writer of this is between thirty and forty years of age a keen active man of affairs probably the secretary or chief clerk of a corporation or a large business house the lady who had solicited the opinion at once clapped her hands exclaiming that nothing could be more truthful adding that the one was president of a savings and loan company and the other was secretary of a corporation now she said i would just like to have you explain to me how you could tell that the reply was taking the first one here is a strong clear legible and practised hand very methodical without blot change or erasure from beginning to end and it is written in a round-shaped hand which must have been learned more than forty-five years ago as that school of writing has not been taught in this country within that period this with the dignified deliberate appearance of the writing fixes his age at over sixty years while the practised style of writing indicates a large experience in the business world the good judgment taste and accuracy manifested in the writing show corresponding traits in business while the concise clear and intelligent statement of the subject matter is indicative of an able lucid and comprehensive grasp of business affairs as to the other letter he said this is an elegant spencerian hand which must have been learned at a much more recent date and hence by a younger man it is written with great facility indicating young and trained muscles in immediate practice and the composition and subject matter is such as to indicate a mind trained and familiar with the business world here therefore is a man not above medium life and possessed of the requisite qualifications for the active duties of the secretary or chief clerk of some large business enterprise having determined this outside question the next thing to be done is to see whether the writing examined is by one who writes little or much this presents no difficulty and though it may not be easy to express in words what is meant by a running hand every one knows how to distinguish an awkward heavy and embarrassed script from a free practised and flowing one this is exceptionally easy in the vernacular languages of india where penmanship is a profession and the curse of script of the ready writer is so totally different from the laboured handwriting of a man who is accustomed to do little more than sign his name or address a postcard but the result of this is of great importance for hereby whole groups of persons may be eliminated 
and it may be once for all decided that the writing in question is not that of a person belonging to such and such a group a more difficult question is to discover the sex of the writer yet even when one is not accustomed to examining writing one may in the majority of cases make this distinction without mistake a little experience and practice will soon make it almost impossible to commit an error and herein lies the groundwork of much success for when one has obtained a certain sureness one will be also able to discover feminine traits in the handwriting of a man and masculine traits in that of a woman which will always materially contribute towards the characterization of an individual the next problem concerns mainly the exterior forms of the writing and consists in classifying the writing of men according to their professions thus it is easy to recognize the rapid light uniform and legible writing of the tradesmen the writing of learned men usually presents this peculiarity that although often very illegible the characters bear a certain resemblance to print the reason probably being that owing to his continual reading the writing of a savant begins to bear a certain likeness to print the writing of soldiers is more like that of tradespeople but it is clearer and more energetic more sure of itself the writing of civil servants and other officials can as a rule only be described as filthy the schoolmaster who finds himself obliged to set beautiful copies to his scholars is incapable of permitting himself the luxury of a writing of his own even in everyday life he still writes copies finally medical men who are always busy write their letters very much like their prescriptions nationality moreover is brought out in handwriting a frenchman or an american writes like no other person and when one studies their handwriting carefully one comes to the conclusion that a man with the national character of a real frenchman or a real yankee could not possibly write otherwise than he actually does write of course there are exceptions but one is tempted to agree with dr friedrich schultz who says when a professor writes like a copyist and a merchant like an artist they have missed their vocation no doubt here also secondary influences must be considered the imitation of the writing of a revered person for example one's father or in india one's school teacher the imitation of some strange hand or other which one has found convenient pretty or original heredity also plays its role in this matter as well as certain physical conditions of the body short-sighted people write as a rule very minutely but all the secondary influences act either only upon the purely exterior phenomena size of writing distance between the lines etc or else they indicate certain qualities of character spirit of imitation want of personality etc to know how to distinguish these peculiarities of character is the most difficult as it is the most important operation in examining handwriting we write not only with the hand but also with the brain says schultz and in this he is right another experienced graphologist states writing is not a mere chimerical art but is an outburst of the heart an exponent of life and character more reliable than the delineations of the countenance to the physiognomist the most difficult thing to do is to compare not the writings of persons of different character but those of the same person in different moods with much reason the various signatures of napoleon are usually cited in this connection few men have experienced so strongly as he the whole gamut of impressions few men have seen so many events as he eighteen o four third december eighteen o five eighteen o six twenty first september eighteen twelve sixth october eighteen twelve thirteenth october eighteen thirteen abdication fourth april eighteen fourteen st helena what changes of destiny what changes in disposition what changes in writing the study of these eight signatures is more instructive than a whole shelf full of books it seems quite impossible to confound the dates of the various signatures and mistake those of the zenith of the fortunes of bonaparte for that made by him at st helena we need not deal with peculiarities of handwriting which are the outcome of an illness such cases are for the medical man it is the duty of an investigating officer to question a doctor whenever he finds extraordinary phenomena in the handwriting of an accused such phenomena are for example letters and words in the wrong place inability to transcribe words and writing without making mistakes peculiar and disused forms of letters letters and words which can easily be confused in short anything unusual and unnatural 
There is no doubt that many brain diseases, for example paralysis, are discoverable in writing long before any trace of the infirmity is otherwise noticeable. It is important for the lawyer to remember that stutterers, when they are idiots, write as they speak. In the first place, they frequently make needless and incomprehensible scratchings in the middle of the writing, and in the second place, they leave out letters. For example, for the frog is green, they write, the fog is green. In anonymous, threatening, insulting, and stupid letters, and writings received from idiots, such lapses alone frequently betray them. There are also certain exterior phenomena not so difficult to determine, the influence of which upon writing is very important for investigating officers. They may be easily discovered if one has at one's disposal, for purposes of comparison, one or several specimens of the writing of a man when these influences have not been acting. But they may also be determined when one has no such independent writing with which to compare the matter under examination. That a writing has been dictated may be established by the presence of certain faults, which could only exist through words having been badly heard, or because the writing and spelling show a degree of culture inferior to that of the wording of the document, and above all, because it is evident that the writing has been done without thinking. What this means can hardly be expressed in words, but it may be understood by examining a writing which one is certain has taken much trouble to execute. It will be noticed that there is a particular connection between the writing and the work of the mind which is always missing in a writing which has been dictated. The same may be said of a copy which, as a rule, is more carefully done than a writing done straight away. Corrections are few and the writing has a certain appearance of completion. The same is also noteworthy in forgeries which have the character of copies owing to the way in which the pen is dipped in the ink. Let us first consider a piece of dictation or a rough draft having no erasures and written right off with no considerable pauses for reflection. When writing with the same pen and the same ink, etc., each time a dip is taken, the same quantity of ink is taken on the pen and about the same number of words written. When the ink on the pen is nearly done, the letters become paler and are clearly distinguishable from the other and blacker letters. But nervous and excitable persons do not wait till there is no more ink on the pen. They take more ink long before they need, thus betraying by the total absence of pale places their state of nervous excitability. The paler parts may be easily discovered with a magnifying glass, and once found, we know when the writer has dipped his pen in the ink. These places should then be marked and the letters written with each dip counted. If the number of letters between the dips is almost identical, the writing may be presumed to have been written at once or from dictation. The writer has dipped his pen in the ink at the moment when there was no more ink on it to go on with. But if a noticeable difference be found between the number of letters in each group, the counting must be continued. Let us suppose that the number of letters in several groups is the same and that all at once the number becomes very much greater. The conclusion to be drawn is that the writing has been interrupted as, for example, for reflection. He has stopped writing when there was still ink on his pen. He has then reflected or taken a pull at his pipe or his peg redipped his pen in the ink and started writing again, so that there are no pale letters at that particular place, and the distance between the two pale places is therefore considerable. Of course, a person dictating may also make pauses, but the dictated matter has other characteristic signs which prevent any confusion. These remarks do not, of course, apply to those who use fountain pens. It is quite otherwise with a copy. The copyist dips his pen not only when he needs ink, but also frequently does so on reading over and assimilating portions of the matter he is copying. If a person be observed while copying, it will be noticed that he takes more ink whenever he begins a new paragraph, though he does not really require it. The consequence is that pale places are either entirely wanting in a copy or come at every irregular intervals. As regards very exact copies as, for example, in imitating a writing, the personal experience of the author is that pale places do not exist at all. The forger makes each stroke slowly, one after the other, or else but one or two at a time, looking at the model continually as he does so. He therefore takes advantage of these natural pauses to dip his pen in the ink, with the result that pale letters do not exist at all. Another phenomenon, the effect of which is also not difficult to recognize, 
consists in haste or marked carefulness haste in writing is characterized by large irregular letters with the angles round rather than sharp the writing quickly loses its primary direction straight writing becomes sloping and sloping writing straight the distance between the lines is irregular the final strokes of the words especially at the end of a paragraph are elongated and the position of the writing on the page is not observed as may be seen from the margins at the top bottom and sides of the paper converse phenomena may be observed in writing where special care has been exercised the first thing to notice is that a new pen has been taken on beginning to write the letters written therewith being unmistakably sharp and fine the writing is much smaller the angles of the letters more pronounced the full slopes around that is do not tail towards the right the paragraphs are well separated from one another in short the exterior form of the writing has been carefully attended to a person who is forging a document finds it necessary to take special care over each detail and the more he attempts to hide this care the more it is betrayed his desire is to make believe that he is writing with a running hand when in fact he is taking the greatest trouble in the world an individual who is capable of falsifying a writing so that it really has the appearance of a running hand knows his business au fond and is a past master in the art of forgery but every imperfection in his writing will at once reveal a contradiction although at first it may be difficult to say in what it consists only after further consideration will it be possible to say the writing is by a running hand and yet it is not so once this result is attained the answer to the puzzle is clear the writing is made to pass for a running hand but has not in fact been written with a running hand it is much the same with a transcript it is generally carefully done and there are few corrections but the whole has a certain stiff appearance end of section thirty five recording by andrea rovney weatherford texas Section 36 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The expert and how to make use of him continued as important and moreover not difficult to recognize is when a person has written under conditions different from those to which he is accustomed we all write quite differently when sitting at home at our own desk and using our own writing materials undergoing no strange influence than we do than with a wretched office pen we have to sign our name on our feet bending over unaccustomed paper to find out such derangement in accustomed habits it is unnecessary to proceed to comparison one has only to note the form of the letters to become convinced that the writer is accustomed to use the pen but at the same time that the whole writing shows a certain awkwardness it is of course true that if a person is not a practiced writer it will be very difficult to say whether or not he has written in normal conditions this is very common in india in the case of signatories and witnesses who frequently can write only their names and a few common words the most important thing that an investigating officer can extract from a writing is in every case the character of an individual to be able to do so is partly a matter of natural disposition and partly a matter of experience in the following pages the author will point out how this experience may be acquired and will consider in a general way the value attaching to handwriting and how it ought to be appreciated persons who are convinced that the examination of handwriting is able to give information on a number of matters and who seriously desire to undertake the study of this science will be well advised to proceed methodically as to those who only wish to study the subject superficially they will pass by on one side all that is of real fascination in the pursuit 
in proceeding methodically the learner must first make a collection of manuscripts of persons whose character age occupation etc are well known to him these manuscripts should be taken one by one and read ad hoc i e with the intention of finding some definite peculiarity for example in an old man's writing everything which may be considered as the result of age such as antiquated expressions trembling script awkwardness archaic forms of letters etc all such indications will be noted and similar peculiarities searched for first in manuscripts written by person of the same age and afterwards in all the others at one's disposal if in the latter phenomena are also met with which one has so far believed to be the signs of advanced years one will try to find out the reason for their existence in the writing of the younger persons and will leave on one side all the characteristics not specially belonging to the writing of old persons if later one comes into possession of another of these latter mentioned writings it will be verified with respect to these characteristics and the new data obtained will be added to the list already commenced this register will undergo many alterations new distinctive signs will often be discovered but on the other hand peculiarities also found in the handwriting of young persons will continue to crop up and must be struck out of the list the same procedure will be followed in making lists from every imaginable point of view from the point of view of age sex size nationality position profession occupation intellectual condition natural disposition benevolence or penuriousness boldness or timidity morality inclinations qualities character physical and mental organization situation in life and often the intention of a writer in sum all those quantities which go to make up human nature and this work will be double in the first place the point of departure will be the writer and the writing must be searched for signs of some special tendencies really forming part of the character of an individual we know for instance that he is a weak man and we look for indications of a weak character in the writing when we believe we have discovered such signs they must be noted and accurately verified as was done when drawing up the list of distinctive signs of old age in the second place our point of departure will be the writing itself and in it we will try to discover everything that can be discovered and verify it until the results arrived at coincide with those we have obtained from our study of the individual when this work has been practiced for some time the result obtained may be that the information concerning the individual will not correspond with the indications drawn from the writing but at the same time it will be found that it is not the latter indications but the former that are inaccurate writing never lies and it will prove our former opinion to have been fallacious after having examined in this way all the manuscripts at one's disposal it is necessary to group them we should compare them keeping in view the questions of age sex special peculiarities and finally the kind of manuscript hurried notes careful work etc as soon as a grouping from a particular point of view has been made the writings should be attentively examined for such common characters as may be easily remembered it is in the highest degree suggestive and interesting to make and study such groups and manuscripts when one has begun to become interested in this kind of work one soon gives one's self up to it with a passion which grows all the more as little by little one discovers the enormous profit to be obtained therefrom this profit increases in proportion to the skill of the operator and the pleasure the latter finds in his occupation increases in like proportion criminalists have at their disposal material of high value only accessible to themselves such as the signatures of persons who have been judicially examined along with their general description and depositions when carrying on this study of manuscripts 
a document such as a deposition should never be handled without an attempt to gain some profit by that study first look at the signature and read all that can be read in it then relying on the facts set out in the deposition itself the accuracy of the opinion formed therefrom may be verified with a little practice this does not take long and the minutes lost are largely compensated for by what is otherwise gained one soon begins to do this out of habit and does not neglect it even when in a hurry a glance taken at the end of the deposition and we immediately conclude artisan forty or fifty years old open-hearted trustworthy honest small in stature careless then the description profession age etc is looked at and our opinion found to be accurate then the tenor of the document is examined and our opinion again borne out more time is required when the opinions formed do not agree with the facts found for then the fault must be sought for but soon one seldom or never makes a mistake this study takes up but little time presents a variety of surprises and becomes as interesting as it is useful the author advises every one to study handwriting in this way another almost mechanical method of seizing peculiarities in writing may be here mentioned all that is necessary to be done is to go over the writing with a dry pen piece of pointed wood or even after some practice simply with the eyes exactly following the outlines of the characters but this must be done almost as quickly as if one were writing oneself without exaggerating anything and without being the dupe of one's imagination one finds oneself when doing this transported into a particular state of mind corresponding to that governing the writer when actually writing the documents under examination one experiences nervous excitement irritation pleasure or anger when the writer has been excited irritated pleased or angry nor does one only feel the disposition of the individual at the moment when he has been writing but also the peculiarities of his character and nature for this however a certain amount of practice and a capacity for feeling the emotions of others are necessary here again it is important to re-examine a writing for the purposes of verification when one has subsequently become better informed about an individual when for example the writing of an accused has been examined and a certain opinion formed about him the whole work should be done over again and the two results re-examined when subsequently his guilt or innocence has been definitely established when the identity of two writings has to be established there is nothing else to do but to apply to a particular case what one has already learned from an appreciation of handwriting he who in comparing two writings only places them side by side in order to find resemblances or differences will discover absolutely nothing or if he do discover anything it will be in an exceptionally easy case the only correct method is to study examine and determine the characteristics of each writing apart and then to compare the results obtained but not the writings themselves only after having carefully done this can the two documents be compared together for resemblances and differences now for this it is necessary to have special notions of what is meant by the words resemblance and difference we do not understand by this mere similarity or dissimilarity in the form of the letters every one makes the same letter in quite a different way at different times even indeed often in the same line and besides it is easy to imitate each letter even the most characteristic the identicality of letters really only exists if the same brain has formed them if they proceed from the same thought the same character and the same nature two letters may have a marked air of resemblance but they are always different from one another if the same brain has not dictated them or if they have not been written in the same mood this is the alpha and omega of all appreciation of writing 
the man who is capable of finding this difference will be able to formulate a correct judgment it is true that in addition to this other processes exist which may help us in judging a writing it is useful for instance whenever writing is to be examined critically to draw certain lines which enable characteristic peculiarities to be discovered these lines are horizontal or demarcating lines four of them should be drawn such as we see in the first writing books of children but instead of being straight these lines will be broken joining exactly the upper and lower extremities of all the letters the straightest line will be that joining the lower edge of the letters without loops or tails a c e m n o etc taken together the four lines will present characteristic peculiarities very important for comparison but if a writing has been forged and in consequence written slowly and with many pauses the direction of the line alters in a most noticeable way for the pen after each pause no longer finds the exact point at which it would have continued to write had no interruption taken place the line will therefore be markedly interrupted though the characteristic distances between the lines may not at all be lost if the case is an important one the documents should be and are as a rule photographed these photographs may then be handled at will and many things are often discovered in them which are missed when examining the document itself further interruptions in words taken singly are very important as a rule words are written without stopping and in one continuous stroke there are however exceptions one when the word is so long that one is obliged to move the forearm which rests on the table the pen is also moved two when also in long words near the commencement of the word an i has to be dotted or a t stroked when these signs come at the end of a word one as a rule writes the whole word without placing the sign in other cases the word is usually interrupted in the middle the sign being placed and the word continued take for example the word misunderstanding one probably stops after the first s and dots the i and then goes on to the end of the word before dotting the i in ing and finally stroking the t three when certain letters do not join easily with others as for example s or after certain capital letters b z d etc sometimes also after certain small letters g d l and finally one sometimes breaks off in the middle of a letter itself for example in p d k four when the person writing has got into the habit of breaking off frequently without any particular reason in every case such interruptions are characteristic of all writings and must on that account be minutely studied both in the undisputed and the disputed documents if there is forgery or falsification in the latter it will be noticed that the interruptions are few and unnatural that is they cannot be explained by one of the above cited reasons the interruption is made simply to look at the model and for reflection this indeed is the infallible sign of the forged writing an important substratum for further and often important observation is the handwriting of school children that is in the country where the children do the writing for the whole household school copy books or parts of them have before now played an important part in criminal cases and the best often the only help has been given by the schoolmaster who has known the handwriting of a scholar with certainty that one should avail oneself of such help is self-evident the way in which the pen is held should also be considered i e whether both points of the pen are pressed equally or whether one of the points is pressed more or less heavily than the other as a rule it is difficult to change the way in which one holds or presses a pen finally the observations which have already been made above with regard to dipping the pen in the ink and the interruptions consequent thereon 
are very important as to the spelling upon which too much value is often placed it proves absolutely nothing the forger may know how to spell and yet intentionally introduce mistakes into what he is writing he may also make many mistakes in his ordinary writing while in the forged document he may have looked up some of the words in a dictionary besides nothing prevents him from having it corrected by another person if there are faults both in the undisputed as well as in the disputed writing and these faults are not identical this also proves nothing it must not be forgotten that only a person who writes without mistakes observes the rules of grammar a person who cannot spell follows no rule at least generally speaking sometimes he makes one fault sometimes another and sometimes he will write the word correctly just by chance those who like investigating officers are accustomed to read letters from all sorts of people know how much the spelling of uneducated persons differs ames gives some interesting information regarding tracing there are he says two general methods of perpetrating forgeries one by the aid of tracing the other by freehand writing these methods differ widely in detail according to the circumstances of each case tracing can only be employed when a signature or writing is present in the exact or approximate form of the desired reproduction it may then be done by placing the writing to be forged upon a transparency over a strong light and then superimposing the paper upon which the forgery is to be made the outline of the writing underneath will then appear sufficiently plain to enable it to be traced with pen or pencil so as to produce a very accurate copy upon the superimposed paper if the outline is with a pencil it is afterward marked over with ink again tracings are made by placing transparent tracing paper over the writing to be copied and then following the lines over with a pencil this tracing is then penciled or blackened upon the obverse side when it is placed upon the paper on which the forgery is to be made the lines upon the tracing are retraced with a stylus or other smooth hard point which impresses upon the paper underneath a faint outline which serves as a guide to the forged imitation in forgeries perpetrated by the aid of tracing the internal evidence is more or less conclusive according to the skill of the forger in the perpetuation of a forgery the mind instead of being occupied in the usual function of supplying matter to be recorded devotes its special attention to the superintendence of the hand directing its movements so that the hand no longer glides naturally and automatically over the paper but moves slowly and with a halting vacillating motion as the eye passes to and from the copy to the pen moving under the specific control of the will evidence of such a forgery is manifest in the formal broken nervous lines and uneven flow of the ink and the often retouched lines and shades these evidences are unmistakable when studied with the aid of a microscope also further evidence is adduced by a careful comparison of the disputed writing noting the pen pressure or absence of any of the delicate unconscious forms relations shades etc characteristic of the standard writing forgeries by tracing usually present a close resemblance in general form to the genuine documents and are therefore most sure to deceive the unfamiliar or casual observer it sometimes happens that the original writing from which the tracings were made is discovered in which case the closely duplicated forms will be positive evidence of forgery the degree to which one signature or writing duplicates another may be readily seen by placing one over the other and holding them to a window or other strong light or by close comparative measurements traced forgeries however are not as is usually supposed necessarily exact duplicates of their originals since it is very easy to move the paper by accident or design while the tracing is being made 
or while making the transfer copy from it, so that while it serves as a guide to the general features of the original, it will not, when tested, be an exact duplication. The danger of an exact duplication is quite generally understood by persons having any knowledge of forgery, and is therefore avoided. Another difficulty is that the very delicate features of the original writing are more or less obscured by the opaqueness of two sheets of paper, and are therefore changed or admitted from the forged simulation, and their absence is usually supplied, through force of habit, by equally delicate unconscious characteristics from the writing of the forger himself. Again, the forger rarely possesses the requisite skill to exactly reproduce his tracing. Many of the minutiae of the original writing are more or less microscopic, and for that reason pass unobserved by the forger. Outlines of writing to be forged are sometimes simply drawn with a pencil and then worked up in ink. Such outlines will not usually furnish so good an imitation as to form, since they depend wholly upon the imitative skill of the forger. Besides the above-mentioned evidences of forgery by tracing, where pencil or carbon guidelines are used, which must necessarily be removed by rubber, there are liable to remain some slight fragments of the tracing lines, while the mill finish of the paper will be impaired and its fibre more or less torn out, so as to lie loose upon the surface. Also, the ink will be more or less ground off from the paper, thus giving the lines a grey and lifeless appearance. And as retouchings are usually made after the guidelines have been removed, the ink, wherever they occur, will have a blacker and fresher appearance than elsewhere. All these phenomena are plainly manifest under the microscope. Where the tracing is made directly with pen and ink over a transparency, as is often done, no rubbing is necessary, and of course the phenomena arising from rubbing do not appear. In concluding this section, the author would add that there are distinguished experts in handwriting who often proceed in conformity with really scientific principles. To these we may confide without apprehension work within their competence but we must not neglect to make our own observations in order to compare them with those of the expert in the interests of our inquiry. On the other hand, there are experts who proceed in an unscientific and cut-and-dried way. When we have only such at our disposal, it is much better to do the work ourselves. End of section 36《セクション37オフ・クリミナル・インベスティゲーション・ボリューム1。This is a LibriVox recording.All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.Recording by Avaii in June 2015.Criminal Investigation A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers and Lawyers。Volume 1 by Hans Gross, translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Section 37. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him. Section 9. Photography. A. Importance of Photography from a Judicial Point of View. Photography is indeed neither an art nor a science, its artistic or scientific claims it owes to various arts and a great number of sciences, but the debts it has incurred have been paid with usury. It may be said nowadays that there is no art or science which has not recourse to photography and does not owe it precious and incalculable benefits. Especially brilliant are the services rendered by photography to the criminal law. However recent the applications of photography in criminal matters may be, yet today they are none the less multitudinous, and there even exists a whole series but dimly foreshadowed. We know approximately that we are able to employ photography in certain circumstances, and how we ought to do so, 
and yet we know but an infinitesimal number of the cases in which it may be useful. The number of these cases will increase, for we are not content with having direct recourse to photography properly so called, but profit besides by all the applications of photography in other sciences. Whoever reads a photographic review without losing sight of the part played by photography in criminal matters will soon be convinced that, perhaps in a very short time, we will be in a position to apply new principles to at least some questions. We benefit, moreover, from the following circumstances. We have among lawyers a pretty considerable number of amateur photographers who know how photography may be made use of in criminal cases. We need not, therefore, fear that precious discoveries and experiments will remain unapplied. No doubt we must proceed systematically and gather together everything which may be of assistance in this connection. To obtain a bird's eye view of the matter, two questions may be asked with regard to the services of photography. What are the services it may render to criminalists today? And what are the services which we may expect from it in the future? As regards the former, it would be necessary for the jurist as well as the amateur photographer, and generally speaking every person conversant with the applications of photography, to continually ask if, in the particular case he is studying, recourse cannot be had to photography. As regards the latter point, it must be asked in what sense photography will have to be developed to solve such and such a difficulty. After this, all the experiments made when questions are asked must be gathered together for subsequent profit. Today, Röntgen rays have become of immeasurable importance to us. For it can be said that they, in certain cases, bring the same certainty as to the living body that in the dead only post-mortem examination can afford. That thus extraordinary results are achieved need not be insisted upon. A full review of the many cases in which Röntgen photographs can already today be used from the forensic standpoint is to be found in the works of Goldfield, Levinson, Nessel, Gaspar, Benedict, Holzknecht, Stölzing and Tröger. The rapidity with which these questions have developed is shown by the fact that in the third edition of this book we wrote what the French, namely Dr. Grasse in Montpellier and Dr. Ferroul in Narbonne, have reported about seeing through solid bodies may well be a little exaggerated. Let us first deal with the personality of the photographer who comes to the aid of the investigating officer. Here we are able to make a distinction, at least in theory. Many cases occur where it is merely necessary to photograph without worrying whether the result is more or less successful. It is always possible to rectify and correct in the report of the case even grave faults in a photograph. Such photographs may be, for example, the place of a fire, the position of an individual who has been killed, the scene of a railway accident, landslip or explosion, etc. If the photograph does not produce an exact impression, it may be stated in the report as follows. The distance between the buildings A and B does not seem so far to the eye as on the photograph. It only extends according to measurements to double the length of the house A. Or, the position of a corpse was not so perpendicular as might be believed from the photograph. The grass upon which it lay was sloping about 12 degrees. Such photographic proofs, where it is only required to give an idea of localities or reproduce the position of objects, the general impression or certain details, may be made by anyone who has taken up photography. It is not necessary to call in the professional photographer expressly for the purpose. The amateur photographer is more than sufficient. And as it is often embarrassing, or at least costly, to engage a professional photographer, it is desirable that the greater number of investigating officers become amateur photographers. In this way, photographs may be obtained in numerous criminal cases, thus elucidating the case and facilitating the work.
It is in this way that the well-known chemical legist Dr. Paul Jeserich has worked for many years. On commissions which he has attended, he has never ceased to insist upon the importance of photographs from a criminal point of view. Photography, he says, is entirely objective and always impartial. It is capable of fixing certain details which may perhaps be of subsequent importance and of which no one has dreamed at the time of the inspection of localities. It is for this reason that the sensible advice is given of taking several views from different sides, for it frequently happens that at the time of the visit to the scene of the crime, the important and decisive side cannot yet be indicated. And indeed, many investigating officers have already recognized the importance of photography. We often find appended to the report of an inspection of a locality a photograph made by an investigating officer in his capacity of amateur photographer, and it is needless to add that the report has gained enormously in clearness and simplicity thereby. No doubt the state cannot order every investigating officer to buy a photographic camera and its accessories, to procure all the necessary chemicals, and impose upon him the always wearisome duty of developing, printing, washing, fixing, and mounting. But little by little it will recognize the importance of photography from a criminal standpoint. The state ought to facilitate the use of photography and furnish photographic apparatus not only to criminal courts, but also to all important police stations. Almost everywhere will be found an investigating officer or head constable who will learn to work it and who will take over the business. By buying a large number of cameras, their price, which is nowadays not high, will be far from excessive, and the profit obtained therefrom will largely compensate the initial outlay so much for cases in which the investigating officer himself, or through a photographer called in by him, ought and can take photographs. It is quite otherwise in cases in which the scientific photographer, or rather the photographic scientist, comes in. It is these latter cases which give the photography the important and unexpected place which it occupies in criminal investigations, it has already assumed this position, though it may as yet be in its infancy, and every day may bring to light a new side of its importance. Perchance in a little while we shall hardly be able to understand how we were able formally to conduct any case without invoking at each moment the aid of scientific photography. It seems absolutely impossible to exaggerate the importance photography will assume several years hence. But care should be taken not to hope for too much. A short time ago, for example, a question was raised. Can a thought be brought onto a photographic plate? Mr. Ingalls Rogers seeks to answer this in The Amateur Photographer. His efforts are indeed remarkable. He fixed postage stamps on a black card and gazed at them for a moment. The room was then darkened and the sensitive photographic plate was fixed in the same place where the stamps had been. When Rogers examined the plate twenty minutes later, he found two clear pictures of the stamps upon it. These are reproduced in the amateur photographer. But were they really the stamps thought about? It is difficult to indicate the line of demarcation between the work of the ordinary photographer and of the scientific photographer. This depends on the one hand upon the case itself, and on the other upon the photographer. One case may be so simple that any photographer, no matter who, may suffice. Another may be so difficult that the man of science will be obliged to call in aid the whole of his knowledge. On other occasions, it will be the previous culture of the photographer which will tell us whether or not he is capable of doing the work. In a special case, if the investigating officer has some idea of drawing, physics, etc., he will set to work when another, deprived of these qualifications, would have to abstain. In the following pages, some examples will be cited in which recourse may be had to photographers, but no distinction will be made between the work of the ordinary and that of the scientific photographer. 
End of section 37. Section 38 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Coyer Adam. The expert in how to make use of him continued. B. Particular cases of the employment of photography. It is hardly possible to exhaust by complete enumeration the number of cases in which photography may be employed. It would be necessary to gather together with great trouble all cases known to date and, even if all were registered, the list would no longer be complete tomorrow. No other pretension is here made than to give a few examples in order to encourage others to search out new realms in which photography is capable of rendering us service. Speaking generally, it may be said that it should always be employed when it is desired to obtain absolutely objective, permanent, and easily controlled proofs capable of bringing about a conviction. The sensitized plate is the new retina of the man of science. Professor W. Vogel. It may then be said that photography may be employed every time that there is room to suppose that the camera sees further than the eye, or if it does not see further, each time that an object should be fixed for future reference. The photograph is the image reflected by a mirror, but it is a fixed image. This definition itself proves that photography, however paradoxical the assertion it may appear, shows us more than the eye, even when it shows us no more than the eye can see. A painter, and especially a portrait painter, after having worked for a certain time, places his portrait before a mirror and considers the image which the latter reflects. He often discovers great faults which he was incapable of seeing upon the portrait itself. The reason is that when one looks for a long time at an object, especially when one has been doing so since its origin, and been assisting at the whole of its development, one always sees it under the same aspect, which prevents certain defects from being noticed. But when the image is reflected by a mirror, one sees the object under lateral inversion, and in consequence under another aspect. Details may then perhaps be discovered which formerly escaped notice. In photography, exactly the same may be said. An object has been observed with great minuteness and application. A whole series of observations have been made regarding it. Nothing striking has been noticed about it because one has become accustomed to its appearance. But if it be photographed, the new color the new situation and the new aspect enable us to see it from another point of view and reveal fresh details which have yet to be discovered. Here, then, we have to start with quite a number of cases in which photography may be useful, that is to say, each time that an object and its particular relation and position with respect to other objects is difficult or impossible to explain. For example, in the case of an accident supposed to have been caused by a criminal hand, but which cannot easily be explained in its entirety, the photograph of the scene of the accident will be able to perhaps at once, perhaps later, to furnish the desired explanation. It is the same when one has doubts regarding the manner in which thieves have set to work in a burglary. When the position of the corpse is unnatural, when conclusions may be drawn from that position without having sufficient proof for doing so at one's disposal, and finally, when it is a question of the appearance of wounds, writings, results of arson, etc., we have all had occasion to say, this position ought to give me an important clue for finding the correct point of view. Such a reflection ought to always make us photograph the object. The photograph, in fact, procures us another point of view, another way of looking at things, and often the desired explanation. 
and if the investigating officer who has himself seen the surroundings of the offence does not find the solution perhaps another to whom the photograph is subsequently shown will find it therein but if no photograph exists no one will any longer have the exact position of the object before his eyes and we shall never obtain the explanation we are looking for another class of cases exist in which objects may be photographed first on every occasion on which it is the duty of the investigating officer to see and describe an object and its position in such a manner that persons who have subsequently to deal with the case may be enabled to form as clear an idea thereon as possible theoretically the judge trying the case the public prosecutor the expert the counsel for the defense and the jury or assessors ought to see everything the investigating officer has seen as this is generally impossible the investigating officer has to supply the lack of a direct view by description but how much clearer more convincing and more objective this description would be if he had supplemented it with photographs in cases such as the following we ought to photograph places where a man has been killed where there has been a quarrel where a child has been abandoned where a person has been a victim of an accident the scene of a fire the scene of an important railway smash boiler explosion collapse of a bridge house or other building the scene of a burglary decoity or the counterfeiting of a coin a disputed water channel in cases of rioting connected therewith and many others which will occur to the mind as occasion arises we will here cite a typical example demonstrating that photography may aid us even without our knowledge during the riots at the time of the marriage of prince croy at brussels several young men were arrested who pretended that they had taken no part in the affray and had been carried into the crowd by chance and against their will but a policeman happened to notice that an amateur photographer had not allowed the occasion to escape of taking an instantaneous photograph of the riot from his window the photographer was asked for a proof which was immediately enlarged and it turned out that several of the young men under arrest the so-called passive spectators were in the photograph they were distinctly recognizable and as unhappily they were represented with mouths wide open to shout and arms in the air brandishing sticks they immediately gave up their line of defense that they had been dragged into the disturbance against their will a report of a similar case appeared in the daily express at the time of the assassination of president mckinley during that fatal visit of the murdered president to the buffalo exhibition the cinematograph was of course in constant activity an exquisite series of living pictures show the president as he delivered his address and shook hands with the people who approached him all of his movements shortly before the moment when the fatal bullet struck him were fixed upon the films when some days later these living photographs were developed at the edison laboratory and examined by the officers of the criminal investigation department a discovery was made of the greatest importance among the closely packed multitude surging around mckinley one face and figure stood out with striking distinctness it was cosglas the first pictures of the series show the president as he steps on the platform and begins his speech a man is seen next making his way with difficulty through the crowd various people whom he pushes recklessly aside turn around on him with angry looks undisturbed however he forges ahead and seems to succeed in making his way through the living wall then he stands still for a second and turns his face unsuspectingly towards the camera desperate resolution can be seen in his eyes then he goes on further pushing and thrusting until he is almost immediately before the president again he faces the camera at this moment he seems agitated and excited now his hat is knocked over his eyes and hastily he puts it back he then looks wildly around and appears as if waiting for some one in the multitude and expecting a signal thousands of people are in the picture with him but most of them stand with their backs to the camera 
the features of all who turn around are clear enough to make them recognizable in the photograph from these films drawings were taken for the secret police service with the object of discovering by their help some clue in the confederates of the murderer acquittals have also been brought about by accidental photography the amateur photographer relates how an englishman was accused in rio de janeiro of a murder of his brazilian colleague a few days before the two had a violent quarrel but this was stated to have been amicably made up and on the day in question they went together for a sail in the harbour in a small yacht in the evening the englishman returned with the dead body of his friend on board and stoutly maintained that the death was due to an accident his companion having fallen from the masthead on to the deck an oar was missing and the medical experts gave it as their opinion that death was the result of a blow on the head with a stick and that an oar might possibly have been the weapon used an inquiry was proceeded with and the previous quarrel made things look very black against the accused now a passenger on a steamer had happened to take a snapshot of the harbor and on developing it a dark spot was noticed on the white sail of a small yacht which chanced to be in the neighborhood on this being enlarged the spot proved to be the body of a man falling from the mast thus conclusively proving the truth of the englishman's story and bringing about his acquittal apart from such situations perishable objects of those likely to change their appearance should also be photographed firstly wounds especially when the instrument with which they have been made is unknown or when the relative position of the aggressor and the victim is doubtful or when it is not certain whether the wound has been inflicted upon a person while living or after death secondly footprints impressions of which cannot be taken and whose relative position is of some importance it may even be said that all footprints ought to be photographed before the impression of them is taken thus provision would be made against every eventuality for the impression may not succeed and the footprint may be destroyed thirdly the same holds with fingerprints upon the body of a victim of an assault or upon other objects apart from their scientific interpretation the size shape and general appearance may be of great importance see post section eleven fingerprints fourthly the position of a person killed ought to always be photographed and from different sides if one is sure that the corpse is still in its original position and has not been moved by earlier comers a whole series of important clues will the author believes be furnished by the following property of the photographic process this process renders red and brown darker and clearer than they appear to the eye and the photographic plate also reproduces the colors red and brown even when a human eye cannot see them at all this peculiarity explains the often cited case of the smallpox woman a woman apparently in the best of health had her photograph taken and when the photographer developed the negative he noticed that the face and the neck were spotted over with a multitude of dark marks yet the photographer did not remember having seen such marks upon the skin of the woman his astonishment was increased when he learnt that the woman had become ill some days later and that her illness was smallpox this fact is only explicable on the assumption that the marks of the illness were already existent when she posed for her photograph but they were not yet but slightly red and that the sensitized plate had registered them when the human eye was unable to perceive them experts in color are also aware of similar phenomena photographs sometimes show marks on the face for example on the cheeks which are not noticed naturally these are old injuries which the lapse of years has rendered invisible to the eye but they have left a little redness which is clearly brought out by photography these remarkable facts lead us to believe that it is possible in a general way to render brown and red marks yet in a latent state visible by photography every pressure exercised on the skin of man results in the breaking or at least in the inflaming of small veins and each time redness is produced if the pressure has been very feeble the redness will exist objectively but will not be discernible by the eye this redness is particularly common after scratches attempts at strangulation blows with the fist falls squeezing and also after inflammation caused by poison heat rubbing etc when the attacks are not severe 
but for most cases the important thing is not to prove that there has been an attack of a particular violence it suffices to know that there has been an attack and the traces must be looked for on both the victim and his aggressor who no doubt wishes to pass them off as marks of resistance in the case of legitimate defense the question is specially serious if the victim has been wounded when already at the point of death and when the beats of the heart are already weakened in these cases the blood can no longer spurt forcefully from the injured blood vessels and even an energetic attack may produce only slight redness it is easy to conjecture cases which may be met with in practice for example a person has been suffocated by cushions or other soft articles so that no exterior trace of violence can be perceived the verdict would most likely be natural death but the photograph will perhaps discover very distinct traces of strangulation or perhaps indicate that the individual in question has been firmly held and then stifled in the same way there may be found on an individual who has apparently committed suicide by hanging bruises or effusions of blood towards the skin which the eye will not notice but which the photographic plate will render visible these contusions will often permit of the supposition that death has been preceded by a struggle see chapter sixteen section four it is also important to establish the existence of traces of resistance on the person of the supposed aggressor the person assaulted may have given him blows or scratches or attempted to choke him but so feebly that the camera is alone able to discover the marks moreover the redness produced we are of course always dealing with white-skinned persons may have been very distinct at first and have disappeared by the time of arrest so that only photography can establish its existence it therefore seems the right thing to do in all cases of suspicious death of white persons to have the corpse photographed as well as the suspected assailant when resistance is believed to have been offered and to search on the body for traces of redness nor ought we forget objects from which an attempt has been made to obliterate marks of blood for example linen floors walls etc it is difficult to submit large surfaces to chemical and microscopic examination but if they be photographed perhaps the places where such marks exist will be discovered in the particular spot once found microscopic and chemical examination may be proceeded with see chapter fourteen section four in certain circumstances the photographing of internal organs may be also recommended for example the brain mucous membrane of the respiratory channels or stomach when it is not known whether such redness is natural or not in poisoning cases it may be possible to determine with greater accuracy the moment which the poison has been absorbed when for example fairly large particles of arsenic remain for some time attached to the mucous membrane of the stomach the latter becomes inflamed at the places where the arsenic has remained longest if this redness is imperceptible to the eye it is possible for photography to discover it and therefrom can be deduced the length of time that the arsenic has been in the stomach footnote on the page as regards the photography of latent red marks the editors request that anyone who may make experiments in the matter to communicate the results to them especially with reference to dark-skinned persons End footnote. with respect to this it should be remarked in a general way that on an ordinary photographic plate colors do not come out as in the reality that is to say they do not make the same light and dark impression as they make in nature even those plates known as orthochromatic plates are incapable of completely remedying this red and brown become as has been said darker blue and violet generally appear lighter but also at times darker according to the chemical nature of the coloring matter fluorescent bodies influence the shades of the colors in various ways green generally becomes somewhat darker yet bodies are known for example the green flower of the gooseberry which comes out quite light natural colors photograph better than artificial the photograph of a bouquet of natural flowers will give a much more accurate impression than that of a painted bouquet however faithful the painting may be in many cases these small details must not be overlooked 
we also should mention that in some circumstances it is good to take several photographs of the person who is shamming for example when dealing with an accused who constantly contracts the muscles of his face rolls his eyes makes impossible grimaces etc and thus leads us to suspect shamming he should be placed in a room lending itself to photography well lit and furnished with a trap permitting observation without being oneself seen a sufficient opening is also arranged to hold the camera which is brought into play when the person under observation is in a good position and is behaving naturally needless to say the photograph must be an instantaneous one nor must it be forgotten that magnesium light photographs are often necessary when for example a corpse has been found on a busy road and it is not advisable to wait for daylight owing to the heavy day traffic to photograph blood or footprints the spot must be photographed with the aid of artificial light in section thirty eight section thirty nine of criminal investigation volume one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross, translated by John Adam and John Coyer Adam. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him Continued now we come to the photography of objects observed under the microscope this is not the business of the investigating officer but in some cases he ought to be absolutely insistent on it being done we suggest that the microscopist should sign no report without adding thereto a photograph of what he has observed under the instrument dr paul jesserick was probably the first to draw attention to the necessity of such photographs the idea came to him when during the argument of a case he heard the objection raised that what the experts had seen under the microscope and had taken for blood was perhaps only mushroom mold or grains of starch this objection could not then be refuted since the objects microscopically examined had long before decomposed and been destroyed being thus incapable of further use in the case this drawback is easily gotten over by asking the microscopist to prepare and exhibit photographs of his experiments any mistake on the part of the expert may thus be excluded for in his zeal he may perhaps see many things which are non-existent he presents his photograph saying as much for his own peace of mind as for that of others look at the photograph and form your opinion the theory that the expert's duty is merely to aid the court in forming an opinion is well laid down in both england and india with fingerprints for instance it is for the expert to point out resemblances to the judge and jury and leave them to draw their own conclusions as to the identity of the impression that identity of impression means identity of person is of course purely a question for the expert see section eleven proof of this kind may be given at any moment even after many years provided that the record of the case is still in existence and is particularly easy to lay before a judge and jury the parisians in eighteen seventy one when sending letters and dispatches by pigeon post gummed them side by side on a wall like tapestry and then made a photographic reduction of the whole surface measuring several square meters upon a sheet of paper several centimeters square this reduction was then rolled up inside a quill and attached to the pigeon's tail on arriving at its destination the little photograph with its hundreds of letters was enlarged by the microscopic lantern and projected on a screen or white wall and any one who expected a letter had but to go and read it let us apply this process to judicial photography the microscopic photograph of the object in question as well as the objects which it is to be compared with or differentiated from may be enlarged in open court thrown up on a wall and explained to the judge and jury by the expert by this means the possibility of error will as far as possible be averted this procedure will be adopted not only in determining the presence of blood sperm poison or one or other of those numerous substances which the microscope is capable of recognizing and which can be seen directly but also in connection with other microscopic phenomena here is the most interesting case in a house destroyed by fire 
the half-carbonized corpse of the landlord was discovered and there was room to believe that a murder had taken place we know that fresh blood has certain microscopic properties which alter greatly under the action of certain chemical agents but if blood be submitted to the action of carbon monoxide which is most poisonous it does not alter under the influence of chemicals the question was whether the person had been suffocated in the fire or killed before it began in the first hypothesis the blood would present the characteristics of blood that has absorbed carbon monoxide and one breath of this gas undiluted is quite sufficient to affect the whole blood of the body in a most marked manner dr paul jesserick experimented with a few drops of the blood which still remained in the heart of the corpse and was able to establish that the death was due to suffocation at the same time he took a photograph of the spectrum and exhibited it at the trial when the corpus delecti had already been long in the state of putrefaction the same expert has also exhibited in court photographs of his experiments with hair for example in the crime passionel of bauckham the jury was then in the position to consider the case just as if they had seen the material objects mentioned by the expert the use of the magic lantern slides or even radiographs skyographs may yet play a great role in the law courts anyone who has had to show and explain a very small object in court is aware of the inadequacy of present methods the explanation has to be given over and over again to the several witnesses the public prosecutor the complainant or plaintiff the defendant and his counsel and the judge and jury all who have business in courts know how tedious and defective is this method but with a whitewashed wall or a sheet or a piece of white paper stretched on a frame or on the wall the objects may be shown enlarged by means of the lantern not only can transparencies be shown but also wood engravings photographs prints handwriting etc in short everything on paper which transmits the light and whose size permits of its entering the apparatus the necessary darkening of the court would be a difficulty with a little ingenuity would soon overcome theoretically this idea has been widely approved and has already been turned into practical account photography is also of great importance from the point of view of the examination of manuscripts we have already mentioned that in comparing handwriting recourse should be had to photography so as for example to be able to make drawings upon the photographs which would be impossible on the original but photography can also furnish direct proofs for it brings to light things that could not be seen by the naked eye in this connection jesserick of paris gobert of berlin and eder of vienna were the initiators since their first experiments it is known that photography is the easiest method of discovering erasures obliterations and rubbings out which cannot be seen with the naked eye by choosing a suitable position that contrasts may be increased so that parts of the writing which remain appear to us a darker tint it is also easy to determine the employment of various chemical products indeed those parts of the paper where they have been applied have a different color when photographed very often writing effaced by acid becomes quite readable in the photograph photography is also able to detect the presence of various kinds of ink which may be employed in this way we are frequently able to prove a forgery the forger often finds with great trouble an ink with the same color as the original but to the eye alone does it appear identical if a suitable light be chosen for photographing the writing for example gas and the plate be properly developed the two apparently similar writings will come out the one light gray and the other dark brown in comparison of handwriting photography is also of some value in other ways above all it is possible to reduce the two writings the forged and the genuine to the same scale thus enormously facilitating comparison again it is possible to rid of that troublesome difference in paper since the photos are on the same paper if need be comparison may be facilitated by photographing as advised by jesserick one of the two writings on a transparent film 
which is then placed upon the other writing. Points of resemblance may thus be very accurately compared. Finally, work is enormously facilitated by making photographic enlargements of the two writings. These should be as large as possible. After a long examination of writing, especially very small writing, the sight becomes confused, so that it is difficult to see things clearly, and it is often necessary to interrupt the work. But with enormous letters to work with, observation is very easy. Moreover, all the details, differences, resemblances, hesitations, places where a dip of the pen has been taken, stoppages, and all other points connected with the writing are better judged. And in a short time, a sure and definite decision may be pronounced. Comparison by means of enlargement with the projection apparatus has succeeded admirably. It is even sometimes possible to read, with the aid of photography, writing which, so to speak, does not exist. When, for example, one writes with a very hard pencil upon a writing block or upon a blotter, the writing leaves an impression on the next sheet of the block or upon the blotter. Nothing is visible to the naked eye. But if the sheet or blotter be greatly enlarged by photography, the writing thereon may often be very distinctly read. Not only can written characters be observed by means of photography, but as a rule any object which has been in contact with the writing. Thus, Dr. Bean of the Sheriff's Court of Berlin was consulted as to whether there had formerly been a stamp upon the bill of exchange. He photographed the bill of exchange, and at the same time a blank bill, to which a stamp had been affixed for a very short time. The difference was astonishing, and the answer to the question asked could be given in the negative with the most absolute certainty. Photography Archive, 1891, number 681. It seems to us, indeed, that this example, proof of contact of two bodies, can give a clear idea of the incalculable series of cases belonging to all possible branches in which photography is capable of rendering the greatest services. But such cases must be looked for and when found made a note of another case has to do with forgery of a name of a deceased person to a receipt no question of fraud had been raised when traces of obliterated writing were accidentally observed while looking at the paper by reflecting oblique rays of the sun on those portions of the paper not actually covered by the later writing these traces were copied as accurately as possible and the copy superimposed on the new writing so that the blanks in the copy were filling up. Thus, the original script was accurately determined. By photography, the fraud was rendered unmistakable. Advantage may possibly be drawn from what is called composite photography. The idea arose some years ago and the following experiment was performed. About 20 persons were chosen and made to sit one after another so that the head of each was in exactly the same position. Their photographs were taken one after the other. A three-second exposure being used, a very slow plate was employed. For example, it required an exposure of 60 seconds, so that by the time it was completely exposed, the 20 persons were photographed, and the result was a composite picture of them all. The possible application of this in criminal investigation is as follows. In an important case, it is desired to know what an accused looked like five years ago. If a photograph of him taken ten years ago can be found, the man is photographed the same size, attitude, and with the same style of hair and beard, etc., as in that photograph. The composite picture is then made of the two photographs, and the result may possibly give us some idea of what the man looked like five years before. This suggestion is made for what it is worth. Composite photography has indeed been reduced of late to a fine art, and most beautiful pictures have been produced by combining the heads of well-known beauties belonging respectively to various countries thus obtaining examples of the type of beauty characteristics of each country. See Strand Magazine, March 1906. In a general way, the fact must not be lost sight of that photographs often bear a different aspect to the real object. From the point of view of dimension, reciprocal situation, and especially general impression, 
heinrich strantz has pointed out the reason but very few cameras in the present can remedy the defect it is some explanation that a good photograph reproduces objects much more distinctly than we can see them when at some distance from a tiled roof we cannot distinguish one tile from another a painter recognizes this by representing the roof with a uniform color corresponding to the impression the japanese seem to see more distinctly than we do for they represent such objects with minute accuracy and their drawings thus appear to us very crude it is the same with photography it reproduces the tiled roof much more accurately than we see it we only perceive a brown color it is thus that photography appears to us to some extent untrue and wanting in naturalness added to this a certain depth and other effects of light and distance exist and in short the image appears unfaithful as we have already remarked such defects and their explanation must be pointed out to the court moreover it must not be forgotten that the photographer usually at hand has rarely the correct idea of what to do he knows how to embellish a portrait but he does not know how to take an accurate one the direction therefore from which the photograph should be taken must never be overlooked and it would be well to remember the following points one the sun should be upon the side of or behind the camera this adds to the clearness of the photograph if the sun is behind the object the photograph will be flat as if taken during cloudy weather this latter principle must then be applied if perchance it is really desired to give an impression that the photograph has been made in dull weather two when photographing persons in the open air it must be remembered that when the light comes from the front of the camera it flattens the face when it comes from above it renders the countenance dark and forbidding and that the direct rays of the sun cover the face with marks and give it a hard expression three when it is necessary to photograph house interiors a photograph by artificial light should be obtained in which case the windows do not interfere if this is quite impossible the dark part of the room must at least be lighted by light reflected by mirrors to which some movement is given four sometimes when for example it is necessary to photograph rapidly in the middle of the night if it is absolutely impossible to procure magnesium it is possible to make use of lightning powders which may be prepared at the nearest pharmacy for example six parts of saltpeter two parts of sulphur and one part of sulphurated antigone are reduced to powder and lightly filled into tubes of paper or saltpeter may be melted in a vessel over a lamp and flowers of sulphur added thereto in small quantities each time the sulphur is thrown upon the melted saltpeter a bright light results but these powders can only be employed when the resulting gas which has a disagreeable smell has sufficient means of escape if one has long enough time to have an exposure of say several hours a few lamps may be sufficient for lighting purposes five upon every photograph the scale of reduction must be indicated the best method is to photograph at the same time the measure of comparison in photographing a vertical surface which will in consequence not be deformed since its various parts will not be at different distances from the camera for example the facade of a house it would be well to photograph a man at the same time proportions will thus be accurately indicated six with each photograph the date hour temperature light points of the compass time of exposure kind of camera and the lenses employed must be indicated seven shining and light objects present great difficulties to photography we must be specially careful not to dust them for if that is done they come out still worse when possible shining objects should be neutralized for example iron and glass objects with plumbago are a mixture of magnesium carbonate and milk or russian talcum mixed with essence of turpentine these washes harm neither the photograph 
nor the article photographed and are easily got rid of. 8. In photographing machinery, for example after accidents, care must be taken not to do so when other work is in progress nearby. The vibration of other machinery in motion would greatly spoil the photograph. 9. Photographs of very fine objects in relief, for example inscriptions, deteriorations on objects, papillary lines, etc., should be taken in very strong lateral light, for shadows augment the relief. If the latter come out too strong, the fact must be mentioned in the report. We have said above that photographs may appear to us to a certain extent to be untruthful. But it must be noted that from a theoretical standpoint, it is by no means so certain that the camera is a bad reproducer of objects. We ourselves perhaps do not see things exactly from the point of view of perspective. When, for example, one shows his hands to a person sitting in front of him, so that one of them is about a yard nearer him than the other, they will appear to be of equal size. But if a camera be put in place of the person and the hands photographed, the hand nearest the camera will appear much larger than the other. According to the laws of perspective, this latter phenomenon conforms to the reality, for the hand nearest one ought to appear larger to the eye, only we do not notice the difference because conclusions drawn from experience influence our observation. We know the two hands are really of equal size, and this knowledge has so powerful an action that we see them of equal size, although, being in perspective, they ought to appear unequal. On looking at photographs of the hands, however, the principle of experience no longer acts with the same force. On the contrary, we remember that what we are looking at is a picture and attribute the fault to it and say that it is an inaccurate reproduction for we see upon the picture an exact reproduction from the point of view of perspective, and we notice an enormous difference in size, but it does not seem to agree with the reality. Let it not be said that wide-angle objectives, as they are called, which, for example, photograph two corners of a room at the same time, prove the entire contrary. This objective, if it does not distort, no doubt reproduces objects as they are in reality, only we cannot seize them without turning our eyes. At one glance we observe but very little of a thing at a distance of five or six yards. We only perceive distinctly an object of about the size of a chair without moving the eyes. What lies to the right and the left of the chair we are looking at is seen by us only approximately. We only see it accurately if we remove our eyes from the chair. If, therefore, a wide-angle objective is employed to the photograph, two walls of the room at the same time, at a distance of five or six yards, the resulting picture appears quite strange to us, because in nature we cannot see so much at a single glance. We say the picture is inaccurate although each particular object therein is reproduced exactly and distinctly. The lens shows more objects than can be seen contemporaneously by the naked eye, but these objects are not reproduced inaccurately. End of section 39. Section 40 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in June 2015. Criminal Investigation A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Section 40. The Expert and How to Make Use of Him Continued. Section 9. C. Recognition of Criminals from Their Photographs. In all countries, photography is employed for the identification of persons, especially since its uses have so largely developed. 
but it is only done systematically in large towns where the police administration is particularly well skilled in the method. Paris is at the head of this movement as a perusal of the book, now in its second edition, Judicial Photography by Alphonse Bertillon, Chief of the Identification Department, Prefecture of Police, Paris, will readily demonstrate. It is beyond all doubt that this branch should be organized everywhere and not only in the principal towns. The photography of criminals by a uniform process, the reciprocal interchange of portraits and their correct utilization are of such great importance that this process should be elevated into a methodical system. Only in this way will photography be capable of rendering considerable services, but if the miserable money question prevents us putting the project into execution as rapidly as we would wish, it is still necessary to proceed according to certain rules when we prepare and make use of photographs of suspected persons or criminals. Taking Bertillon's book as a guide, we shall refer to the most important points. 1. What is the best position for the individual to be photographed in? This question depends upon the object of the photograph. For the comparison of two photographs, or of a photograph with a person, the best is beyond all doubt a sharp profile. It is in this position that outlines show up best. The various prominences of the face are not projected thereon, and it is easy to measure with accuracy the dimensions necessary for comparison. But it is quite another thing when it is desired to identify a person from his photograph. Then a profile is absolutely useless. Indeed, we only see a person's profile in one position, while we see more or less the front face in all other positions. We are often unacquainted with the profile of a person whom we know intimately. We are surprised to find that an individual we are in the habit of seeing constantly has, when we look at him sideways, quite another aspect to that which we imagined. A person's face seen from the front does not appear strange to us, but it is not characteristic, because the nose is wholly projected and thus difficult to distinguish, and because the ears, so important for purposes of recognition, are deficient in clearness of outline. The most favorable position will therefore be the three-quarters face, because then the nose stands out distinctly, one ear is visible, and moreover because in this position we are best able to recognize people. Two proofs, however, must be taken, that of the profile and that of the three-quarters face thus doubling the expense and the number of photographs to be preserved. In England this is got over by placing the subject to be photographed in the three-quarters position and arranging a mirror beside the face, which reflects the exact profile. So as to get the mirror at the wished-for distance from the face, the lower right-hand corner of the mirror is cut away thus making a place for the shoulder. In this way, on the same negative, the profile and the three-quarters face are united. Bertillon rejects this method. He asserts that if such a double photograph be shown about, everyone would immediately know that it had to do with a suspected individual. But in these matters everyone always does know this when a photograph is shown, and besides, the method is so practical that its universal adoption must be recommended. 2. The position of the individual to be photographed leads to another question. Is it preferable to photograph the bust or the whole figure? In a general way it may be said that a face is more easily recognized the larger it is, therefore the bust is to be recommended. But if the individual in question has some peculiarity easy of recognition, the full-length photograph is to be preferred. Such a proof has also the advantage of permitting, if need be, the enlargement of the head, whereas the person is not always at our disposal to photograph his feet. We must not suppose that peculiar movements or twitchings will be reproduced in a photograph of the attitude or physiognomy of the subject. If an individual is afflicted with such movements, 
it is recommended only to photograph the bust, because the witnesses, and not only uneducated witnesses, always look on a full-length photograph handed to them for the particular movements they know so well, and if they do not find them, they fail to recognize the photograph. 3. As regards the format of the photograph, Bertillon considers reduction to one-seventh of natural size is best. This is no doubt a convenient format, as the long reign of carte de visite demonstrates. The head reduced in this proportion is always large enough to be readily identified, even by people who seldom see photographs. We think, however, that size is not of so much importance, and it matters little whether the natural size is reduced to a sixth or an eighth. The essential thing is to employ the same scale of reduction. Indeed, the exchange of photographs is generally carried out when distances are great, and comparison is much facilitated when the photographs are not of different sizes. It would be best to adopt a uniform scale of reduction for all photographs made for the use of justice and the police. This would not be difficult to carry out in practice. 4. As to the tone of the photographs, that is to say whether they should be lighter or darker, and in consequence whether there should be a shorter or longer exposure, it is impossible to give a general answer. The face of the sitter is nearly always adapted to a particular tone, and an experienced and intelligent photographer always knows on merely looking at him whether the photograph will be better, that is, more like, according to whether the tone is lighter or darker. If the photographer cannot tell this, the best shade must be found by degrees, for the difference is often so great that the tone is no indifferent matter. 5. The usual format must often be departed from, especially when it is desired to compare a photograph with a particular object. If, for example, the description of a person is given, the photograph must be taken so that the most important signs indicated in the description are reproduced. If a photograph already exists, the new photograph will, of course, to facilitate comparison, be made in the same style, as regards size, position, tone, paper, etc., as the old one. 6. If two photographs with different hair, beard, etc., are to be compared, if, for example, in one photograph the individual has an abundant head of hair and beard, while in the other his hair is short and he is clean-shaven, those places on the photograph on which hair appears must be covered up. For this purpose Bertillon has specially cut papers or stencils, which, however, are only of use when both photographs are of equal size and the position is also identical. The simplest method is as follows. The photograph is placed upon a window and over it a sheet of white paper is fixed, upon which is outlined with a pencil the parts covered with hair, thus beginning above the forehead where the hair starts, thence descending the temple and cheek, then passing over the moustache and under the nose, and then reascending the other cheek and temple to the forehead. This line is then cut with a sharp knife. The same is then done with the clean-shaven face, that is a line is drawn where the hair would come if the person was not clean-shaven. If the photograph is gummed to a mount, it must either be steeped in water and detached, or else the drawing must be done on tracing paper and transferred to ordinary paper. The two sheets having been cut, they are placed on the photographs and the two compared. If they are of the same man, the result is astonishing. The photographs as a whole have absolutely no resemblance, whereas when the hair on the head and face is covered, the resemblance is striking. This is only in accordance with common experience. Likenesses are usually detected and persons recognized by the portion comprised between the lower half of the forehead and the upper part of the nose, including eyes and eyebrows, that is, just the portion covered by the mask in masked assemblies or balls. 7. 
Examination of the photograph with a good magnifying glass is also to be recommended. In this way, cicatrices, warts, scars, etc., invisible to the naked eye, may be discovered. But too much must not be expected from a magnifying glass, for a too great enlargement causes the unevenness of the paper to appear and thus leads to confusion. 8. Always strictly observe the principle of never retouching a photograph. Professional photographers may be allowed to do this, and are adepts in the art of flattery, but a judicial photograph must resemble the sitter, and every retouch spoils this resemblance. When a retouched photograph has been handed to us, the retouching must first of all be got rid of. According to Bertillon, the best method is to wet a ball of cotton wool with turpentine and cautiously rub it over the photograph, being careful to dry it immediately. The rationale of this process is not quite clear, as there are two kinds of retouching. One is done with a pencil on the negative, and it is therefore impossible to remove anything from the positive. The other is done indeed on the positive, but with watercolors which can only be removed with water and not with turpentine. There is but one case where retouching may be permitted, that is, when the photograph is not made for personal use but for outside authorities, and when there are faults on the plate causing marks and blemishes. Such marks may be mistaken for warts, moles, cicatrices, etc., and must therefore be retouched to prevent mistakes. 9. In comparing photographs, the following cases may occur. a. Comparison of one portrait with another. b. Of a portrait with an accused. c. Of a portrait with a person at liberty. and d. Of a portrait with a person's recollection of the subject. a. Comparison of one portrait with another. In the rare cases where two photographs are of the same size, measurements may be at once taken with the compasses. If the hair and beard are in the way, they should be covered up as shown above, and particular signs, warts, cicatrices, etc., must be carefully looked for. If none of these signs appear on the photographs, the probable date of the photographs must be considered, and if need be, a medical jurist consulted. If the portraits are of different sizes, they must be enlarged, the smaller more in proportion than the larger, and if the color of the one is totally different to that of the other, a new photograph is indispensable. Thus, both portraits are of the same size. As we have said, only really satisfactory results are obtainable by getting rid of everything interfering with the comparison. B. Comparison of a portrait with an accused. The precaution of clothing and dressing the hair of the accused as he is in the photograph is never superfluous. In a difficult and important case, it will be best to photograph him in the same size as the portrait. It is always easier to compare one photograph with another than to compare a photograph with a person. C. Comparison of a portrait with a person at liberty. Here we have to deal with cases where we have to decide whether a particular person we are searching for is living in a certain locality. Let it not be forgotten that the persons sent out for this purpose will only succeed when they have the portrait firmly impressed on the memory. If they meet the suspected individual, they cannot first pull the photograph from their pocket and refer to it for comparison all the features of the photograph should be carried in the memory. The person must be made to engrave the photograph in his memory feature by feature, and we must ascertain that he has done so by examining him on the various details – hair, beard, moustache, shape of eyelids, position of the eyes, cheekbones, nose, ears, etc. Even peculiar gestures, manner of bearing, glance, etc. must not be overlooked. We assert that no policeman can at first answer such questions, even though he thinks he has looked at the photograph very well. 
the art of observing must be learned like everything else. If the policeman knows his photograph by heart, he will in most cases recognize, if he meets him, the person he is after. See the Portrait Parlé, Chapter 7. D. Comparison of a portrait with our recollection. We generally attach importance to this method of recognition only when the witness has frequently seen the person he is supposed to recognize. Supposing he has seen him only once as, for example, an individual who has cheated, robbed or wounded him and gone off, the witness's opinion will be of little value. His recognition will inspire more confidence when the witness is able to pick out the person from a number of similar photographs, and does not recognize him merely because he had a moustache, and there is in the collection only one photograph of a person with a moustache. But the greatest precautions must be taken, for enormous difficulty is always experienced in recognizing persons from photographs, especially when the person recognizing is a simple-minded fellow who has rarely seen photographs and has never before tried to find resemblances. This is clear from the following example. In nearly all garrison towns a photographer is to be found near the barracks who has a supply of large pictures, colored lithographs, representing a dragoon, artilleryman, hussar, etc., galloping on horseback and brandishing a sword. The raw recruits flock to the photographer who takes their photograph the same size as the ready-made lithograph, cuts out the face and carefully gums it upon the face of the hussar or horse guard, and the warrior finds himself in possession of his portrait complete on horseback and in colors which he sends to his amazed relatives. One of these photographers related to the author how on one occasion he had photographed more than a dozen recruits who paid their money and left addresses to which the photographs were to be sent when ready, but unfortunately he lost the numbers designating each soldier. He therefore sent haphazard a dragoon to each of the addresses indicated. Not a single complaint was made, although perhaps not one of the fourteen or fifteen pairs of old people received the portrait of their own son. This shows the difficulty with which people recognize photographs. 10. It is appropriate here to call attention to what has been said about the distance at which we can recognize persons. Dr. Vincent in Le Grand et Soleil's Legal Medicine lays down that, presuming the eyesight to be normal and the light good, one is able in broad daylight to recognize a. Persons whom one knows very well, at a distance of from 50 to 90 yards, when there are particular and very characteristic signs, 110 yards, in exceptional cases up to 165 yards. b. Persons one does not know very well and has not often seen, from 28 to 33 yards. c. People one has only seen once, 16 yards. By moonlight one can recognize, when the moon is at the quarter, persons at a distance of from 21 feet, in bright moonlight at from 23 to 33 feet, and at the very brightest period of the full moon at a distance of from 33 to 36 feet. In tropical countries, as in India, the distances for moonlight may be increased. These are only approximate indications. In practice, they are of but slight value. In the first place, the statements concerning good normal eyesight and good light are vague, and in addition certain supplemental circumstances often have decisive influence. The gaseous air of the town compared with the limpid atmosphere of the mountains diminishes the range of vision by at least 10%. The position of the sun, the background, the wind, and the temperature also combine to affect it to perhaps the same extent. And our faculty of combination, which unconsciously comes into play, may corroborate our perception so that we may be completely led into error. If a person at a distance of, say, 220 yards sees a man first come out and then go into the house of A, 
and knows that A lives alone in that house, he will suppose, if the man he has seen resembles to a certain extent the exterior aspect of A, that the man is indeed A, and will maintain the fact as if he had seen him very distinctly. But he has not seen him properly, and his perception is entirely the result of conclusions which may be false. In such cases, verification must always, in important and serious cases, be carried out on the spot, whereas in less important cases it may be carried out elsewhere, but under conditions as similar as possible. Here again we must not be content with measurements expressed in paces or in yards, for the majority of persons do not know what distance fifty paces really is. 11. It is important to copy the photograph many times. Bertillon asserts that in urgent cases several thousand copies of a photograph have been made in a single night. It is useless to dwell upon the immense value that the rapid propagation of thousands of copies of the photograph of a suspected criminal may have. 12. When it is required to multiply photographs in great numbers, it must be remembered that it can only be done with the assistance of zinc engravings. It is indeed easy to insert in the columns of any newspaper a zinc plate mounted on wood, for an engraving on zinc represents in a way a stamp composed of lines in relief corresponding to the lines of drawing. An engraving on zinc may be made from any drawing, but not from a photograph, for a photograph only contains tints. If therefore it is desired to publish in haste in the police and other papers a man's portrait, and we possess only his photograph, the following process must be followed. Someone skilled in drawing traces boldly upon the photograph the features of the person, so that the outlines are clearly visible. This is a matter of a few minutes. The photograph is then decolorized with chloride of mercury, which leaves only the drawing unattacked. This drawing is reproduced by photography upon a plate and engraved on zinc, and the block thus obtained is inserted in the newspapers. This kind of drawing is not beautiful, but is often easier to identify than a photograph. Concerning the modern processes of reproduction invented by Just, Harber and Stolle, in Paris, gelatine bromide paper is employed, see Reis. End of section 40